Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The story I bring you is one of the most curious I've ever encountered. For what happened to pretty little Amy Prentice shouldn't happen to, well, to you. Put yourself in Amy's place. You arrive one day at the home of the fiancé, Jack Morton, and... Jack. Jack, darling, I'm here. I beg your pardon? I'm here. I, I mean, here I am. You're here, all right, but who are you? Who am I? Look, if you're some kind of saleswoman, Jack, you're really not... please. Please stop kidding. I'm Amy. Amy Prentice. Your fiancé. You're crazy. That's what you are. I've never seen you or heard of you in my life. Our mystery drama, The Bride That Wasn't was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Janet Waldo and Anne Seymour. We've all had odd, unexplainable things happen to us. Sometimes we put them down to tricks of memory, a curious combination of circumstances, or an occurrence that was simply inexplicable, and have then dismissed them from our minds. Perhaps Amy Prentice should have done that, but alas, didn't, when she arrived at the home of her fiancé, Jack Morton, all set to get married, only to have Jack tell her, I've never seen you or heard of you in my life. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Now, wait just you a minute. You heard me, sister. Beat it. Sister? Beat it? Jack Morton, I don't know what this is all about, what but... What is it, Jack? What's wrong? Yes, what seems to be the trouble? Well, this girl claims she knows me. Claims I know you. We're engaged. Engaged to be married. Married? Oh, my dear young lady, you're suffering from some sort of delusion. You bat or you're playing some sort of game. Now, you just get along out of here. Oh, now, now, mother. I mean it, Florence. I'll call the police if she doesn't. No. The poor girl, whatever her problem, looks terribly tired. You'd be tired, too, if you'd come all the way from Midvale in a day coach. Come in. And... Come in and at least have a cup of tea. Oh, I don't think so. Not now. Not after this reception I just got. Well, that's just fine with us. Take off. Jack, how can you act this way? Oh, honey, I don't know what this is all about, but you come on in and have a cup of tea with no. us. No. You get out of here. Go away or I'll call the police. Now, Mother, you know you'll do no such thing. This young woman is obviously in some sort of trouble. And it's up to us to help her if we can. Jack, you pick up her bag and bring it in. And, honey, you come on along with me. I... I, I don't know. Oh, I... nonsense. Come on, dear. All right, Jack, bring the suitcase. Close the door. And now let's all go into the dining room and have some tea. You too, Jack. And you, Mother. Now, what's your name, honey? Amy. Amy Prentice. Well, you sit right there, Amy, and I'll pour tea, and you tell us what this is all about. Tell you... We... You, you act... You all act as if you'd never heard of me. We haven't. Anyway, I haven't. This is some kind of trick. Confidence game. Mother, you... please. Here we are, honey. Nice cup of tea. Now, there's milk and sugar right there if you want them. And a plate of cookies. Now, let me introduce ourselves to begin with. This is Mother Morton, Jack's, that's him, Jack's mother. And I'm Florence Morton, his wife. Wife? Yes, dear. So, you see, you're thinking he's your fiancé. Well, you see, that just can't be so. Is she your wife? Of course she is. Let me tell you once again, I don't know you. I never saw you before in my life. You, you did. You did. We met just two weeks ago at the conference at State Teachers College. Now, what in blazes would I be doing at a teacher's college? Well, you're an English.
English teacher, aren't you? English teacher, my foot. I'm an insurance salesman. But you can't be. You can't be. Uh, unless you don't have a twin brother or, or a double or something. No, Amy, he doesn't. Yes, she very well knows. Mother, Amy, why don't you tell us what you think this is all about? I mean, start at the beginning and, well, tell us the whole story. Perhaps we can help in, I don't know, in some way. But he knows what happened. Whether he... he does or not, you just tell us in your own words. Well, I'm an English teacher at Midvale High School. And I attended the conference of English teachers at State Teachers two weeks ago. On the third day, when I was having lunch in the cafeteria... Look, excuse me, uh, there, there seems to be a shortage of tables. Do you mind if I sit down here? No, no, of course not. Please. Thanks. I'll just put my tray down here. There we are. Or rather, here I am. <laughs> uh, my name's Mort, Jack Morton. Amy Prentice. Where are you from? Midvale. Newark. High school English. You know, Chaucer, Shakespeare, and all that. <laughs> well, we, um... Have a lot in common. Mm hmm. Including food. I see you got a BLT on whole wheat, toasted. <laughs> you too. <laughs> uh, mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. <laughs> hey, are you uh, enjoying the conference? Oh, yes and no. Well, what's the no part? Well, quite honestly, I, I, I don't go for some of the new teaching methods they're recommending. Yeah. Like letting your students read what they want to read instead of holding them to the curriculum. You too? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a lot in common. Yeah, I should say we do. Sure glad I asked to sit at your table. Uh, so am I. Uh, Amy, uh, do you mind if I call you Amy? <laughs> no. And you call me Jack, okay? <laughs> All right, Jack. Well, uh... What I was going to say, it, it's kind of early to ask you for a date, but... Well, look, the barbecue tonight. I'm not looking forward to going alone, and I sort of wondered... I wasn't looking forward to it either, for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about two minds with but a single thought, two hearts that beat as one. Well, how about it? How about what? Going to the barbecue with me. Look, the steak is going to be New York cut, my favorite. Oh, mine too. I'd love to. It's a date then, Amy? It's a date, Jack. And that was our first date. We saw each other from then on every chance we got every day. And just before the end of the conference, Jack asked me... Jack, you know you did. You, you asked me to marry you. Look, will you make sense? I'm married to Florence. I've been married to her for ten years. Would I ask you or anyone else to marry me? But you did. What do you think I'm doing here? We we arranged for me to come today to meet your mother and, and stay here till we got married over the weekend. What? This is the engagement ring you gave me. Now, wait a minute. Cool it, lady. You could have gotten that anywhere. You could have bought it yourself. Amy, I know you're sincere in thinking you met Jack at that conference and that he asked you to marry him, but, well, it's a, it's got to be some sort of delusion. If it is, how did I know his name and address? That you could have got out of any phone book. I don't care what you say, Florence. This girl is playing some kind of game. I don't think so, Mother. I think she really believes what she says. I believe it because it happened. No, Amy, as I say, it's some sort of delusion. Is the Rose Garden a delusion? Yeah. The, the Rose Garden? Your Rose Garden, Mrs. Morton. Jack told me you love roses... And that you're an expert at growing them. That you even exhibit them and have won prizes. Is that true? Well, yes, but... That window there. That, that picture window. Do, does it look out on the backyard where the rose garden is? Why, good heavens, it does, yes. I'll describe it for you. Just as Jack described it for me. There's... There's a brick walk down the center. Dividing the yard in half. You... Enter the walk through a white trellis that's covered with red and white roses. At the far end of the walk, there's a tall French fence to screen you from the neighbors. And in front of the fence, there's a fountain with a large statue of the god Pan. Is that right? Perfectly. It's unbelievable. I don't see anything unbelievable about it. 
She could have gone out back and looked at my garden before she rang the front bell. Well, yes, that is true. How would I know that Jack's mother exhibits her roses, wins prizes? Oh, that's true, too, Mother. Well, there are plenty of ways she could have found out. Name one. You just named me one. I could name you half a dozen. You could have asked questions around the neighborhood. And there is a record book of prize winners with stories of their backgrounds, their lives. You could have just made an educated guess. You Personally, I don't think this poor child did any of those things. Then you explain how she knows. I can't. No more than she can. I have. Jack told me about that garden and all about his mother, but... Well, it, it doesn't matter now. Well, what do you mean, Amy? I mean, I don't understand it, but obviously Jack doesn't want to marry me. Can't marry me. And regardless of what I think, what I believed happened, and it did, I know it did. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, where are you going? Back where I came from, of course, Midvale. Thanks for the tea. I'll be happy to take your bag to the well, door. Now, just and... one minute, just one minute. Amy, you can't go back to Midvale today. Why not? There's only one train from Newark to Midvale. I happen to know because I have a friend I visit in the asylum there. And that leaves at 9.30 in the morning. Well, I'll stay somewhere. At a hotel. You do no such thing. You'll spend the night here. With us. I can't have that. I won't have it, Florence. I'm not letting some tricky little character like her stay the night under my roof. Mother, we can't put her out. That simply wouldn't be decent. Human. No, I insist. She's got to spend the night, have a good, refreshing sleep. And then I'll drive her to the station after breakfast in the morning. I, I, I really can't put you out like this. Not another word, Amy. I won't take no for an answer. Now, let me show you to the guest room. Bring her suitcase, Jack. Okay. You come along, too, Mother. You don't need me. Oh, yes, we do. What for? Why, uh, I think it's going to be a chilly night. And you know where the extra blankets are. So do you, Florence. Please. Come on, Mom. I'm... I, I'm really sorry to bother you like this. And, uh, look, you, you needn't trouble about an extra blanket. The weather's warm, really. Here we are. Oh, wait. Wait, before you open the door. Yes? Jack described the room where I'd be staying, the, the guest room. I can tell you exactly what it looks like. Oh, you couldn't possibly. There's a big dormer window, like all old houses have, and, and chintz curtains. Good heavens. A big easy chair with an ottoman. The bed has a canopy, and the rug, it's a woven rug, oval, with a design of roses. But this is, this is incredible. Oh, Jack, you didn't meet Amy at State Teachers, did you? You didn't propose marriage? Oh, come off it, Florence. Well, this is the strangest thing, because... Well, Amy, you've described the room perfectly. Now, here, see for yourself. Yes. Just as Jack described it. Well, there's no understanding this. I, I, I just can't fathom it. You must have second sight. Or something. No, I... No more talk now. You're tired and upset. And what you need is a good nap. Dinner won't be for several hours. I'll call you when it's ready. Thank you. And you can look forward to dinner. We're having steak. New York cut, no less. Jack adores steak. New York cut. Amy. Jack. Quiet, I said. Just listen to me, darling. Darling? The dearest, most darling girl in the world. But I... Look, there's no time to explain. It's two o'clock in the morning, and I've got to get you out of here fast. I, I can't take a chance on my wife waking up and finding me gone. You are married. Florence is your wife. Yes, but we did meet, you and I, and I do love you and want to marry you. Oh, marry me when you're already married? Please, stop talking. Get this robe on. We've got to move fast. I... Where are we going? Out of this house. In Robin's slippers? Look, I'll explain later. Come on now, let's go. Where? Go where, Jack? Florence. Your wife, standing in the doorway. And, 
Jack's in her hand. Oh, Jack. Jack, what does this mean? What indeed does it mean? Why does Jack want to get Amy out of that house as fast as he can? What is Florence, his wife, doing with an axe in her hand? One thing is virtually sure. However incredible events for Amy have been up to now, they are as nothing to what lies ahead. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. G.K. Chesterton was fond of saying that an adventure was merely an inconvenience viewed in the right light. Perhaps then, one may say that the incredible is merely the credible viewed in the wrong light. However that may be, to come to the home of a man you expect to marry and to discover him already married, and on top of that, to find yourself facing his wife at two in the morning with an axe in her hand. Really, Amy? Mother was right about you after all. You are playing tricks. Oh, no. No, I, I assure then you... Then what I... is my husband doing in your room at two o'clock in the morning and you in your nightgown? I, I, I can explain. Do that, Jack. Please do. First, give me the axe, Florence. Tempted to ask where you'd like it. Just explain your presence in Amy's room, Jack. Well, I, I thought I heard her cry out. I thought she might be in trouble. I, I came to see if she was all right. It's just a nightmare, Florence. I, I had a nightmare. That's hardly surprising with all you've been through. Well, I, I guess so. Could I have the axe now, Florence? Oh, of course. Here. You see, I heard you cry out too, Amy. You, you did? Yes. And I thought there might be an intruder in the house. Burglar, something like that. You keep an axe in your bedroom? Well, it's an old house. Very old. Our bedroom, Jack's and mine, has a fireplace in it. We keep a small supply of wood there. And sometimes it has to be split. You didn't think I was going to chop you, did you? No. I... Well, Jack and I will go back to our bedroom now. Come, Jack. Oh, and Amy. Yes? Try not to have any more... Nightmares. The more toast and marmalade, Amy. Oh, thank, thank you. No coffee. Then. No. Uh, frankly, I'm I'm anxious to get started. Get get that train for Midvale. I I don't want to miss it. You won't miss it. Plenty of time. Well, there really isn't, Florence. There's just under half an hour, and it takes fifteen minutes to reach the station. I know. I know. So, uh, I, I think we'd better get started, Amy. Your bag's packed and in the hall. So let's go. You. Well, I'll drive her to the station. I was planning to do that. No, I'll do it. No, Jack, no. Waste of gas. I mean, waste. You take her or I take her. What's the waste? I have to go into town shopping to do for the weekend. And you don't. I see. I can do my shopping at the same time. Yes, I see. So that'll mean only one round trip instead of two. I said I see, Florence. Saves gas. Yes. Well, uh, if we're going to get started... Oh, but first you must see the Rose Garden. No, no, I... Oh, but I... yes. I mean, how can you even think of leaving without seeing it? In some unaccountable way, you do know what it looks like. But, well, if I were you, I'd want to see it for myself. But there, there isn't time. Of course there is. Take a moment. Let's all go to the Rose Garden. And aren't these lovely? Hybrid teas. Yes, but, uh, you know, time... And this rambler. Isn't it gorgeous? Yes. Well, yes, you're, you're certainly to be complimented, Mrs. Morton. Thank you. Oh, but this isn't her garden, you know. It's mine, really. But Jack said... Jack said. Jack couldn't have said anything. Now, could he? Since you didn't meet him till yesterday. Or did you? Did you meet her at State Teachers, Jack? I've told you I never saw her before in my life. Yes. But I've been thinking. You know how I am? Oh, it's thinking. Sometimes... My head aches terribly. Oh, please, uh, we're going to miss my train. I think about so many things. 
I know you take this rose garden. She gets the credit for it. Always has got the credit for it. But I'm the one who designed it, created it, planted it. Even your father had to admit it was beautiful, Jack. Remember? Yes. Oh, how that man hated me, reviled me, scorned me. But even he admitted that my rose garden was a thing of beauty. Florence, we've got to go. Now. If Amy's going to get her train. Yes. Oh, yes. But first, I wanted to see these Florabunda. Aren't they gorgeous? They are, yes. Note the deep, dark red of the blossoms. Very dark. Very deep red. Lovely. Do you know why? Uh, cultivation, I suppose. Blood. Blood? Mr. Morton's blood. Jack's father's blood. This is where we found him. Hacked to bits. Oh, Jack, easy, I Mom. Can't easy, Mom. His blood had Florence, poured Florence. onto the soil, into it, saturating it. Would you believe that before that day, these roses had been rather weak, skimpy, subject to all sorts of diseases? But afterwards, they'd literally burgeoned with health and beauty. Would you believe that? Now, look, whether I believe it or not, we can't stay here another second. Why not? My train, that's why not. The only daily train to Midvale. Are, are you deliberately trying to make me miss it? But of course not. What a thing to say. I only wanted you to see the Rose Garden. Well, now that I've seen it, let's go. Please. Whatever you say, whatever you say. Uh, I'll go along too, Florence. You, Mother? Whatever for? Some... Uh, shopping for myself. Well, why not? We'll all go together. You too, Jack. Well, no. I, I'll i stay here. <laughs> not a chance, Jack. Not a chance. Oh, excuse me, but uh, while we're doing all this talking, time is slipping by. I don't want to miss that train. Of course you don't. But before we go, I do want you to know, Amy, what a pleasure it's been having you stay with us. Thank you. Of course, you haven't enjoyed it. Poor dear. But never mind. You're sure to find a husband so attractive, so pretty. Could, could we go now? Come on. Come on, Jack, Mother, Amy, get in the car. We just have time to make the Midvale train. Luckily, as you see, Amy, the garage fronts on the street. Luckily. Well, we can drive right out into the street and not waste time. Drive right straight out. Yes. Now, if the garage was in the back of the house, waste time, a minute or two, and we don't have it to waste. Could could we get started? Oh, you are in a hurry. Well, you said yourself we don't have any time to spare. That's why you don't have to tell me. I I'm sorry. I should think you would be. Well, here we go. Something wrong? Damp, I guess. Suppose you let me drive, Florence. How can you drive, Mother, if the car won't start? Mm. By the time the spirit won't start. Look, I I'll get a taxi. By the time the taxi gets here, your call and everything, you'd miss the train. But uh, we're certainly not going to get anywhere this way. The battery's wearing down. Correction. It's worn down. Oh, no. Well, that means I'll never make the train to Midvale. Well, now, I resent that, Amy. You sound as if spending another night with us here would be most unpleasant to you. Oh, no. No, no, I, I didn't did mean... We did try to make everything as pleasant as possible for you. Back in the house, all. Look, uh, if I went down to the corner and got a cab... Amy, yes? do as Florence says. Of course, Jack. Of course. Out of the car. Back in the house, all. Oh, look. Uh, a taxi. A taxi pulling up right in front. Oh, Oh, good heavens, I, I forgot. Joe! Joe? Who's Joe? Oh, my brother. All the excitement and all, I, I forgot. He he was coming to give me away. Okay, driver, thanks. Oh, no, Joe, wait! Keep that cab! Driver, don't drive off! Wait! It's all right, driver, go on. No, no, wait! Please, wait! Joe, hold that cab! Amy, Amy, what driver, in the world is... Driver, wait! Go on! Driver, go on. We don't need you. For criminy's sake, go stay. Go stay. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Amy. Oh, 
Mimi. Baby, sis, what is this? Oh, she's all upset. All upset. I'm Florence Morton. How do you do? Oh, uh, Joe Prentice, Amy's brother. <gasps> Amy, Amy, what's what? You understand, Joe. I may call you Joe. Oh, yeah, yeah. But... Amy's all upset. You know how it is getting married for the first time. Nerves. <laughs> oh, sure. Joe. You Jack Morton? Yes, I am. Ah, oh, glad to meet you, Jack. Great pleasure. And you're, uh, Jack's sister, huh? She's Let's all my... go into the house. Come on now, come on. Have you had breakfast, Joe? I have something on the train. Well, you want more than that. Eggs, bacon, toast, and marmalade, hot coffee. In the house, everybody. No, no. Amy, in the house. Amy, what's going on here? You're all acting like... Well, I, I don't know. You're... Wedding plans, Joe. Wedding plans. Everybody uptight. You understand. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh... Florence, is it? Florence. Everybody in. Everybody in. Well, now, here we are, all together once again. Joe. Yeah, Amy? Joe, there's something crazy going on in this house. Something real crazy. Now, Amy, honey. Joe, Joe, listen to me. There's something wrong. I don't know what it's all about. I don't know, I don't know what's happening, but Jack says he never saw me before in his life. What? And never proposed marriage to me, and then he did, and she, her... His wife, she came to my bedroom with an act in Hold her it, for Jiminy's sake, hold it. Amy, you're not making sense. Oh, I know I'm not because what's happening here, what, what, what's happened to me, it doesn't make sense Look, either. will somebody explain this? I'll explain it. Mr. Prentice, Joe, a mistake of some kind has been made. A mistake? Your sister, she... Well, I, I haven't wanted to spell this out in so many words, but... Since you're here now and can take care of her, Joe, I'm afraid your sister is crazy. You're afraid my sister is crazy? Well, she... she came here yesterday afternoon, arrived just out of the blue, out of nowhere, saying she'd come to marry my husband. You don't mean him? Yes, him. Jack. My husband. He's your... My husband, Jack, yes. Somehow your sister has got into her head that they met at teacher's conference and he proposed marriage, but, well, it's ridiculous. You, Jack, you say you never met Amy? No. Jack, last night in my room... Now, hold said... it, Amy, just hold it. Let me try to get this thing straight. You didn't meet her at a teacher's conference? State teacher's college? Not me, I'm an insurance salesman. This is plain screwy. Amy, if you say you met him and he asked you to marry him, I say you met him and he asked you to marry him. But he says... I that... never saw her, talked to her, knew anything about her until she arrived here yesterday. I see. Well, either you're a liar, Mr. Morton, or you're crazy. If anybody around here has lost his marbles, you have, not her. Now, Amy, what do you want to do about this? I just want to get out of here. And that's what we'll do. Where's the phone? Over there, but I'm afraid Let you're... me just call a cab and we'll blow. You can't. You going to stop me? The phone's out of order. Now, we'll see about that. That's dead all right. No wonder. The wire's been pulled out of the box on the wall. Now, what is going on here? Who pulled those wires out of the box and why? Come on, damn it, answer me. Who and why? You're like Jack's father. All male. He was a Taurus, a bull, strong, masculine like you. He thought like you. What are you, some women's liver? I'm me. I'm Florence Morton. And I don't take anything from you or anybody else. His father learned that the hard way. What do you mean the hard way? She killed him with an axe. Killed him. Killed him. Hacked him to pieces. He had to be killed. I certainly wasn't going to live out my life with him dominating me. Stupid, he called me. Stupid, like that. One day I said to him, you call me stupid once more and I'll kill you. We're in the garden. Maybe you notice there's a wood pile in one corner, Amy. Yes. And there was this axe he used for splitting wood. You know what he did? No. Guess. Please. He picked up the axe and handed it to me. Go ahead, he said. Kill me, stupid. 
Was he surprised? Hacked him to bits. <laughs> to bits. Amy, come on. We're getting out of here. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Amy. Goodbye. This door's locked. It's bolted on the inside. Oh, I thought you knew. You didn't see me bolt and lock it when we came in? All right, give me the key. So you can unlock it? What else? Uh-uh. Now look, you... Joe, please, don't cross her. Please, don't cross her. She'll kill us all. Joe, Joe... Take it easy, Amy. We're not dead yet. Not yet, Joe. Not quite yet. Ever been face to face with a homicidal maniac? With everything stacked against you? Happily, I never have, and hope you never have either. But Amy and Joe are. And so are Jack and his mother. What I can't figure out is why Jack, with a homicidal wife at home, ever proposed marriage to Amy. Well, We'll have the answer to that when I return shortly with Act Three. Terror can be a thing so palpable you can feel it. Clammy to your touch. Ice cold in your veins. A taste of brass in your mouth. Certainly, this is what Amy Prentice feels, along with the Mortons and her brother Joe, as Florence Morton makes all too clear the fact that they are not going to leave the old house on Hilliard Street alive. Look, Florence, I don't get any of this. I don't get any of it except all this hate you got in you. You can't blame my sister for it, and you can't blame me. So we're leaving now. No. Joe, she's got a gun. I can see that, Amy. Question is, will she use it? Yes, yeah, she'll use it all right. You better understand something, Joe. She's a killer, a homicidal maniac. Then what the hell is she doing here? Why isn't she in an asylum? She was. She escaped just a day before I got back from the teacher's conference. Jack! Amy, I am sorry. So sorry. I pretended I'd never seen you before, tried to get you to leave before you set foot in this house because Florence was right there behind me all the time and I knew she'd kill you sooner or later. Kill you. Nine years. Nine long years. They kept me in that place. But I knew. I always knew someday I'd get out. But, Jack, if you're married to her... No, I'm not. Not anymore. I had the marriage annulled a year ago. The authorities agreed Florence would never be cured. So where are these authorities now? Didn't they figure she'd head straight for this house? They telephoned to let me know she'd escaped. Asked me to notify them if she did come here. And all the time I was talking on the phone, she had a gun against my head. You're going to die. You're all going to die. Not if I can help it, lady. You can't help it. There isn't a thing you can do. We'll see about that. One thing I don't believe in is just standing here waiting for you to kill us. Me, I fight fire with fire. Oh? And just how do you think you... Fight fire with fire? Fire! Oh, Florence, what do you think? Be quiet, saying? Jack. I'm thinking, thinking. Fire. Fire. You know, Joe, you've given me the idea I was looking for. I gave you... I've been wondering how to kill you all, all at once. And now I know. Into the kitchen. What for? You see, Mother. Into the kitchen, all. And now, Jack. Dear, loving husband, open the cellar door. You're taking us down to the cellar? Putting you down in the cellar, Jack. Open the door. Now, down into the cellar with you. You lead the way, Jack. Look, Florence. Don't you... argue, Jack. Just go. No, we're not... <laughs> My leg. You all right? Oh, Joe. If you may Joe. be able to fight fire, Joe, but you can't fight bullets. Oh. Now, Amy, help your brother down into the cellar. Oh, Joe. Take, take it easy. Oh. oh pain is... You're bleeding. I'll be okay. Oh. She hit me in the side. Fleshy part. Oh. You better let me have a look at that wound, Joe, okay? Okay. Oh. Let him bleed to death, Jack. 
It'll be easier for him. I'm sorry I can't make it easier for you all. Oh, oh, she's locked us in down here. Is there another door? No, there's not even a window. We're trapped. Absolutely no way out. Is there any way of breaking that door down? Prying it open. No, Joe, this is an old house. It's built when they really build them. Break that door down. No way. Oh. Look, try, try to hold still. It's it's not that bad, but it's bleeding quite a lot. I've got to stop the bleeding. Look, Amy. Yes, dear. Just around that corner, you'll find a desk. A, a desk? Yeah, I have my office set up there. Oh. In the bottom drawer on the right, you'll find a first aid kit. Now, bring it here, will you? Yes. yes. Oh, Jack. Jack, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of here? Mom, if I had the answer to that. Jack, there's a telephone here on, on your desk. Yeah, with the wires pulled out of the wall box. Florence didn't miss a trick. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, they are pulled out. Look, well, hurry with that first aid kit. Here it is, Jack. Here. Thanks. Have you patched up in a jiffy, Joe? Though, much good it'll do you, I'm afraid. Don't lose your nerve. Me, I've been in worse binds than this. Vietnam, for one. My work, for another. What do you do, Joe? I'm a cop. New York City Police Force. Man, I've been in spots that make this look like... Hey, wait. She's up there. That's not the kitchen. No, it's the living room, right above us. <gasps> what was that? She put something down on the floor, something <gasps> heavy and made of metal. What could it be, Jack? I don't know, unless it's... Wait a minute. What, Jack? What? Uh, metal? Fire? I, I keep a can of gasoline in the garage for the lawnmower. How big a can? Two gallons. Was it full? I'm afraid so, and I'm afraid I'm right. I smell gasoline. Oh, it's dripping down through the floorboards above us. She's going to set the house on fire. She's going to burn it down around our heads. And kill herself, the poor crazy woman. Florence! Florence, listen to me! Florence, you'll kill yourself! Strike a match and the gasoline fumes, the fumes, Florence, they'll explode. You're right. She lights that stuff. She'll never get out alive. Florence, will you listen? Will you please listen? Oh, oh God, she's done it. Oh. How's this old? It'll go up like a haystack, a dry haystack. It's all going to die. It's <laughs> alive. Oh, no. We gotta try that door. We gotta see when we break it down. Jack, give me a hand. We'll both get our shoulders against it. When I give the word. What? What? Let's forget it. The door's hot already. Flames on the other side. <coughs> Even if we got it open, we'd never get out. There's gotta be something we can do. It's got to be. What are the neighbors? Neighbors? Well, they'll see the house burning, call the fire department. Well, what could let to us? They'll rescue us. Get us out of no, here. Amy, honey, they don't know we're down here. Oh. Oh. Wait a minute. There's one chance. Just one chance. What, Joe? The telephone. No, no, no. I told you. Florence pulled the wires out of the wall box. We gotta see can we connect them again. You think you can? Or do you? Jack. Uh. What? Thank God you set up your office down here with a phone. Uh. If we can reconnect those wires. Let's get this wall box open. You got any tools down here? Yeah. Top door of my desk. One of those little kits. Here. What do you want? <coughs> oh. Screw yeah, here you go. <coughs> Now, oh. get this lid open. Oh. Right. Easy, easy. Oh. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, right. hurry, Joe, hurry. Yeah, yeah. off of the lid. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, no. What, what? Three wires. Red, blue, and green. Three poles to attach them with. So attach them. Yeah, but which wire to which pole? Oh, it's Joe, 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 try something. What do you think I'm doing? Let's see. Red to this pole. Blue to this one. Green here. All right, see if you can get a dial to him. Got nothing. Try again. Joe, move it. Let's see. Put the red here. Blue. There. Green on this pole. Okay. Anything, Jack? <laughs> That's it. That's it. I got a dial tone. Well, use it. Get the operator. This is your operator. May I help you? Operator, I'm calling from a burning house. 37 Hilliard Street. <laughs> the fire department's just arriving, but they don't know. We're in the cellar. We're in the cellar. Stand 
Right. Amy. What? Here. Oh. Fire chief just gave me another thermos of coffee. Have some more. Oh, thanks, Jack. Joe? I've got Joe in the ambulance unit over there. Oh. They're really patching up his leg. Isn't he wonderful? I-, I think I've got the most wonderful brother in the world. Well, I think he's got the most wonderful sister in the world. I'm, I'm sorry about Florence. Lord knows I am, too, but it's better this way. Mom, Mom, are you okay? Even the rose garden's gone. The heat killed everything. Maybe that's better, too, Mom. Oh, how could it be? How? I'm going to see to it you have another house, another rose garden, without the memories that went with this one. Memories we're all going to do our best to forget. So, what began as mystery, created by Florence Morton, ended as tragedy for Florence Morton. And uh, perhaps for the best, as Jack said. She is at peace now, and if in death she has not found a better world, as we very much hope she has, she's at least out of this one, which brought her so much unhappiness. I'll be back shortly. Jack and Amy Morton are happily married now. Amy no longer teaches, at least not in school, because she has two youngsters to keep her more than busy. The boy is named Joe. The girl, Florence. As for Mother Morton, she has another garden. But not roses, vegetables. Well, everything costs so much these days. Our cast included Janet Waldo, Ann Seymour, Lorene Tuttle, Bill Quinn, and Bernard Barrow. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends. This is Raymond, your host. Welcome again to the Inner Sanctum. Come in, won't you? You'll have to excuse me for not getting up, but I have an awfully stiff neck. You see, I was out with a certain lady last night who collects very curious things. She spent the first half of the evening telling me how wonderful I am, but after that... Well, it's one thing when a girl tries to turn your head. It's another when she tries to twist it off. (laughs) And now, friends... Let me introduce someone who is a real lady. She must be a lady because she wants to reform me. Uh, Come in, Mary Bennett. Hello, folks. Drop a coffin and sit down, Mary. Now, Mr. Raymond, please don't talk that way. It is nice. Why are you always pretending to be so cold-hearted and creepy? 
Underneath, I'm sure you're a friendly, good-natured sort of man. <laughs> yes, you are. Underneath, you're just like everybody else. I'll bet you like to come home in the evening and put on an old jacket and slippers and then sit down to supper. Yes, sir, and I'll bet I know one of your favorite dishes, too. Noodle soup. Well, most all men like noodle soup. That's why Lipton's is so popular. Lipton's noodle soup is real homemade tasting. It's got a grand chickeny flavor, and it's swimming with noodles. Egg noodles, too. You know, Lipton's noodle soup will bring a family swarming to the table quicker than a dinner bell. Mr. Raymond, someday I'm going to take you home with me and feed you a good hot bowl of Lipton's noodle soup. Oh, well, thanks for the invitation, Mary. And uh, now let me invite you to come to the desert and hear the story of Desert Death. It's an original tale written by that spinner of surprise stories, Robert Newman. And our star tonight is Horace Braham. The desert, eerie and mysterious at sundown. The sun sinking slowly in a purple haze. The cactus casting long and weirdly twisting shadows. The hot wind still. The silence overall. Driving fast, a dusty car comes down a narrow desert road. At the wheel is Dan Darrell, a rancher. Next to him is his Indian friend, Toby Priest. <laughs> Still worrying, Toby? Stop teasing me, Dan. You know I never did worry. I just told you what my people used to think it meant. Used to think? Didn't you say we ought to postpone our trip into town today? I did. And when did you say it? Right after you saw them, three vultures lying together toward the sunset. That means three days. A bad omen for a journey. <laughs> hey, look. I see him. What's a man doing out here in the middle of nowhere on foot? Anything the matter, stranger? Need no help? You are very kind. Our car broke down and... Well, we were in a bit of a spot. Didn't know whether anyone would be likely to come along here or not. I... We? Oh, I, I didn't see your friends. Well, come in. We're going to Palo Verde. We're glad to take you that far. Well, that's very decent of you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name's Darrell, Dan Darrell. And this is Toby Priest. And I'm very happy to know you. I'm Richards. And this is Brennan and Smith. How do you do? Howdy. Uh, you're British, ain't you? Why, yes. <laughs> Clever of you to spot it. We're on our way out to the coast. One of those hush-hush missions. That's why it's so important we get into town. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, which way'd you come? Medicine Creek or Route 12? Why, uh, uh Medicine Creek. It sounded more scenic. You're lying, Dan. You know that, don't you? What makes you say that? Toby. Use your head. He doesn't look. Mr. Darrow, surely it's considered rude to whisper in front of strangers, even here in America, isn't it? What? Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, I'm sure you will be. But first I must insist on knowing what you were saying. Insist? What do you mean, insist? This is my car and this is a... I know. A free country. But this is a gun. That's why I can insist. Now, will you tell me what you were saying? I was saying it, so I'll tell you. I said you were lying, that you weren't British at all. No? But then who are we? I think that you're Nazi prisoners who escaped from that camp up near Post City. Oh? Uh, and what makes you think that? First, none of your clothes fit you, so they're obviously not yours. Second, you said your car broke down, but there wasn't any car around. Third, you said you came by way of Medicine Creek, and that road's closed. All right. Stop the car and let us get it over with. You mean shoot them? Uh, not so quick, Bernard. We can use them for a while yet. At least one of them. What the devil do you mean? Of course, your Indian friend is right. Very clever, too. But since I have a gun, you will take orders from me. Our first need is water. Do you have any in the car? No. And then we will have to find some. Yeah? Where'd you expect to find water in the desert? I told you we were Nazis, Darrow. I did not tell you that we were Ronald's men from the Africa Corps. 
That means we know the desert, any desert, better than anyone on Earth. Those hills off there to the left, take the left-hand road at that fork there and head toward them. But do as I say. How much further you want me to go up this... this wagon track? Slow up. Isn't that a... Yes. The shack right next to the cliff. Stop. Ah, looks deserted, but... There, next to it. Is that not a well? It should be. Renner, go see if there's any water in it. Double haircut. You two come with us. We'll go look at the shack. What is this place? Those terraces up there on the cliff? A pueblo. Cliff dwellings. Centuries ago, my people lived in villages like this. There is water in it, Herr Colonel. Even a bucket to get it up with. Good. Come into the house. Match, Schmidt. Hmm. From the dust, I'd say no one had been here for a good many years. Prospector's cabin, wasn't it? Probably. That means... Ah, that's what I want. Shovel. What do you want that for? Want to dig yourself a grave? Yes, Darren, exactly. But not for me. Huh? What do you mean? Precisely what I said. Sit down. Make yourselves comfortable and I will explain things to you. I'll stand if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. We Nazis are very objective, analytical people. We decided we needed a car to make our escape in. Now we have one. We also decided we needed someone to drive the car and get us safely across the border. That means we can use one of you. The other one will die. You... You wouldn't dare. My dear Darrell, outside of the thousands of men we killed in North Africa who don't count, we killed at least two guards in making our escape. Do you really think one more death means anything to us. The only question is, which of you shall die? This one here. He talks too much. Well, that's not quite fair, Brenner. He's just, shall we say, less stoical than the Indian. On the other hand, I think that in the long run, he would probably prove easier to handle, less dangerous. That means that the Indian died. What? Why, you... Shut up, Uh, (coughs) Thank you, Brenner. Schmidt. Take the gun, the shovel, and our Indian friend, yeah. and watch over him while he digs his grave. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Of course, I personally would prefer a deeper grave, but that's up to you. The depth is not important. The only thing that matters is that it faces west. That is why I dug it with the head against the cliff. An old tribal custom. Very interesting. Similar to the Egyptians. But of course, they believed in a life after death. My people believe in a life after death also, Colonel. And in this case, I think I can promise that I will not rest easy in my grave. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hear this too, men from across the seas. Men with death in your hearts. For the evil you would do... Evil will follow you like a hungry wolf. What is that? What he just mentioned. A wolf. Though you bury me deep, the earth will not hide me till you have paid for your crimes. Here where you have killed, here too will you die. Now, Herr Colonel. Yes, Brenner. Oh, you can't, you... Very good, Smith. I'll take the gun now. Fill in the grave, then meet us back at the cabin. Ooh, what a place. It's worth in Quatara. I wish you'd sit down, Darrell, and stop staring out of the window. You're worried about your friend. I buried him very nicely. I'm not worried about him. I'm thinking about what he said before you killed him. I should think that you think about it, too. That? (laughs) We have had more curses laid on us in more languages than you have hairs on your head. What's that? 
Must be the wind. No. No, it is different. More like some kind of musical instrument. But there's no one around here but us. There hasn't been anyone living in those houses up on the cliff for centuries. It's just the wind, I tell you. But if you want to, go take a look. Go take a look, I said. Yeah, I will. It's too dark. There's too much sand blowing to see anything. But wait. Who there near the foot of the cliff? There's something. It looks like... Evil God. It's the Indian. He's lying there. Out of his grave. Will you bury me deep? The earth will not hide me. Till you are paid for your crimes. Here we are killed. Here too. Will you die? <laughs> A hundred curses in a dozen different tongues. Perhaps they did mean three deaths. If so, who are the others that'll die and who'll live? Gosh, Mr. Raymond, this is exciting. What? Oh, Mary Bennett, I've overlooked you in all this desert. Uh, Tell me, Mary, whom do you hope will die, huh? Well, I don't like to see anybody killed. But those Nazis sure ought to be clapped in jail. Mm-hmm. And uh, deprived of their Lipton's noodle soup, are not they? Well, I should say. Lipton's noodle soup is much too good for fellas like them. It belongs to law-abiding folks who've got a right to sit down to a plate of homemade tasting soup. And say, that's just the kind of noodle soup you get when you use Lipton. Lipton's is the noodle soup with the old-fashioned flavor, you know, brimming with noodles and blessed with a real chickeny taste. Yes, it takes Lipton's to show how good a noodle soup can be. Now, but... Mary, don't get so excited. Stay calm. Uh, why don't you go and perch on that tombstone over there while I go on with the story of death and the desert? I'm warning you, if I do go on, you'll be seeing strange sights and hearing strange sounds every time you put out the lights. But it's your funeral. Just just a moment later now. The three Nazis are still standing at the open door of the deserted cabin, staring out into the darkness. And the colonel turns sharply, glad as a devil. What was that you said, Darren? I was just repeating what Tova said. Oh, you murdered him. It's, it's true, Herr Colonel. That's what he did say. The earth will not hide me. And there he is out of his grave, lying there. Shut up. Fine Nazi you are. A fine example of the Africa Corps. Listening to the ravings of a savage and believing them. Schmidt, where did you bury the Indian? In the sand. Then this wind came along and blew the sand away. And that's all. And, and that strange man? Another trick of the wind. But if it bothers you to see him lying there, go on out and bury him again. Deeper this time. No, Herr Colonel, no. Well, that's an order. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. Ryan Schmidt seems to be getting a bit uh, rattled. That's why I sent him out there. Nothing like facing a fear to overcome it. Do you not think it is about time that Schmidt came back? Hmm. He's only been gone about five or ten minutes. I told him to dig the grave deep this time. I know, but uh, I do not see him out there anywhere. Well, how could you expect to when it's so dark and when the sand is blowing like that? Maybe we'd better go out and see what's taking him so long. And uh, you too, Mr. Darrell, if you don't mind. Not at all. Schmidt! Schmidt, where are you? Probably wandered off into the desert. Schmidt! Oh, look, the Indian. He is still lying there. He never did bury him. That means Schmidt never even got over there. Must have lost his way right after he got outside. Schmidt! I think you can save your breath, Colonel Lowry. Right over here, to the well. Huh? What are you talking about? Schmidt. Dead. Well, why are you looking at me like that, Brenner? Exactly as I said. He lost his way in the darkness, 
The sandstorm fell down the well. Yeah. Yeah, I... I guess that is what must have happened. As for you, Mr. Darrell, since you discovered Schmidt, you shall have the pleasure of burying your friend the Indian again. Yeah, oh, dear girl. I'm sorry. I never did appreciate the American type of humor. Now get busy with that show. May I just point out that... Well, it's easy for you to knock me down when my hands are tied. It's not so easy for me to use a shovel. Oh, I intend to untie you. But please remember always that I have a gun. And that Brenner and I have every intention of getting away from here. I'm happy to see that you've stopped pacing the floor and looking out the window, Mr. Darrow. That means you've stopped expecting something miraculous to happen that will save you. That's what you think it means? Frankly, no. In fact, I think just the opposite. You're looking much more cheerful than before. You're thinking one of them is dead. Now it'll be that much easier to get away. It really pains me to disillusion you. Schmidt was a sergeant. A fool. I can assure you that neither Brenner nor myself are going to be bothered by strange noises or tricks of the wind. Right, Brenner? Of course not, Colonel. Good. And now, if we are to make an early start, I think we should get some rest. Brenner, you take the first watch and wake me at midnight. I advise you to get some rest, too, Darrell. <laughs> Maybe you'll be able to dream of some way of escaping. Thanks. But I'm not sleeping. As you wish. Good night. What a character. He was one of the best soldiers in the Africa Corps. No? Where's Africa Corps now? Where are you? This isn't Africa, Brenner. This is America. This is a part of America where strange things happen. Things that even the Indians can't explain. Indians. <laughs> Ignorant savages. That devilish music again. Where does it come from? I thought you said it was the wind. Or was it always to say that? It must be the wind. It must. Oh, you bury me deep. The earth will not hide me till you pay for your crimes. What is that? That was what Tova said just before you killed him. Schmidt was first, Brenner. You will be next. I'm waiting, Brenner. Waiting. You. Waiting. You heard that, Tova? Yeah. I heard it. You're lying. You're lying, I say. You, you're, you're, you're just trying to frighten me. Oh? What? Who, who's trying to frighten you? What's going on? It, uh, it is nothing here, Colonel. Just that, that music again. And for a moment, it sounded as if someone was calling my name. Someone was calling your name, Brenner. The dead man. You know you heard it. So, may it is again. You hear it? Just that same noise, the wind. Look, Coleridge, look. That Indian, he's out of his grave again. How can you tell? It's too dark to see. But I know he is. I know it. I, 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 I'm very disappointed in you, Brenner. You're losing your grip, slipping. I... Sorry, Herr Colonel. It, it's... It is just this place, the nervous tension, the mating. Just being sorry isn't enough. Fear is a weakness. As much of a weakness as pity. You know that as Nazis, we cannot tolerate either one. And you also know what you must do, don't you? No. No, Herr Colonel. No. You must face your fear and overcome it. You must go out there and prove to yourself that you are not afraid. That you've just been imagining things the way Schmidt did. But, but Schmidt... Schmidt was a fool. And he had an accident. You are an officer. And you will not have an accident. Now go ahead and convince yourself that this is all nonsense. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. But leave the gun with me. What's out there is imaginary, but Mr. Darrell is very real. If I didn't have a gun, he might get ideas. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. Here. I will be back in a few minutes. You're looking at me very strangely, Mr. Darrell. Perhaps now you're starting to understand the fiber of the Nazi character. And perhaps now you're beginning to realize 
why you can never win this war. Because we allow nothing to defeat us or stand in our way. Any sign of weakness is ruthlessly stamped out. And... Abel, God, what's that? Sounded to me like Brenner. Outside, quick. And don't try to get away or I'll shoot you down in your tracks. Okay. Which way? Towards the cliff, where we buried the Indian. That's where he went and... What's that over there? My guess is that it's your friend, Brenner. Maybe you'd better make sure. It... It is Brenner. Dead. Strangled. So it was all imagination, huh? Just face your fear and overcome it. Aren't you feeling just a little frightened, Colonel? No. No. There's some rational explanation for everything that happened. Look. The Indian. He is out of his grave again. And that's the answer. He wasn't dead. But this should take care of him. There. And you will notice that even at a moment like this, I look ahead. One shot before and four now. That still leaves one bullet for you, if it should prove necessary. You think of everything, don't you? Yes, my friend, everything. Now get into that car. We're not going to wait until morning. We're leaving here right now. I thought you had everything figured out. You weren't frightened. What's that? What's what? That, that noise, that, that music. It's like the music we heard after we killed the Indian. I don't hear anything. Oh, but you, you must hear it. You must. Listen. It's coming from over there. For the evil you have done, evil will follow you like a hungry wolf. Though you bury me deep, the earth will not hide me till you have paid for your crimes. Did... Did you hear that? Did you hear it? Yeah. I heard it. Here where you have killed here, too, will you die. No. No. You're dead. You're dead, I tell you. I killed you. First Schmidt. Then Brenner. Now you. But you're dead, I tell you. And the dead don't speak. I can't be really hearing you unless... Mad. No. I can't let that happen. I can't. There's one way... The Nazi way. A way to fool you all. This is why you'll never beat us. Never. Never. Oh, oh. Toby. Toby. Where are you? Over here. Near the foot of the cliff. Are you all right? That first bullet creased my head. I was already dropping by the time he fired. Outside of that, I'm all right. I figured that was what had happened when Schmidt went down the well. I knew it was an accident. I was pretty happy that it was you that buried me the second time. That you put my face against the cliff, left a hole for me to breathe. The first time, well, it was pretty tough until the wind blew the sand off. Yeah, but what about when he shot you again? That ungodly music. It wasn't me he shot that second time. It was Schmidt. I pulled his body out of the well, and I figured that in the dark, no one would be able to tell the difference. As for the music, that's why I dug the grave here. You see these holes here in that cliff? My people drilled them centuries ago. The wind blows through them. It makes weird music. This bottom hole was blocked up, but I opened it while I was digging the grave. Talking of graves... There's three of them we should be digging right now. Just one more thing I'd like to ask you, Toby. What's that? What you said this morning. Those three buzzards flying together toward the west. Does it really mean three deaths? There were three deaths. Weren't there, Dan? Never give a Nazi an even break, unless it's in the neck. As for our three visiting murderers, they may not like our sense of humor, but they can't complain about our poetic justice. 
After all, it was in the desert that they got their just deserts. Well, Mary Bennett, did you like the desert with its sand and wind and weird music? Would you like to live there? Well, I wouldn't mind so much. You know, I believe a woman can make a good home in some pretty out-of-the-way places, the way the old-time housewives did. But, well, I'd want to lay in a supply of good modern food, food that's easy to make, like Lipton's noodle soup. Say, that noodle soup of Lipton's would really put some cheer in the desert, wouldn't it? (laughs) Yes, of course, Mary, of course. Remind me to take Lipton's with me on my next safari. We must have a word of advice. Here it is. If you should wake up one of these nights in a cold sweat... Convinced that there's something or someone in your room. And if, when you look toward the window, you should see a strange figure silhouetted in the moonlight, then pull the blankets up over your head and don't look out again. It'll be one of our three friends from tonight's story. One of the Africa corpses. By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery Novel is Puzzle for Puppets by Patrick Quentin. Well, now I guess it's time to close that there squeaking door until next week at this same time. So until next Tuesday night. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Folks, here we are outside the squeaking door. And and I guess we're all pretty thirsty after all that talk about desert. Well, I know just the thing that'll put us back to normal again. It's Lipton tea. Yes, a cup of that brisk Lipton tea would do just fine. And did you notice that word brisk? B-R-I-S-K. It's a mighty important word in tea language. The tea experts always use it. It means that Lipton tea has a lively flavor, never wishy-washy. That's why most folks prefer Lipton's to any other kind. Don't forget, that's Lipton tea. And don't forget to tune in again next Tuesday night to Inner Sanctum. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. What do you think about witches? Not the bony hags and atrocious crones of Shakespeare and legend, or the poor unfortunates of Salem, but witches who are young, witches who are beautiful, witches who even fall in love. Excuse me. Who let you in here? Well, I hope I'm not disturbing you. I'm only trying to make a deadline. Well, if you're in the news business, I've got something for you. It better be good. I... I'm going to have to kill my wife. That won't be news till you do it. I know. I want you to know why. Okay. Why? Because she's a witch. Our mystery drama, I Warn You Three Times, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Loring. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It's 
one of those miserable stormy nights in the dead of winter. A thick, clinging, wet snow seems determined to smother the entire earth and everyone on it. You'd think that most people would choose the cheerful indoors, a warming fire, a relaxing drink, a comfortable bed. That's the problem with most people. You can't figure them. For instance... Consider that line of cars crawling down Main Street, bumper to bumper, skidding, sliding. Where is everybody headed on a night like this? Have we become a race of lemmings? Do we follow some mysterious, unconscious drive? An interesting speculation, but we won't pursue it. We'd better consider the traffic, which has come to a complete standstill. A car seems to be stuck at the intersection. Let's go, sister. That light's green. Oh, officer. Well, what are you waiting for, lady? Uh, my, my husband. Your husband? That, um, the light was red, and he said he wanted to step out and clean off the rear window. Uh, hey, mister. You finished back there? He just stepped out. It was a moment ago. Tom? Well, maybe he slipped in the snow. Tom, are you all right? Lady, there ain't nobody around the back. He just went out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Clean the rear window. Uh, that's what you said. But what could have happened? Just sit there a minute, lady. Hey, lay off of that horn. I know you got one. Now, what's wrong, officer? Did you see a guy get out of that car up there? Did I see a guy get yeah, out of yeah, the car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you? Huh? Are the police after someone in the skate car? Oh, come on, Buster. Just tell me. Did you see a guy cleaning off the rear window of that car up front? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I wasn't paying any attention. I was listening to the radio. Now, there could have been somebody, but then again, I, I couldn't say there was. It's not that I'm not trying to get involved, yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a citizen. I know my duty, but... but yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Officer, where is my husband? He was just there. Lady, he uh, disappeared. How could he disappear? I don't know. I do know he ain't here. What am I going to do? Well, you can't keep blocking traffic, lady. you got to move on. Where? Well, I... it beats me. But you must find him. Look, you got troubles with your husband. That's your problem. But when you hold up traffic, but... that's my problem. Will you feed her a little gas, please? Come on, let's go. Let's but go. I can't. Lady, you got to go somewhere. I can't go anywhere. I don't know how to drive. Desk, Lieutenant Carroll. Yeah. Nobody wants this guy, you say? Well, technically, that isn't true. His wife wants him. Okay. Well, look who's here. Lieutenant? You won't win any Pulitzer Prizes around this joint tonight, Peterson. I was hoping you might have a little bone to throw me. Page one? I'll settle for two inches on the bottom of page 38. If you promise to remember two R's and one L. First name, Irvin. Not Irving. Lieutenant Irvin Carroll. We may have something shaping up. Ah. I don't know where it can go. Everywhere or nowhere. What have I got to lose? Sitting over there on the first bench. Ooh. That's nice. And married. Well, you win, you lose. A very, very weird story. Tell me about it. No. Let her tell you about it. Why don't you ask her? Excuse me. Oh. My name is Fred Peterson. I... I'm a reporter for the Union Messenger. Oh, no. I don't want to talk to a reporter. Why not? Because I... Because you're afraid? Why? Could you put Tom's picture in the paper? Well, that depends. Has Tom done anything? He's disappeared. Well, we need the how, the when, the where. The when. About an hour ago. Where? On Route 986 at Main Street. How? I don't know. You see, we were driving south. It was snowing hard, and he said, I can't see out the rear window. The light was red. He stepped outside to wipe it off. He didn't come back. Where, where did he go? I don't know. Well, where could he go? I don't know. In that snow. And, and there's nothing around there? Could, could you give me a why? I... I can't imagine. I don't know what to do. I sit here waiting. Look... My name is Hetty Parsons. Tom and I, we've been married five years. We don't have any problems. I mean, we're very happy. If you print his picture in the story, maybe someone will see it who can help us. Excuse me a minute. Well, 
Yeah. I think I'll run with it. I don't blame you. I was always partial to girls with honey-colored hair and baby blue eyes. Ah, so you noticed, too. Have you run a check on her husband, Tom Parsons? Well, he's not one of the known bad boys. No record at all. And what did she say he did? He's an accountant. He has his own business in the Barstow building. You looked him up in the phone book? Checks out. They were headed south, huh? That's what she says. If it was a trip, there should have been bags. There were. His and hers? His and hers. How does it look? What do you want from me? I don't solve crimes. I sit here behind the desk. Come on, Lieutenant. Now, this is one for you, Fred. How could a guy disappear just like that? And in that storm. Hmm. There's no place to go. You could have had a car following in back of them. A friend was driving it, maybe. Well, he had to go somewhere. But why? Right now, we're treating it as missing persons. It's all we can do. He's not wanted for anything. He's a legitimate citizen, as far as we know. He hasn't even done anything to her. At worst, he left her in a car. He hasn't even deserted her. Yet. Who was driving? He was. She can't. Well, that's abandoning her, isn't it? No. At best, we'd have him for abandoning the car. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me a minute. Listen, Mrs. Parsons. Yes? Why, why don't you go home? I've got my oh. car outside. Oh, no, no. I, I, I want to be here in case they find time. They'll let you know if they find you. No, I don't want to be home alone tonight. I... I... Just want to stay yeah, here. But it may be hours. It may be even days. Don't say that. I'm sorry. I. I'm just so jumpy and so nervous. I can't believe what's happened to me. Well, if you're going to sit here, you should have some coffee and a sandwich. Oh, I couldn't think of food. I'll be right back. <laughs> Officer Dennis. Well, look who's here. The friendly reporter. Yeah, listen, that girl. Yeah, I was going to ask what girl, but yeah, I won't. Yeah, I, I, I want to start at the beginning. Oh, well, you know, Lieutenant Terrell's got two R's, but Patrolman Dennis got two N's. Yeah, 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 yeah. What did happen? Well, like she said, he went out to clean the rear window and he was gone. Yeah, anybody see him? Uh, I checked the car in back, but who looks? Who notices? Yeah, where could he have gone to around here? Well, on the south side, you got open fields. On this side... A couple of warehouse buildings locked up. Night watchman? Yeah, he's a retired cop. No sign of anybody trying to break in, to hide, or whatever he may have wanted to do. Okay, so what could have happened to the guy? Well, it's all very interesting, but in 15 minutes I go off duty, and I won't have to worry about it. I think I could touch a thing, but I must have been starving. Has there been any word? Yeah, you'll hear the minute they know. Now, listen, Hetty. I can help you, but you have to help me. I'll do whatever I can. We have two basic roads to explore. One, somebody was out to get your husband. Oh, no. No! Tom is the mildest, sweetest, most obliging guy on earth. He has absolutely no enemy. That you know about Tom and I have no secrets from each other. Everybody has at least one enemy. Tom is incapable of hurting anyone in any way. He sounds too good to be true. If he does have a problem, that's it. All right. The second road to explore. He wasn't pushed. He jumped. What does that mean? It means he walked out on you. Oh, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. Why? I've had a liberal education tonight, Mr. Peterson. Call me Fred. No, not yet, or maybe never. I've been introduced to a new world. I've been thrown in with people who basically don't believe in anyone, don't trust anyone, and perhaps they have good cause. Perhaps that's how life is in their world. Perhaps their world is the real world, but it isn't my world. May I ask, do you come from another world? It's entirely possible. I won't call you Fred unless and until we become friends. But that's just a little thing. The policeman who brought me here is a confirmed cynic. So is the lieutenant. And so are you. I must plead guilty as charged. All of you propose two basic hypotheses. A, my husband was ambushed by enemies. B, my husband abandoned me. You can't conceive of people who... They simply don't make or have enemies. You can't conceive of people who are completely in love. I'm not a fool, Mr. Peterson. 
I read these attitudes. What a wonderful world you live in, Mrs. Parsons. I hope you can stay there always. We're so dependent on each other, Tom and I. We need each other. We're... We're so complete together. But we still have the basic fact of his disappearance. Yes, but all you can see are two alternatives. There is a third, you know. Really? Perhaps he was taken ill suddenly and he just wandered off. Oh, maybe I should go back there. I've and... already been back there. There's no place he could have wandered off to. Tell me, does he have a history of any sort of illness, amnesia, oh. anything like that? No, nothing like that. Well, then, where are we? Nowhere. Perhaps you are nowhere, Mr. Peterson. Okay, tell me where you are. I have faith. I believe Tom will be found, or he will find himself, and he will have an absolutely reasonable and rational explanation. I hope so. Hetty! Oh! Hetty! Tom! Oh, Tom, darling. Tom, what happened to you? I was so scared. Oh, darling, you're all right. Teddy, are you all right? Yes. I don't understand. I happened to tune in the news, and there it was. Tom Parsons' accountant with offices in the Barstow building had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Oh, Tom, I was so worried. Mr. Parsons was driving with his wife. He stepped out of the car to clean off the rear window and... Teddy, what did you tell them? I wasn't in the car with you. I was at home. <laughs> Well, here we have the story of two people who love each other deeply, who trust each other completely. It sounds like the Garden of Eden. But we all know what happened back there in the traffic and the snow. We shall return shortly with Act Two. seen these couples, or rather heard of them, they dwell in a sea of perfect harmony, never a ripple of discord. But when they do have a disagreement, well, it's a beaut. Here we have Fred Peterson listening to Hetty and Tom Parsons having a fantastic difference of opinion. Tom, Tom, how can you say that? Hetty, darling, I was not in the car with you. I was home. Home. You said, let's get out of this miserable cold and snow. Let's head south for a couple of weeks. Hetty, when did I say that? How could I say that? Uh, you know I'm swamped with work at the office. You came home this afternoon, Tom. You said, how would you like to leave for Florida tonight? And I said, give me an hour to pass. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Who's he? Oh, he's just... I'm just Fred Peterson of the Union Messenger. A reporter? Oh, please, 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 don't be alarmed. I assure you it's a thoroughly respectable profession. Well, I... I see no point in... Well, emblazoning this all over the newspapers. Is there anything to emblazon, as you put it? This is a private affair. Tom, tell me what happened. What happened to you after you left me? Eddie, I told you I never left. Tom. How could I have left you? I wasn't with you. Oh, no, Tom. This time I have witnesses. The police officer, he knows you went out to clear the rear window. How does he know? Because he... Because you told him. Mr. Parsons. Now, obviously, your wife seems distraught. I would suggest... Keep your suggestions to yourself, Mr. Peterson. Don't you dare imply that I'm overwrought or nervous or hysterical. I am completely calm, extremely rational, and absolutely in command of myself. I know what happened this evening. Mr. Peterson, this is obviously a private matter between my wife and me and nobody's business but ours. What did you mean, Mrs. Parsons, when you said that this time you had witnesses? Have there been other times when... Hetty, it doesn't do us any good to air this in public. All right, Tom. Take me home. Uh, let me talk to that officer at the desk there. Find out if there's anything we have to do. Well? Well what? Friend, husband, Tom. He didn't turn out to be quite as advertised. And what is that supposed to mean? He isn't quite the sweetest, mildest, most obliging guy on earth, is he? He is to me. I guess it's all a matter of how these words are defined, isn't it? And about this oh-so-complete understanding between the two of you. Won't you at least admit you're having a difference of opinion right now? I don't have to admit anything. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I'll go quietly. Are you sure you really want me to go? Please. Regardless of what you say to me, you are in trouble. No, I... no, don't deny it. Well, what if I am? 
I'd like to help you. Why? Because... Would you want to help me if I were middle-aged and fat and sloppy and ugly? It isn't ten minutes ago. You accused me of living in a world where no one trusted the next fellow or believed in him. You accused me of being a confirmed cynic. Is it possible you don't remember what you say from one minute to the next? I'm sorry. Don't be. There's a great deal to what you said. You're kind, but no one can help you. I could try. And no one should try, either. Why not? It's too dangerous. That was the wrong thing to say to me. I'm warning you. You're only getting me in deeper. Please, Fred. For openers, my business is to take chances and get myself into... Hey, you know what happened? What? You called me Fred. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. But you did. And that means we're friends. Look, I only want... You're the one who set up the ground rules for this thing. First names are for friends only. Please, forget what happened here tonight. I warn you... You've already warned me twice. It won't work. I can only warn you three times. Do you mean you keep score? Please don't joke, Fred. You keep saying the wrong word. Or I should say the wrong name. The wrong name is Fred. You can't call me Fred and expect me to forget everything. I warn you. I warn you for the third time. Forget all about tonight, for your own sake, for your own safety. And after saying all that, you still expect me to forget about it. I... Tell my husband I'll wait for him outside in the car. Wait a minute, Hetty. I warned you, Fred. I warned you three times. Now, goodbye. Where's my wife? She said she'd meet you in the car. Uh, Mr. Peterson, if I were you, I'd forget everything that happened tonight. Is that a threat? No. A warning. That's all I've been getting around here. Warnings. Well, for your own good, take them seriously. And if I don't? You'll regret it for the rest of your life, which may not be a long one. You still insist that you're not threatening me? I'm only trying to help you. Really? And why should you do that? Why? I don't know why. Maybe it's because the last guy tried to help me. What last guy? I didn't listen to him. The last guy? What do you mean? Uh, Nothing. Forget it. You know, with you and your wife, it seems, everything turns out to be nothing and forget it. I don't think it matters now. I have an idea. It's already too late for you. I'm sorry. Good night, Mr. Peterson. Hey, Fred. Fred. Yeah, Lieutenant, I'm coming. Well? Well, what? There's nothing there for us boys in blue. What's in it for the fourth estate? Looks like he's trying to drive her nuts. It could also be the other way around. I don't think so. Because of that honey-colored blonde hair? Oh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you always know where the exposed nerve is. Just stop and figure it. Couldn't this also be her way of trying to drive him nuts? As a reporter, I would have to say yes. But, uh, as a man? I don't know. Well, you got a problem, Fred. How are you going to tackle it? As a reporter? Or as a man? Oh, Fred, what are you doing here? Won't you ask me to come in? Well, I... You could also offer me a cup of coffee. It's been a long drive on a cold morning. Oh, well, I suppose you might as well come inside. How gracious. I'm sorry. I'm... uh, Well, I'm, I'm still upset and you should know why. Come into the kitchen. I was just pouring myself a cup. Thanks. Charming place you have here. Thank you. I suppose Tom is generous enough when it comes to money and things. The implication being that he is not generous when it comes to what? Fred, if you insist on talking about Tom, I'll have to ask you to leave. Okay. Let's talk about you. No. We can't talk about me either. What can we talk about? The weather, politics, sports... You'd be surprised I'm a very well-informed person. We could talk about art or literature. I didn't come here to talk about those things. I know why you came here. Do you? Fred, I'm a married woman. But you're not a happily married woman. I'm happy enough. Okay. Let me tell you why I'm here. As a reporter, that is. It doesn't happen very often that you get a chance to be in on a story before it's a story. You follow me? No. No. Last night, all I could have gotten out of it might have been a squib on the back page, or maybe nothing. 
But something's happening here. Something's building. I don't know what it is. But one of you is lying. One of you is trying to destroy the other. And you think you can stop it? Oh, no, that's not my job. But there's going to be an explosion. And I want to be there when it blows. Because then I'll have a story. And that's all this is. That's all I am to you. A story. I was talking as a reporter. But as a man... Yes? As a man, I'd... I'd like to help you, Hetty. Even if it meant losing your story? Yes. I'd like to believe that. Why can't you? I tried to warn you, Fred. Look, we had all that last night. I can't warn you anymore, but remember, I did warn you. Yeah, sure. Don't brush it aside, Fred. Hetty, on the general subject of warnings, I've had a few in my day. From gangsters, from politicians. I mean from people who had clout. But I did warn you. Look, if you want me to, I'll sign a receipt. Let the record show that you warned me. You were right. He is trying to destroy me. Ah, finally. Why? I don't know. Okay, let's go through the standards. Is he after your money? I don't have any. Another woman? I don't think so. Is he tired of you? I don't know. Well, none of this is very helpful. I'm sorry. What was this business you were giving me back in the station house about your perfect marriage, about your perfect husband? Because he is. It's just... Well, now and then he, he imagines things like last night. What's now and then? Oh, every few months. One time he stranded me up in Maine. Another time we were supposed to go to Europe. He told me he would be delayed and to get on the plane he would make the next one. And there I was, all by myself in Paris. He denied everything. Has he seen a doctor? Yes. And? It hasn't done any good. Is he overworked? Oh, yes. Well, maybe he needs a long vacation. I'm sure of it. It all sounds pretty simple to me, except for one little item. Why have you insisted on warning me? Because it was the right thing to do. I don't understand. First, you imply that everything is so simple. Then when I start to believe it, you drop a little suggestion that throws me off balance. I, I can't seem to get anything definite out of you. Oh, but you did. What was that? A warning. <laughs> Hey, Lieutenant. Hey, how goes the Parson case? How did you know I was going to ask you about the Parson? That honey blonde hair. Does it really show that much? Pal, you are hooked. You know something? That's true. And she may even be playing me like a fish. So what can I do for you? Well, no crime has been committed yet. But you can bet there's one on the way. Well, till then, we're handcuffed around here. Sure, but you got all the facts. What facts? I mean... I mean, you can get at them in a routine way. Work up both of them, some past histories. That's spending the taxpayers' money. You spend the taxpayers' money every day. Something's ready to blow up there. Just be ready for it. That's all I'm asking. Actually, Fred, if you want the truth, we've already started. And? Keep in touch. Yeah? They said you're in this office. Well, look who's here. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. Come on in, sir. Mr. Peterson, I've decided to tell you everything. Because... Because I know you're in love with my wife. Oh, wait a minute. Now, there are all kinds of meaningless expressions. Wait a minute, see, hear, hold on, or if you... Let's dispense with them. You can't accuse me. I don't accuse you. I state a fact. Well, now, let, let's be fair. I only met your wife last night. I, I admit she's attractive. Uh, I don't even know her. <laughs> That's what I told him. That's what you told who? The last guy. The last guy she was married to. I wish I knew how to start this. Well, start at the beginning. Okay. I'm an accountant. You're a reporter. Both of us are men of the world. I mean this world. You live on facts. I live on figures. So how can I tell you? How can I expect you to believe me when I say that Hetty isn't a human being at all? She isn't? No. She's a witch. A witch? Yes. 
That's what he said. A witch. But how can it be? Wasn't all that witch business over and done with more than 200 years ago? Well, that's what we intend to find out shortly when I return with Act Three. Tom Parsons and Fred Peterson sit in a newspaper office. Both are young, alert, stylishly dressed, every bit the modern, sophisticated men of today. And yet, the subject, the very serious subject under discussion is witchcraft, of all things. Well, it isn't every day a man accuses his wife of being a witch. It isn't every day a man finds out he's married to one. I can only say... It's incredible. I know. That's what I said when he told me. When who told you? The last guy. Tell me about the last guy. I met Hetty on a cruise ship about five years ago. She said her husband had just somehow disappeared. She was distraught. (laughs) You know, she does the distraught bit to perfection. I know nothing of the kind. What happened had he, had he fallen overboard? Well, that's... That's what she made everybody think. Till we got a radiogram from shore. He claimed he knew nothing about the trip. Well, either he had boarded the boat or he hadn't. Okay, let's get all of that cleared away. There was a ticket in his name. There were some people who claimed they had seen him. The trouble is, there was a pretty drunk bond voyage party. Most everybody was in no shape to remember anything. Oh, yes. Yes, the steward did claim to have seen him aboard, but... But? I'm convinced the steward was bribed. So I bought her story. I fell in love with her. Just as you did. And I helped her kill him. Just as you're going to help her kill me. You know what I think? I know what you think. You think I'm a nut. You could look it up. Five years ago, Stacy's Mountainville Lodge in the Adirondacks. She called me. She was desperate. Come up here. He's going to kill me. I flew up. I found them. They were near a cliff. She was screaming for help. I started fighting him off. I I guess he slipped. He, he fell over the side. He was killed. Look it up. Coroner's office. You'll see. An accident. Let's assume I buy all this. How does it make her a witch? Oh. She told me. She'll tell you afterwards. She's a witch. She falls in love with men, gets tired of them, and destroys them. I think you must be... I know. I know. I'm here to warn you. But I'm going to kill her first. Let me get you a cup of coffee. You're a fool... I'm here to save your life. Sure, sure. Okay. Look her up. I mean that. See if you can find a trace of her. See if you can find out where or when she was born, who her parents were. She has absolutely no background. I tell you... Don't, don't, don't. Don't get excited. Oh, good Lord, this is all so familiar. All of this is what he said to me. And what I said to him. Back there, before I killed him. Now, nobody's going to kill anybody. I don't know you. But you look like a nice guy. Take my advice. Save yourself. Save yourself. I'm not sure I should be here with you tonight, Fred. Well, you wouldn't let me visit you at home. Oh, it just wouldn't look right. Yeah, but it's all on the level. I'm a newspaper man. It's business. I'm doing a story. I had a very proper upbringing. Where were you raised, Hetty? I'd rather not talk about it. Why? Well, I told you it was proper, but it wasn't happy. I shouldn't say this, but there were times when I thought my parents were ogres. Fred, is something wrong? No, 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 no. See, I, I just hope I, I, I didn't spell anything on you. No. I didn't have a happy childhood. I, I don't like to discuss it. Here's something we should discuss. I spoke with Tom this morning. 
I think I know what he told you. So far out, I even hesitate to mention it, but obviously he believes it. I insisted that he see a psychiatrist. In fact, we both went. And it's the doctor's opinion that Tom is riddled with guilt. You see, he thinks he murdered Larry. Larry? My first husband. But Larry was a brute. I was very young and... We're really too young to know anything about people. Larry was a drunk. I didn't know that either. And when he had a few, he would abuse me. Well, I shouldn't have done it, but I was terrified. I called Tom, and he came up and got into a fight with Larry, and... Well, there was that accident. But why should he get that far-out notion about you? According to the doctor, it had to be something... Well, something he could live with, something that could justify what he did, and he really has a vivid imagination. He strikes me as a very sober-minded person, aside He was from... a lit major at college. He became an accountant because he had to make a living. I... I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Fred. I've had so much trouble in my life, and... He's really a wonderful guy, and I love him. Why does he want to destroy us? Why should he have a guilty conscience about Larry? Whatever happened was in self-defense. Well, look, everything will turn out all right. Oh, you're only saying that because you have to say something. No, I believe it. Hello? Tom? Yes, it's Tom. But you said you were working late. Well, I am. I just took a break for dinner. Join you? Please. Fred, you obviously didn't hear a word I said this morning, did you? I heard every word. Heard them all and listened to none? Tom, you're not well, and I think we... Oh, I know what you think. You think we should go away for a rest and all that. Forget it. I know what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. (laughs) Poor Fred. I feel sorry for you. You're in love with her. To keep the record straight, I'm a reporter. There's a story here. I aim to get it. Sure, sure. That's what you tell yourself. Let's go along with you, Tom. Suppose what you say is true. Suppose she's what you say she is. Why not walk out? Get a divorce. I can't. Why? I hope you never find out. You see, she destroys you. She takes away your capacity to love. Your feelings, your mind. It's as if you're only just nourishment for her. And when everything you have to give is gone, she discards you for someone else. Tom, for your own sake, I think you should be under a doctor's care in a hospital. I suppose I should. But I want to save you. It'll make up for Larry. I must apologize, Fred, for exposing you to all this. I shouldn't have come here. But you wanted to expose him to all this. That's why you came here. You knew I always eat here when I work late. Tom, I'll do anything you want. Just tell me. (laughs) Disappear. As a supernatural person, you can arrange that without any problem. Please, Fred, go now. Leave us alone. But I don't want to... He's my problem. I have to live with it. And if you stay, well... An audience always excites him. Ah, now, look who finally showed up. What happened to that Nobel Prize for Journalism you were working on? Lieutenant, there is no Nobel Prize for Journalism. Oh. Well, what happened anyhow? I got off it all. Couldn't make heads or tails. Well, we're still on it. As a matter of fact, information keeps pouring in all the time. On her? On him. Funny duck. He was always interested in spirits, that kind of thing. He wrote his master's thesis on something called uh, demonology. Well, there's nothing there for me. As a man or a reporter? Both. You know, I've been married ten years, and I've never been tempted. But if I could be, she could do it. Oh, that dame or something. I'm surprised at you, Lieutenant. But there's hope for you. If what you say about the husband is true, he winds up uh, in the loony bin, and after a respectable interval, she could be yours. That's what's in your mind, right? You are the most cynical person I know. Come off it. We're two of a kind. I'd even wait for her myself. Lieutenant Carroll. Is uh, Fred Peterson there, please? Hold on, I'll see. It's uh, the girl you love. Cut it out. Okay, the girl we love. You here? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm here. Take it. Hello? Fred, I'm scared. 
What's the matter, Hattie? Don't ask any questions. Just come to my place. Quickly. Come in, Fred. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you're here. Hattie, Hattie, why are you shaking like that? I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Please, please, Hattie, calm down. I'm here. Everything is going to be all right. I know it. I know. It's wrong for me to talk to you like this. To feel like this. But I, I can't help no, it. No, no, we'll work it out. Somehow we'll work it out. No, no, no. Why are you scared? I, he asked me to take his suit to the cleaners this morning. And I found this in his pocket. It's a receipt. Read it. From Carrington's one double action Danforth Wilson revolver, caliber 32. He bought a gun. Don't you see? He bought a gun. All right. Why would he buy a gun if he didn't want to kill me? Well, I think we have enough to interest the police now. Are you sure about that? Tom. Well, answer the question, Fred. What do you expect from the police? I have a permit for this gun. I have every right to own it. Look, Tom, I get very nervous when people point guns at me. Maybe it's unreasonable, but do you, uh, do you mind putting that, that thing away? Well, I will. After I use it. No, Tom. Don't be a fool. You're not a killer. I always thought that. So just now... Tom, listen. Let's say you're right. That she is a witch, okay? Don't you see? You couldn't kill her anyhow. You'd empty the gun at her. It wouldn't mean a thing. Fine. Why don't we find out? I won't no. let you. Get away from me, Fred. No. Come on, step aside. Get behind me, Hattie. Get behind me, Fred. Give me that gun. gun. If you no. move, I'll kill you, too. Get Just lower it. Drop it. Take it. Oh. 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 I'm going to kill her. No, drop it. Drop it. Oh. 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 You did it. Again, Eddie. It did it. Again. Call a doctor, Eddie. Oh. Oh. Oh, what for? Oh, you poor sucker. You think she... Oh, she's not worth it. Uh. You think she's paradise? <laughs> she is. Ah, uh, she is. But it doesn't last. Oh. It doesn't last. Oh. And then... She'll kill you. She'll kill you, too. Tom. He's... He's dead. Tom. You saw, you saw there was nothing I, I could do. I know. I know. Better call, please. Lieutenant Carroll. Lieutenant, it's Fred. Hey, Fred, I got news for you. What I mean is I have absolutely no news for you. Lieutenant, listen to me. You know, we, we drew a complete blank on that dame. We trace her back to St. Louis City Hall, where she married a guy named Larry Bellows. She gave her home address as Charterville, Illinois. But there's no such place. Listen, Lieutenant. It's as if this dame just materialized out of thin air. No background at all. Wait a minute. Hetty. Who are you? Hello? Oh, Fred. Fred, why did you call? Who are you, Hetty? Fred, what's on your mind? Hetty. I warned you three times, Fred. I warned you three times. And how many warnings would you have needed? Or heeded? That's the trouble. When they have honey blonde hair, it's so hard to take them seriously. A mistake. You should always take every woman seriously. We'll be back shortly. Are there really witches? Everyone must keep his own counsel on the matter. However, if you should happen upon a damsel in distress and she has honey blonde hair and baby blue eyes, remember, we warned you three times. Our cast included Joan Loring, Mason Adams, Tom Keener, 
Alan Manson, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host at the squeaking door. Come in, won't you? Well, you're shivering. Cold? Oh, well, don't let it throw you. Just remember that many are cold, but few are frozen. (laughs) Well, our story to be different tonight is about murder. Murder and a clock. So, if you've got a little time to kill, let's do it now, huh? Why, Mr. Raymond, nobody can really kill time. Well, maybe not, but you certainly can frighten it. Didn't you ever hear of an alarmed... Mr. Raymond, someday you're going to choke on one of those puns. And won't that be nice, Mary? Then you can revive me with guess what, Lipton tea. Oh, dear. Must this go on week after week? Why must I talk to the only person in the world who doesn't know the proper uses of Lipton tea? Oh, don't say that. It isn't used to revive people. At least not in the way you mean it. Of course, lots of folks do find that Lipton's makes the day seem brighter. Yes, it sort of helps them through their housework to sit down now and then between meals, as well as at dinner and supper, and enjoy a cup of Lipton tea. And the reason why Lipton's is so satisfying is because of that one little word, brisk. B-R-I-S-K. Tea experts say that Lipton's has a brisk flavor, which means that it always tastes tangy and bracing. It's never flat or wishy-washy. So folks, ask for Lipton tea at your grocer's. You just don't know how good tea can be till you've tried Lipton's. Yes, and when you leave the grocer, step next door to the clockmaker's shop and ask him for the Judas clock. If he doesn't have it on hand, just uh, ask him to give you the works. Hmm? (laughs) Yes, the title of tonight's story is The Judas Clock. It's an original radio play by that old clock watcher, Christopher Mayo. Our star is Barry Kroger, who plays the role of Sebastian Packer. I am a clockmaker. I carry on the profession my father taught me in London. I like clocks. All that is but one. For 30 years, I've looked for a certain clock and a certain man. The clock is known to collectors as the Judas clock. The man I swore to kill when, as a boy of 14, I closed my father's glazing eyes and wiped the froth of blood from his lips. Last night, I found the Judas clock. Tonight, I may have found the man. 
I'm told you're an expert clock repairman, Mr. Um... Uh, Packer, madam. Uh, yes, I suppose I am. Well, I have a clock. Mm. Rather, my husband has. And it hasn't run for years. Would you have a look at it? Well, uh, can't you bring it in? Oh, heavens no. It weighs 500 pounds. Oh. <laughs> One of those huge marble things. Italian Renaissance, I'd say. Marble? Italian? Well, uh, uh, can you describe it further? Well, it's rather unusual. Black marble. Heavily carved with biblical characters. The ivory face has a beautifully etched scene on it. But it's a gruesome one. Gruesome? Uh, what kind of a scene? It's a picture of a man hanging from a tree. Judas! His face is positively ghastly. The Judas clock. I knew without seeing it why the clock wouldn't run. It had been built in Italy for a prince of the House of Savoy in 1598. He conceived the idea when he discovered that his family's treasures included the 30 pieces of silver of Judas Iscariot. The clock was made to run only when the 30 silver coins of Judas were in place in the clock's hollow weights. 15 in each weight. And the coins had been in my possession since the day of my father's death. Somewhere inside me, that clock still beats its deep-throated song. And I have but to close my eyes to hear again my father's voice. It's an evil clock, son. As evil as Satan himself. And it's cursed. There is a legend that every man who has owned it has died a violent and bloody death. Well, Mr. Packer, can you what? fix it? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was daydreaming. Well, yes, I, I, does Mr. Um... Arnold. Uh, Arnold. Does Mr. Arnold know that you're having the clock repaired? No. We've only been married a few weeks, and I'd like to have it working when he comes back to town tomorrow. Sort of a surprise. Mm, yes, I see. But I, I'll be there in half an hour, Mrs. Arnold. <laughs> So last night, I went to the Arnold house and found the Judas clock again. I started to work. Fog horns from the East River sounded much as I remembered they did in London. And suddenly, I was back there on a fateful day about a fortnight after the clock had been uncrated by my father. I was in the shop when the man from Scotland Yard stepped in. He walked straight to the clock and stared at it. Good afternoon, sir. Does the clock interest you? Very much. When did you acquire it? A cousin bought it at an auction in Italy. And I'm displaying it for sale and consignment. My name's Pettibone, Scotland Yard. I've been looking for this clock for a month. It was stolen in Italy. Stolen? Yes, Mr. Packer. And worse, murder was done. Afraid you're involved in a bit of something here. Murder? I'm taking possession of the clock in the name of the Crown. I shall never forget the look of horror on the detective's face a moment later. He laid his hand on the clock's carving, and it froze there, while his face drained white and his eyes bulged. He opened and closed his mouth soundlessly and crumpled to the floor with his hands to his throat. He was still and twisted and very dead. Mr. Pettibone had died of a heart attack the moment he took possession of the clock. I helped Father drag him into the stockroom. Father wanted time to think, so I went to my room. I dozed off only to wake hours later at the sound of angry voices. Well, Cousin Andrew, you've done me a fine turn, haven't you? I've told you I didn't mean to kill the old girl. It was an accident. Don't talk so loud. The boy will hear us. You killed her as soon as you learned she'd made out a will in your favor. Then when you thought it was safe, you saw all her furnishings. And sent the clock to me to sell. Very well, I did. You're in it to the ears. I'll go to the police. (laughs) And how will you explain poor, stiff Mr. Pettibone lying in your stockroom all this while? I... uh... Besides, Timothy, there's nothing to fear now Pettibone's gone. He was the only one who suspected me. Now, you're the only one who knows. I'll create this cursed black monster tomorrow and you leave with it. And will you also create Mr. Pettibone? I... I have a plan. Here, sit down in this chair. Right here. I'll show you how we can solve the whole thing. My young heart beat with a wild dread as I listened. I could only see Cousin Andy's back, but I could see Father seated dejectedly in the chair near the Judas clock. 
his head in his hands. It was midnight. All the clocks in the shop began striking the hour. And louder than all the rest was the chime of the evil clock. If only then I had known, I might have done something. But the slow strokes beat on. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And before my horrified eyes, the heavy marble piece leaned slowly from the wall and crashed across my father's back. <laughs> And Andy stood facing my father as the clock crushed his frail form and choked him. He made pitiful little sounds, his eyes begging for life. And the murderer just stood, his back to me, and watched. Thundering sinners, you die hard. Cousin Andy ran from the shop crying for help. He would claim an accident. I raced into the shop. My father was dead. I choked back my tears. And I closed the poor, staring eyes. I took the coins of Judas from the weights of the clock and ran from the shop, the blood-stained pieces jangling merrily in my pocket. Armed with the notion that the coins were of value and the definite notion that I must eat, I approached one of the many dingy little curio shops in the Limehouse district. I stepped through the fog toward a shop where a dim light burned in the rear. Every inch of wall and ceiling was hung with curios. Old armor, swords, and shields. I would have run out, but a weazened, apish man barked at me from the rear. Hey, what do you want? I... I have something to sell. What you got? I have the 30 pieces of silver that belong to Judas Iscariot. I'll twist this scrawny neck off you. Pulling me leg, eh? Oh, no, sir. I'm not pulling your leg, sir. Here they are. Oh, I mean. Silver, right enough. Where'd you cop them? Oh, I, I didn't steal them, sir. They they belong to my father. <laughs> A likely tale, that. Will you buy them? Buy them, he says. <laughs> buy them. Get out of here before I cause a bob of your scamp. Get out! Oh, no, give me my coin. Get out or I'll come about and fetch you a sound one. The ugly brute came toward me. He held my coins, clutched in a tight, hairy fist. Before I could move, he had struck me. <laughs> and I hit the wall with a clatter. And then it... It happened again. For the second time that night, the curse of the Judas clock struck. As I hit the wall... My eye caught a metallic glint above, and the heavy object dropped from the ceiling. The man was about to strike me again when the object struck his head. And remained part of him. He fell, his skull split in two by a hangman's axe. I clamped my mouth on a cry and pried the man's fist open. The fresh blood made it hard, but I recovered the coins, and I stumbled in panic through the shop and out into the night. And the fog of London never swallowed a more frightened and lonely boy. <laughs> Nasty fog swallowing a little boy. That reminds me of a little nursery rhyme. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck two. Look out, it might strike you. <laughs> Heavens, I'm glad I don't own that terrible clock. Oh, don't say that, Mary. Just think if you had the Judas clock, then time wouldn't hang, Evelyn. You know it would fall, honey. Well, if it did fall and you rescued me, wouldn't that make you a time saver? Well, he'll split my sides with an axe if Mary didn't make with a joke. Well, a very little one, Mr. Raymond. That's true. But seriously, I do have something to say about a time saver. And I'm thinking about Lipton tea. You know, Lipton's is such a handy beverage. It takes a little time to prepare, and it's always so welcome. Yes, its famous brisk flavor makes it enjoyable, not just at your own meal times, but between meals and whenever folks drop in for a visit. That's why it's a good idea to buy Lipton's in the larger, more economical size packages. That's right. The larger packages are much thriftier. 
So you see, it's wise to keep on hand a really good supply of that brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Oh, sure, it'll come in handy to warm up the chills you get from these inner sanctum stories. And, brother, you're going to shiver plenty with Barry Kroger as Sebastian Packer as this story goes on about the Judas clock. I hadn't touched those horrible coins of Judas Iscariot since the day the storekeeper was killed. By now, I half believed the legend that death followed them. I began to feel that the only way I could escape their curse was to find the Judas clock and put the coins back in its weights where they belonged. One day, as I read the notices in the Times, my heart skipped a beat. It said, Auction of Clocks. At Chopin Place, auction room, Saturday at 7. Rare items, one of them, fine Italian Renaissance piece of black marble. Rare treat for collectors, come early. Interested in something, young man? Oh, why, uh, yes, well, that, that is nothing in particular. Uh, just looking at these splendid pieces. I thought I might stay for the auction. Hmm. Look about. Auction won't start for a bit yet. I sauntered toward the black clock. My hand had scooped all the coins from my pocket. I would have to work fast and noiselessly. My sweating fingers began to unscrew the small cover on one of the weights. I would soon have the coins put back. As I thought. What have you got in your hand there? Let's have a look. No, no, nothing. Nothing at all. I was just examining. Examining my foot? You've got a flock of coins there. You must have taken them from somewhere in the clock. No. Here. No, no. Give them to me. Sometimes when things happen quickly, the mind retains details that would otherwise escape notice. As the men and I struggled, I dropped the clock's weight. It hit a short, round bit of metal directly below it. The man had a vice-like grip on my clenched hand. Blasted little wretch! No! I'll wrench your hand off for you! I heard a whirring sound within the clock, and before my horrified eyes, the supporting panel at the front of the clock's base slowly lifted on hinges. The clock was off balance and began to fall forward. I screamed a warning. Look out! The auction man was dead, mashed to a pulp of bone and blood beneath the clock as my father had been. I ran to the door and out into the street. I was right back where I'd started. Only now I knew that my father had been murdered by cousin Andy. I walked for miles, trying to pull myself together. I wandered aimlessly, or so I thought. But fate had traced my path before me, because I was startled to find myself staring into the shop window of a rare coin dealer named Megaroid. I walked into the shop. Mr. Megaroid was a nice little man. He smiled a bit quizzically at my firm belief that I possessed the betrayal coins of Judas. I poured them onto his counter. Oh, I say, you could be right, you know. Oh, these are the right era... I say, suppose they are. Uh, let me put a glass to them. Uh, Mr. McElroy, would they be worth a great deal? Uh, even if they weren't the... Well, let me see, let me see. Mm. Yes, gracious, yes, they should be worth a great deal as collector's items alone. Well, uh, Mr. McElroy, I, I I feel that there's something I, I should tell you about these pieces. They... Uh, yes? Oh, it's not important. Oh, well, now, just a moment. I have a catalogue on this here in my show window. I'll fit you just a jiffy. The coins lay on the counter. I watched Mr. Megaroid run down the aisle. As he approached the display window, his foot caught in an electric wire which lay across the floor. The lights went out and I saw him pitch forward and... Ah! Mr. Megaroid! Mr. Megaroid! The streetlight peered through the broken plate glass and played across a grotesquely sprawled form in the show window. I needed no more light than there was to see what had happened. The upper half of the heavy plate had broken and dropped flat against the solid lower half. There was no need to ask how he was. No guillotine could have done the neater job. Mr. Megaroid had no head. Who else but death can own the coins of Judas? Tonight, 
I shall find out if Mr. Arnold is Cousin Andrew. If he is, I shall feel no remorse in killing him tonight. Because while working to repair the Judas clock last night, I discovered how my father's accidental death had been well-conceived, diabolic murder. When the right-hand weight reached the floor of the clock on the twelfth stroke of midnight, it tripped a trigger which collapsed the base of the clock and caused it to fall forward. My father had died on the twelfth stroke of midnight. Have you finished, Mr. Packer? Uh, no, Mrs. Arnold. I, I, I shall have to come back tomorrow night. Uh, what time do you expect Mr. Arnold tomorrow? About 11, I'd say. Will you be finished by then? Well, I, uh, I, I think so. I, I'll have to take these weights to the shop with me, though. Something has to be added to them. Why, well, of course, Mr. Packer. Mr. Arnold will be so surprised to see the clock running, won't he? <laughs> He'll be very surprised, Mrs. Arnold. <laughs> the coins in their place within the weights. Not 15 in each weight, but 15 in one and 10 in the other. The other five coins are in my pocket. In another pocket, I have a small 38, although I don't plan to use it. Eight o'clock, and I have a 30-year-old date to keep. Good evening. Oh, Mr. Packer? Uh, yes, but I, I'm closing now. I see you are. My name is Arnold. Just came in from Chicago. Sorry to spoil your little surprise. Or my wife's, rather. You, uh, you surprised her instead? Yes. She had to confess. I wanted to go out, so she had to tell me. About engaging you to repair the Judas clock. You don't want it repaired? By all means, I insist. It's a splendid idea. But what I came for, really, was to tell you that you and I have much to talk about. Oh, do we? Yes. But look, close your place and bring along whatever you need to fix the clock, and we'll talk about it at my place. I'm all set. Let's go. Think you'll have it fixed in time to strike midnight? Oh, yes. Yes, it will strike at midnight. Right. Well, there we are, Mr. Arnold. Weights are in place. Let's see. Exactly ten minutes before midnight. Set the hands. And just a little shove on the pendulum. So. And the Judas clock ticks again. It's an evil clock, son. Evil as Satan himself. The Judas clock wakes from a 30-year sleep. Hey, Cousin Sebastian. Cousin? What? That's what I wanted to tell you. My wife told me your father owned this clock in London. Oh, I... Well, yes. I was your father's cousin. You're Sebastian Packer, the little boy who ran away that night. Cousin Henry. Yes. I wonder how much you know of that horrible night when your father was killed. Well, I... I know the clock fell on father... I heard the sound from my room, and I, I, I was so frightened. I ran down the rear steps in time to see them carry Father away. He was all covered up. So that was why I didn't find you in your room afterward. It happened so fast. We were sitting, talking. The clocks were striking twelve. Suddenly, the base of the clock seemed to cave in, and... I know. I bought the clock at an auction a few years later. Had it all fixed... It's good and solid now. <laughs> I saw to that. Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I suppose I'll run along now, Cousin Andy. Nonsense, I, nonsense. Uh, let's make up for lost time and get acquainted. Well, I... Come now, I have some fine old port from England here. I will... Sit down a while. No, 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 not that chair. No? This one's a lot more comfortable. <sighs> it's a funny thing. When you work with clocks, as long as I have, you get to philosophizing about time. That's so. How? Well, here I sit by the big clock, just as my father sat 30 years ago. 
You know how many seconds ago that was, Cousin Andy? No. Do you? Well, uh, um, 315,360,000 seconds in 10 years. That'd be uh, uh, 9,460,800,000 seconds in 30 years. <laughs> You've got quite a mechanical mind, Sebastian. Huh. Here, try this port. Thank you. Yes, to father. Mm. What's the matter, Cousin Andy? Are you ill? No. Your face is quite drawn, gray. Shut up. Nandy, it's late. I guess I'd best go. You know, you, you do look awfully sick. Oh, don't get up, old man. Oh, oh, no. I... Here, sit down and relax. Take my chair. It's the more comfortable. Why, oh, you're shaking like a leaf. Now, just sit quietly. I'll see myself out. Thundering sinners, I... Good night, cousin Andy. Oh, oh Sebastian. <laughs> Sebastian. <laughs> Get it off. It's a bag. Get it in heaven's name. Oh. <laughs> Poor cousin Andy. You're choking to death. You die hard, too, don't you? It was just a matter of timing. I set the hand a minute fast and the weight didn't touch your clever little spring device till just now because it's lighter by five pieces of cursed Judas money. Rest easy, father. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. What a fine chime was had by all. Uh, anybody want to buy a large grandfather clock? I'm in the market for a sundial myself. A sundial? My, they are old-timey. Mm. Say, Mr. Raymond, if you're afraid of clocks that tick, why don't you try to get hold of one of those old Egyptian water clocks? Oh, Mary, now you're going to tell me that when tea time comes around, the water begins to boil in the clock? Well, that would be quite an invention. Mm. But no, Mr. Raymond, right now I'm not going to talk about Lipton tea. Instead, I'm going to tell our listeners about an important job that lies ahead. A fight that's far from finished. Yes, the battle for Japan. Our government says that this Pacific War will be one of the most bitter and difficult in history. Never before has a nation fought so far away from its own shores. And to support this fight, we at home must work even harder at our home front activities. We must keep on buying more and more bonds, and we must hold on to them. And above all, we must stay on our war job until the job in the Pacific is over. <laughs> Well, I'll leave you with a cheerful, timely moral. Oh, that goes with tonight's story. No extra charge. Now, you can figure out how many seconds you've lived. All right, that's your pastime. But you can't figure out how many you've got left. That's just, uh, sometime. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I'll see you in just 604,800 seconds from right now. Hmm? Well, that's next Tuesday night at nine o'clock, of course. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is The Lucky Stiff by Craig Rice. Well, now it's really time to close that there squeaking door until next Tuesday night when Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup bring you another Inner Sanctum Mystery directed by Hyman Brown. So until then, good night. 
pleasant dream. Hmm? <laughs> If you'd like to give the boys overseas a real taste of home, then why not include a package or two of Lipton's noodle soup mix the next time you send them a box of food? Yes, Lipton's has the same homemade, chickeny taste as the soup you make right in your own kitchen. That's why it's a thoughtful, welcome little gift to send Lipton's. And as you know yourself, Lipton's noodle soup makes a grand snack. So remember, send a package or two to your boy. And remember to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Mystery Theater. in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Most people look upon their own everyday lives as being routine, without much excitement. But that shouldn't stop anyone from having an active imagination. This is why we make our escape from the humdrum with stories of adventure, mystery, and murder. Another mental activity most people enjoy is fitting together the pieces of a puzzle. The stranger the shapes, the more challenging that puzzle becomes. Our present puzzle concerns a young man who is called upon to use all his wits in figuring out the whereabouts of a string of deadly pearls. Now, it's absolutely essential, Keith, that you understand the importance of this assignment. I believe I do, sir. If those pearls aren't recovered, and recovered soon... It's an established fact that someone else will die. I understand. And no matter what happens, no one on that island must have any idea who you really are or what you're doing there. Check. You better be a good actor. I think I can manage that. What do I have to lose? You could lose your life. Our mystery drama, The Deadly Pearls, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Paul Hecht and Kate Reed. Although the FBI and the Honolulu police were in on the case... Because of certain peculiar circumstances, it was important that the criminal be apprehended by a private investigator. This hazardous assignment went to Keith Spencer, a young man who had proved his physical courage in wartime service. But other qualifications were required for the job. As explained, when Keith had his final briefing in San Francisco with the head of the Gordon Investigating Service... Afraid we've given you a rough time these past few days. Oh, I didn't mind, sir. Only I am anxious to get going. Uh, you do type, don't you? Uh, sure. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to prove it, so let's do two things at once. Take over this typewriter, and mm. I'll dictate some paragraphs. Okay, shoot. Uh, I, Keith Spencer, am unmarried, with no living relatives... And no dependents. From this day forward, and until the completion of this assignment, I have assumed the identity of Robert Keith Ryder. And under no circumstances will I reveal my true identity. Is that all? Yeah, if you'll sign it. Sure, got a pen. Here. Oh... I suppose you should have signed a statement about your ability to play bridge. What? You did assure us that you play at least an average game of contract. Well, sure, but I didn't realize it was all that important. It could be crucial. Our three suspects are avid bridge players, when they can find a fourth. Okay. 
Now, before I leave, let's go over the basic facts once more. All right. The missing pearls were cultured. A single strand, about 24 inches long. So they'd hang down about 12 inches if someone was wearing them. They don't sound very spectacular. Yeah, but they are. Jonathan Kohlmeyer, who bought them, was a partner in a watch company which made radium dials. And somehow he managed to have the pearls treated with radium so they would glow in the dark. When he first thought up this scheme, did he have an ulterior motive? Okay. Who knows? It was what happened later that we care about. And you don't think he started out as a murderer? Well, that's beside the point. He became one. And when he found out how easy it was, he did it again, three times. Now, clue me in. Who did he bump off first? The first woman he gave the pearls to was said to be very frail. When she died in an accident, Kohlmeyer was in a state of shock. So no one accused him of complicity in her death. Yeah, but apparently he did retrieve whatever presents he'd given her. Oh, yeah. He was that type. Then he got married. He gave the pearls to his bride, who wore them constantly. She loved that string of pearls. How long did she last? Radium can be a slow death. But it caught up with her after a while, and when she was dying, the doctors suspected radium poisoning. So why didn't they nail her husband right then? It never occurred to anyone to suspect the pearls. How could any smart murderer pull the same stunt again? He fell in love with a young and brainless beauty. Must have really liked her because he didn't give her the pearls for a long time. Not till he retired and they moved to Hawaii. What did she do to deserve such a present? <laughs> Started playing around with another man. Hmm. That did it. Kohlmeyer gave her the pearls. She moved out. Went off with the pearls and her new boyfriend to a scarcely inhabited island, a small one, well offshore from Oahu. And when she developed an unexplained malady, the boyfriend left her. Big-hearted guy. <laughs> well, after her death, there was an autopsy. And this time, no question. Radium poisoning. Now, why didn't the police move in and confiscate the pearls? There were no pearls to be found. Now, isn't it possible that Kohlmeyer had been there and gotten them? No way. Kohlmeyer committed suicide without returning to the islands. Without a confession about what he'd done. Good Lord, no. He was a respected businessman. Now, you think the pearls are still on the island? We're sure of it. But more than that, Keith, we've narrowed down to three people who lived nearest the cottage where the last victim died. So my job, then, is to make friends with these three people and find out quietly which one of them has the deadly pearls. Well, you make it sound too easy. Each of these people is highly eccentric. The few people who come and go from that island are under constant surveillance. Including me. Naturally. The pearls were usually kept in a narrow box. It looked like an ordinary jeweler's box, but it was made of lead. Yeah, protection against the radium, of course. It means it would be heavier than most boxes that size. Well, that makes it seem more elegant. The box is covered with purple velvet and lined with satin. How original. I know. It won't look much different from any jewel box you've ever seen. Mm. I can't help thinking how useful a Geiger counter would be. No, that's totally out of the question. When you bring a Geiger near a suspected object, it starts ticking. Sure, sure, I know. No gadgets to make life easier. Just your own ingenuity. And it better be damn good. Well, there's not much more I can say, except to wish you luck. <laughs> I did my homework, and the more I read about those three characters on the island, the more curious I was to meet them. The Honolulu police cleared me, and then I was completely on my own with a photograph of the cottage and a map that showed how to find it. I was given a putt-putt stocked with a supply of canned goods, stowed the typewriter and duffel bag, and at last I was off. It was a cloudless day, and I found the beaching cove on the island without any trouble. You couldn't see the cottage from the beach, but I knew how to follow directions. Lugging my big canvas bag, I headed up a steep and winding path. And there it was, a neat, modern cottage with an enormous deck from which there must be quite a spectacular view. But I had a spectacular view myself just then, because on that deck was a dazzling blonde. Obviously sunbathing, she sprang to her feet in all her glory, and <laughs> I would have been speechless, except I knew I couldn't be. Who the hell are you? I, oh, uh, this, this is the Kohlmeyer Cottage, isn't it? What business is that of yours? <laughs> I'm the new tenant. 
This place is not for rent. Uh, no, uh, that's right. Not anymore. I've signed the papers. It's mine. Uh, for at least a year. Who are you? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. How rude of me not to introduce myself. I'm Robert Keith, a writer in search of a quiet place to hang a typewriter. <laughs> I don't believe you. The last thing we need around here is a writer. Lady, I am planning to live here. Not if I can help it. Okay. Uh, I've answered your questions. How about answering one for me? Who are you? None of your business. Since you claim the house is yours, I see you open the door. Uh, just what I was about to do. Now, I understand it takes two keys. And here they are. Both of them. Where'd you get those keys? Uh, now, do you believe me? <laughs> Big deal, you opened the door. And now I know who you are. You're a policeman. They sent you here to spy on us. Well, I'm not going to stand for it. When the supply boat comes around tomorrow, I'll send a message back to my lawyer. No penny anti flunky is going to be spying on me. I assure you, I'm not Don't going to Don't bother to unpack your things, Robert Keith, because tomorrow... Oh, really, Miss... Uh... Mrs. Walsh. Mrs. Barbara Walsh. And you'll find that I have protection against people like you. <laughs> The gorgeously suntanned Mrs. Walsh slipped her feet into sandals, picked up her beach towel from the deck, and started along the path which led from the north side of the cottage. You must understand that during our entire conversation, Barbara Walsh was completely in the buff. No bikini. Nothing. Except around her neck and dangling in long loops over her well-formed body. Not pearls. But necklaces made of those decorative native seeds strung together. Ropes and ropes of them. Robert Keith may have thought he was prepared for anything. But this introduction to his new home was an unsettling experience he hadn't counted on. He has now had a most revealing look at one of the three suspects. We'll be there for his encounter with the others when we return shortly with Act Two. Robert Keith found the cottage very much to his liking. He had expected something rather dark and sinister. But one wall of the living room had a big picture window... And in the bedroom, there was a slanting skylight directly over the bed. It was certainly no place to hide. And Keith realized that whatever he did could be watched at close range, if anyone cared about what he was doing. He spent the first evening getting settled, and after a late supper of canned goods, he turned in for the night. At about three o'clock in the morning, he was sleeping soundly when... What the devil? Hey, hey, who's out there? Well, bless my soul. Hey, would you mind pointing that gun in another direction? Not until I find out what you're up to. Oh, look, I, I was sound asleep. I, I, I'm living here. No one lives in this house. Put up your hands. Now put down your gun, would you, sir? Sir, I'm a man of honor. Colonel George Madison's the name, army retired. And no one sets foot on this island without reporting to me. Uh, yeah, well... I, I'm sorry, I didn't know that, Colonel. And uh, if you'll come in, I'll, I'll show you my credentials. And... What the hell's that? Is, is there someone else out there? No, no. Wait a minute. I'll check you out later. Right now, I recommend you go back to bed. Oh. There's a wild boar under the deck, and I aim to get him. <laughs> When the sun came up, it was another cloudless day. And after breakfast, I decided to pay a visit. <laughs> Not eager to encounter either the gun-happy colonel or the wild-eyed lady with no clothes, it seemed wise to seek a formal introduction to the third island resident. The path to her property was overgrown with luxuriant shrubbery, but it opened up into an area dotted with palm trees surrounding a small stone house. Squatting in the midst of a flower bed was a gnome of a woman wearing one of those loose garments the Hawaiians call moo-moos. I wondered when you were coming. You were, you were expecting me? Of course. You're the writer who's moved into the death cottage. Uh, moved into the what? 
So surely the rental agent told you that the three former tenants died there. I think you're just trying to frighten me, but I don't scare easily. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you, Mr. Keith? Well, you know my name. Well, since we're going to be neighbors, perhaps you'll tell me... I'm Nora Babcock. And if you'll help me up, we'll go to my porch where the coffee's perking. I assisted Miss Babcock to her feet. The aging body was stooped and slow-moving, and her hands were badly crippled... Yet, she used them capably to pour the coffee when we were seated at a wicker table on her porch. Oh, yes, Mr. Keith. I've lived on this island for a long time. That house was just a shack when the poor man, a writer like yourself, was stabbed to death in a ghastly pool of blood. The cottage was rebuilt before an unfortunate woman was strangled there. And then it was fixed up with all that glass to let the sun in. But nothing could save the last dear lady who simply wasted away. Well, here's hoping I'll have better luck. That depends. When were you born, Mr. Keith? You mean what year? No, 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 no. The date. The day. The hour. Oh, um, I, I was born in August. Uh, uh, 14th of August. Oh. You sound disappointed. You certainly don't look like Leo. The lion. And I would have thought that a writer... Ah, oh, but no matter. There may be other factors. You belong to the northern sign of the Zodiac. The middle point of the magnet of the fire triplicity. <laughs> Is that a fact? Oh, you'd better not laugh at me, Mr. Keith. I'll tell you right now that you and I are destined to be enemies. You belong with Sagittarius, Libra, or Aries. Oh, come on, Miss Babcock. I'm really not so bad. Now, tell me about your sign. I'm Gemini. The positive people of the air triplicity. You mean, you mean air and fire don't mix? Dangerously, Mr. Keith, very dangerously. Your sign is governed by the sun, and your gems are carnelian and sardonyx. Well, I wouldn't know a sardonyx if I stumbled over one. My governing planet is mercury. Emeralds, moonstones, and pearls are my sign. And I have a very special affinity for pearls. <laughs> Mrs. Walsh had obviously passed along word of my arrival, which was why the colonel had come trying to flush me out, and the reason Miss Babcock knew my name and occupation. So, that afternoon, I became a spy, hidden in the underbrush with binoculars trained on the three of them walking along the beach. I was darn sure they were planning some strategy to get me evicted. Then, Colonel Madison left the two ladies and headed up the trail toward my house, I went quickly to the typewriter and pretended to be busily at work. Hello there, Mr. Keith. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, uh, that it is. How are you, Colonel? Oh, couldn't be better. Say, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry about last night. Wouldn't want you to think we're not hospitable around here. Uh, do you mind if I sit down? No, no, please, please do. I was beginning to feel like an outcast. <laughs> I gather you've met the ladies. Yes, they didn't exactly give me a warm welcome. Uh, oh, pay no attention. Batty old Babcock won't be a problem. She's usually off in outer space, you know, talking to the stars. I gather she's hipped on astrology. Oh, mad as a hatter, even though she does play a good game of bridge. Hmm. Uh, you say you're also acquainted with uh, Barbara Walsh? If you mean, have I had a good look at her, you're darn right. Uh, <laughs> Stunning, isn't she? <laughs> you said it. Well, look, tell me, Colonel, what's a woman like that doing all by herself way out here? Oh, but if this were a British colony, I'd say she's a remittance woman. She's being paid to stay away? Yeah, being paid very well. The big man in her life is a, well, a, a mafia type. They nabbed him. My guess is the family's afraid she'll talk unless she's kept well out of the way until he's released from jail. What's he in for? No oh, drug traffic, I think, I don't know. Dealing in stolen goods. Uh, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about you, Mr. Keith. You writer fellows interest me. What's your special subject? Well, I'm a novelist, uh, science fiction sometimes, but mostly light stuff. Hmm. Know anything about pearls? <laughs> uh, no, not much. Uh, How would you like to come over to the other side of the island and watch the pearl divers? Pearl divers? Uh, here? Oh, well, it's, it's not like Ceylon or the Sulu Sea. But they go through the motions here twice a week during the season. 
Occasionally they come up with a creditable pearl. Come along if you want to. Well, I'd like that very much. Fine. Oh, wear some stout walking shoes, and I'll pick you up in about... about an hour. The colonel arrived in his old army uniform carrying a sturdy walking stick. We started off on a barely marked trail, and I marveled at the beauty of the place with its lush flowers and brightly colored birds. Not that way, Mr. Keith. We take a sharp turn over here. Go up the hill. Uh, uh, just a minute. Th this island must be more populated than I thought. I, I hear music. Oh, that's just Barbara Walsh with her radio going. She has it on all day long. That or her stereo. Come along. Get ready for a steep climb. The path went straight up, and I had to scramble to keep the colonel from getting too far ahead. But quite suddenly, all the lush greenery ended, and we came out on a rocky promontory overlooking the sea. Uh, uh, we made it. <laughs> uh, that's quite a view. Hey. Now, you see those small boats way out there? Yeah. Those are the oyster fishermen. The, the flat bottom boats are dragging nets. Uh -huh. And from those kayak-looking things, you may be able to see the young men diving. Won't they come closer to shore? No, not, not much closer. It's too treacherous when the tides are running as high as they are today. Go on, out on that big rock so you can get a better look. Uh, is it steady? Oh, like Gibraltar. Go on, Mr. Keith, out further. Don't be afraid. Watch your step, Mr. Keith. Hey. Ah! Ah! Merciful heavens! Hey, help me, Colonel! Help! Help me! Hang on, Keith, hang on. I'm trying to get a foothold. Here, here. Grab my walking stick. I grabbed the stick because I had to, even though I knew it was the same stick that had been pushed into the middle of my back just a moment before. Well, I'll say you're a brave man, Keith. I like the way you handled yourself back there on the rocks. I wouldn't say I had much alternative. Uh, it was all the fault of your shoes, Mr. Keith. That's what it was. I, I warned you to wear walking shoes. Uh, I say, Mr. Keith, why don't we stop by to see Barbara? Right now? Why not? We need a drink. <laughs> And she has a good liquor supply. Oh, I think I'd better get back and tend to these scratches. <laughs> Let's take a look at my clothes. I'm in no condition to go visiting. Well, as you wish. I'll leave you then at the foot of this hill. And, um, oh, yes, yes, I, I've been meaning to ask you, Keith. Do you play bridge? Well, I'm not the world's best, but yes, I play. Oh, splendid. I'm rather out of practice. Well, heavens knows, so are we. Well, let's say my house, Friday evening. Come for supper, round seven. Oh, thank you. Tell me, Mr. Keith, you did get scratched up. Your hands are still bleeding. Uh, perhaps I should go with you. No, I'll be all right. Uh, yes. Well, I, I'm off then uh, to tell the ladies the good news. Good news? Why, yes, yes. The good news that we found a new bridge partner. Uh, and I might as well warn you to bring our fat wallet. Our stakes are high. <laughs> After a shower and some soothing applications of witch hazel and ointments, I rested on the big bed under the skylight. The front door was wide open for the benefit of a magnificent sea breeze. But suddenly I was on the alert. Someone, someone was on the steps leading to the deck. Then there were slow, heavy footfalls and the tap of a cane. Mr. Keith? Mr. Keith? Are you all right? Oh, why, hello, Miss Babcock. Yes, uh, come in. Oh, I heard you'd had an accident, and I thought you might not be able to fix your own supper. So I've brought you some nice oyster stew. Oh, well, that's very thoughtful of you. Yeah. It's one of my specialties. Just warm it up. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sit down. Uh, won't you share the stew with me? No, no, no. no. I, I've had my, my dinner. Uh, let me see your injuries. Oh, they're nothing but scratches. I was oh, lucky. Oh, could be serious. And you are not lucky, Mr. Keith. I looked at the stars last night, and the heavens do not bode well for anyone born under the sign of Leo. But you see me alive and well. 
I could have crashed all the way down those rocks and into the sea. Look out for more danger ahead. That was simply the first warning. Miss Babcock knew what she was talking about, and it had nothing to do with the stars. I heated the oyster stew, and it was delicious. In fact, the best I've ever tasted. But about an hour later, I began to feel drained of all energy. I thought it was just a reaction from a rather strenuous day and decided the best thing to do was go to bed and sleep it off. It was a tremendous effort to get undressed, but I managed to drag myself, partially clothed, onto the big bed. In a prone position, I... I felt as though I were being suffocated and panic was setting in. I'd been poisoned. And no one was going to save my life this time unless I did it for myself. Literally, I crawled into the bathroom for the well-stocked medicine kit. Yes, I was prepared with antidotes for poison, but time was too short to figure out which one would be appropriate. By now, my hands and feet were growing numb and breathing was getting more... And more difficult. I mixed up a heavy pink liquid in a, in a glass of water. And just before blacking out, I was very, very sick. When I came to, I was lying on the bathroom floor. Weak, but grateful to find I was still alive. Very slowly, I got to my feet and staggered toward the bedroom, hoping at last to sleep off the effects of whatever had been in that poisonous stew. But my whole body sagged, and I knew I'd never make the bed, so I eased myself down on a narrow couch in the living room and fell instantly into a heavy slumber. Once again, it it must have been about three o'clock in the morning... When there was a sound which would have awakened the dead. The skylight in the bedroom. Back flat against the wall. I waited for minutes that seemed like an eternity. No movement. Absolute silence. So I crept into the next room. Armed with a flashlight. And cupping the beam. Examined the bed. It was a mass of shattered glass. In the darkness once more, I moved stealthily to the front door, opened it without a sound, and stared into total blackness. Slowly I raised the flashlight and then snapped it on full beam, pointing straight down the path. Facing directly toward me stood the statuesque Mrs. Barbara Walsh fully clothed in a long, dark kimono. And over her breasts hung a necklace of gems which burst into life like Fourth of July sparklers. I must warn you not to jump to conclusions. If you imagine that Mrs. Walsh was wearing the stolen pearls, think again. Diamonds are the jewels that glitter when exposed to light. A pearl is sometimes a gem of great value, but it is not a precious stone. And one can scarcely say that pearls sparkle, while radium... Remember the dial on your watch or bedside clock? Radium glows in the dark. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Mercifully for Robert Keith, the next two nights and three days were totally uneventful. He dozed in the sun, occasionally pecked at the typewriter, and did a great deal of thinking. Keith looked forward eagerly to the evening of bridge, and as he approached the colonel's house for the first time, he found a charming, sprawling building with a table set out of doors on what the Hawaiians call a lanai. He was glad he had purchased a colorful sport shirt in Honolulu, although it paled beside the one Colonel Madison was wearing over his white slacks. Even Miss Babcock looked festive in her flowered moo-moo. Hi. 
Ah, welcome, my boy, welcome. You're looking much better, Mr. Keyes. They're quite recovered, thank you. Uh, this island air will cure anything. Anything but my arthritis. Where's Barbara? Oh, always late. I suspect she's getting herself decked out, <laughs> ready for the kill. Oh. You expressed things so aptly, Colonel. <laughs> if it's like old times, Barbara will come prepared for murder at the bridge table. Oh, I'm speaking... Well, hello, of... everybody. Oh, Barbara. Well, you've outdone yourself. Hey, dazzling. Simply dazzling. Oh, Colonel. And, uh, Nora, dear. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I believe you've met Mr. Keith. My lawyer has verified that he exists. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Mr. Keith, you may have the right to live on this island, but that doesn't mean that I have to love my neighbor. Oh, no, 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 Barbara. However, since we have so little opportunity for social occasions, I propose we declare an armed truce. But I'm not at war with you, Mrs. Walsh. Speak for yourself. Peace for the evening. Dinner began with oysters on the half shell. Six enormous oysters for each of us. And I shall be interested in your opinion of these, Keith. D delivered by my favorite fisherman, fresh from the beds this morning. Colonel, look! My horoscope said this would be a lucky day. Well, bless my soul. Oh, Nora has nothing on me. I found one, too. But I suspect you, Colonel. Come on, confess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I confess. <laughs> Party favors. There's a pearl in every oyster oh, shell. You rogue. I must say, this is rather a good one. Nice sheen. Oh, I love them. Every one. They feel so good. I thought the surprise was just for the ladies, but I see you've included me. Very pretty, Colonel. Well, let that be the beginning of your collection. Uh, I hope you won't mind if some of them are already pierced. You mean a pearl like this one has been removed from a string? Yes, that's right. Part of my hobby. I seldom find a string that meets my standards for matching, so I, I rematch them and mix them. Uh, but come, let's finish our dinner so we can get on to the battle. Afraid I'll have to pass. Uh, I say three no trump. Uh, well, four hearts. Five no trump. Barbara, do you have a ring on every finger? Uh, only on eight. Oh, I wish I could wear them. But my poor crippled hands. Oh, shut up, Nora. You're just trying to distract me. I have a contract to make. It was a cutthroat game, no question about it. Only, strangely, we were quite evenly matched. We played three rubbers, so I had my chance with each one as a partner. By this time, we were on a first-name basis. Well, that's it. And as usual, top honors go to the ladies. In points, let's see... Barbara's first, then Nora, followed by Bob, <laughs> and uh, as is proper for a gracious host, I, I'm last. Uh, it'll take a minute to figure out who owes what here. I think the prize should go to Robert and me for that last small slam. <laughs> I wouldn't have dreamed that Leo and Gemini could work so well together. Uh, tell me, Mr... <sighs> I mean, Robert. Never Bob. Isn't there some way you could find out the hour of your birth? What rubbish. Well, if it would please you, Miss Nora, I suppose I could write and ask my mother. Well, you do that. It's very important. Oh, Nora. Uh, speaking of my mother, you've all given me a very good idea. Look, I'd like to send her a present. A present for your mother? <laughs> You'll think I'm sentimental, but many years ago, my dad gave her a string of pearls as an anniversary present, and, well, they were her greatest treasure. Dad's been dead a long time now, and she was heartbroken when the pearls were stolen from her New York apartment. Oh, well, well, say no more. I'll fix you up. How much do you want to pay? Oh, now, just a minute, Colonel. I'm afraid you deal in merchandise that's too rich for my blood. I'm, I'm talking about a simple string of cultured pearls. A couple of hundred dollars? <laughs> now you're on the right track. Ridiculous. Yeah. Excuse me, everybody, but I'm very tired. Time to go home. Well, I'll be happy to escort the ladies. Don't bother with me. Perhaps you're not aware that I spend most of every night wandering around the island alone. Oh, go with them, Barbara. Or you'll have to help me with the dishes. Oh, that does it. Walking with Nora Babcock was a tortuous business. And I had a feeling she was in pain every step of the way. And we lost sight of Barbara, although she had an unsettling trick of appearing on the path, sometimes in front of us, sometimes behind when we reached the door of Nora's house, 
She's out there somewhere. And I don't want her to hear. If you'll come to my house tomorrow afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about those pearls for your mother. Fine. Uh, what time? Around two o'clock. Okay, be seeing you. Good night. And now you may have the pleasure of seeing me home. Oh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a pleasure uh, and a surprise. You want to know what I have against you, don't you? I am curious. Well, come to my house for a nightcap and I'll tell you. What do you think of my pad? Exotic luxury. Mm, you writers have a way with words. But you don't fit the pattern. And what pattern is that? Oh. Novelist, I despise them. Oh, come on. We're no different from anyone else. My husband was a woman hater who wrote about women and knew nothing about them. Oh, that man crucified me in his books. Well, I know, you're different. I could tell from the way you talked about your mother. <laughs> uh, come over here. Sit on the couch. Hmm. That's better. Hold my hand. You know... You know, it's been frightfully dull around here. Pretty hands. But uh, don't your fingers get tired under all those rocks? Take the rings off. It'll make you feel any more comfortable. Uh, now let's see. Rubies. Diamonds. Sapphires. Suppose you'd never stoop to wearing something as simple as a pearl. On the contrary. My most prized possession, I own a string of priceless pearls. Over there in that velvet box. May I see them? I don't put them on display for just anybody. Uh, but if you're a good boy, I'll show them to you. Here, let me freshen your drink. You have some fascinating things in this room. That uh, Buddha, for instance. It's carved from jade. And, uh, ah, are these the pearls? Put down that box. Oh, you said you'd show them to me. But it's locked and I, uh, I have to get the key. Oh, yes, Bob. I said I'd show you the pearls. If you're a good boy. And I will. Tomorrow morning. After you spend the night. When I was having breakfast next morning in the sunshine on my deck, uh, yes, I was alone. I had not spent the night with Barbara Walsh. In my line of work, it has to be business before pleasure. <laughs> there was no need to accept a bribe. You see, when I picked up that purple velvet jewel box, it was light as a feather. But, as I was saying, while eating breakfast... Well, good morning. You're a late riser. Yeah, I went to a big party last night, Colonel. Come on, have a cup of coffee. I brought you something. Uh, don't pay any attention to the looks of the box. The velvet's worn. <laughs> it's been around for a while. It's what's inside that counts. I'd be glad to sell you the pearls. Hmm. Open the box. Oh, they're beautiful. Well, these are not the ones we were talking about last night. I mean, this is a double strand... <laughs> Obviously far more expensive. I know, I know. They can be sold for several thousand dollars someday. But my price to you still stands. Oh, no, 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 Colonel. I, I just can't accept it. My good man, I'm offering you the kind of bargain that comes once in a lifetime. But it'll never do for my mother. Don't you have something else? Yes, of course I do. I thought I owed you a favor. Oh, you owe me nothing. Now, please, Colonel, if you'll let me go to your house, but... Perhaps you could show me another string that would be... I, 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 I'll show you nothing right now. Good morning, sir. The colonel stomped off, and I knew I would have to change my approach if I wanted to look at his collection. Then I'd think about that later, because my next appointment was with Nora Babcock. Come in, Robert. Didn't we have a good time last night? You can be my bridge partner anytime. That's very sweet. Um, I, I meant to ask you... How did you like my oyster stew? Oh, the taste was superb, but... Uh... Uh, didn't it help you to go to sleep? <clears throat> Look, I'll level with you, Miss B. You put something in that stew, didn't you? 
Oh, I, uh, the, the usual dash of chili sauce and, and, and plenty of rich cream. No, no, no. I mean, I mean something, something bad. Oh. I don't understand. That stew made me deathly ill. Why, I, I wanted you to sleep well after your accident, so I did put in a drop or two of my sedative. The kind that helps me. Uh, from one of those bottles. Uh, perhaps it shouldn't have been combined with the seafood. Yeah, perhaps. I thought you were trying to poison me. How could you have such thoughts about a poor old lady? I, I take them all back. Mm -hmm. When is your mother's birthday? Oh, it's in June. Like yours. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. My pearls were a present. And nothing would please me more than giving them to a Gemini. Oh, that's, that's very generous of you, but and I... Please I just... get the pearls for me, Robert. On that cabinet over there. Okay. You, you'll find the box is rather heavy. You say these pearls were given to you? Yes. <laughs> yes. By the dear lady who lived in your cottage. I took care of her, poor thing. And before she died, she gave me her dearest treasure. Open the box and tell me what you think. I think they're perfect. Oh, you don't know the best part. These pearls have a magical quality. Just wait until you see what happens to them at night. Uh -huh. Pick uh, them up, examine them. Yeah. I like the way they look against the satin. Oh, how I love them. Nora, just when do you wear these pearls? Oh, they're not for wearing. At least not for me. I like to fondle them. And before my hands got so, so bad, I used them the way the Greeks do. You, you know, worry beads. <laughs> I've often taken them to bed with me. Nora, these hands of yours... Oh, it's, it's not my hands. You see how hard it is for me to get around. Yes, I know. Uh, have you been to a doctor? No use. I have my medicines. Though they don't do much good. I know a fine doctor in Honolulu. I, I think he can help you. Will you let me take you to him? Oh, I couldn't let you do that, Robert. It's not in the stars. How many times have I told you? I've been warned never to trust a Leo. Look, Nora, for reasons I won't trouble you with, and <laughs> that, of course, I wouldn't want the Colonel or Barbara to know, I'm not the person I've pretended to be. Would it make any difference to you if I told you I was actually born on January the 2nd? Why, all the difference in the world I should have known. We were destined to be friends from the very beginning, Mr. Keith. Yes. Uh, just Keith. That's my real first name. I'll go with you wherever you want me to go. Case closed. Miss Babcock's destiny was not written in the stars, even though she went to her grave believing it was. The deadly pearls were taken out of circulation, and Nora Babcock was given the best of care in a hospital where they did what they could to ease the pain during the short time she had left to live. It was thought best not to shatter her dream, so she never knew that Keith Spencer was an orphan or that her treasured pearls had been anything but a comfort. I'll be back shortly. Keith Spencer found a good deal more on that island than the missing pearls. He stepped into the lives of three people whose philosophies did not agree with his, yet with each, he had at least one point of mutual understanding. Our mystery was solved with the apprehension of a victim rather than a culprit. Our cast included Kate Reed, Paul Hecht, Grace Matthews, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
Captain T and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries starring Miriam Hopkins. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host, Raymond, ready as always to provide you with your weekly ration of screams, gurgles, and blood. All in a spirit of gentle fun. I have no other object in mind. Except to reduce you to sniveling wrecks of nerves and shudders. <laughs> have you got a white sheet handy? You might uh, wrap it around yourself in case a ghost shows up. You'll think you're in the business and pass right on through you. <laughs> now, Mr. Raymond, don't be so silly. You know there are no such things as ghosts. Who said that? Oh, hello, Mary Bennett. So you don't believe in ghosts, huh? And, uh... What's that standing behind you, huh? Oh! Oh, you shouldn't have done that, frightening me that way. Shame on you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Can I make amends? Well, you might... You might tell the folks how much you enjoy Lipton tea. Oh, gladly, gladly. Friends, just the other day, a ghost and I were having a conversation about Lipton tea Now, and... here, here, here. Enough of that. Nobody is interested in what you and the ghost said about Lipton tea. Oh. No. No. Let's talk about real people and the solid pleasure they get from Lipton's. They drink it at mealtimes. They serve it when friends drop in for a visit. And, of course, they often brew themselves a cup of Lipton's during the day. Just because it's so nice to relax and enjoy that famous brisk flavor. Oh, by the way, that word brisk, B-R-I-S-K, is one that tea experts use. Brisk means that Lipton's always tastes tangy and bracing. It's never flat or wishy-washy. Yes, you just don't, don't know how good tea can be until you know how good Lipton's is. Okay, Mary, uh, suppose you go fry me a cup of tea. But uh, keep the kitchen door open because you're about to hear the story of the Bog Oak Necklace. It's an original radio play by David Driscoll. And our heroine tonight is that beautiful star of stage and screen, Miss Miriam Hopkins, who play the role of Emily. Now, be calm, be calm. There's nobody standing behind you. At least nobody you can see. <laughs> At the edge of a lake in a small New England town, two men are busy digging an excavation. Must have been like a cave around here once, huh? Mm. Yeah, old Miss Bristow used to own this property before she sold it to this here city man who's building. There used to be a fine apple orchard right up there. It was all fine trees once. Well, let's dig. That's what we're getting paid for. Hey, hey. What's the matter with you, Polly? Look down there what I just hit with my shovel. Huh? Oh, bone. Oh, Cow, I expect. Cow? That ain't no cow bone, Jerry. Hey, Paulie. Huh? Look. Look at this with the bone. Yeah, I, I, I see it. And you call that a cow bone now? No, I don't. This here must have been a graveyard once. This here was never no graveyard. The river used to come right up to here almost before the big flood. Before they built the dam. Hey, hey what are you doing? Get your coat and hat. You bringing that with you? Of course I am. Hat and... This. Yeah, but there, there must be a skull here, too. Of course there must be. But we don't have to look for that, Polly. That ain't our job. Come on. Jerry and me was digging away there, Mr. Warren, down towards the river. And all of a sudden, Jerry kind of yelled. And when I asked him what's the matter, he... Shows me this leg bone. So I looks and there's the skeleton right at his feet. I see. So I figure you being the county attorney here, you're the man who ought to know first. Uh, yes. Uh, now, this place by the river that you're talking about, it's the land that city man bought to build a home on? Yeah, that's right. He, he bought it from old Miss Emily Bristow. And, and then we found this, too, around the... Well, I... I guess you'd call it the neck. That is, where the neck would be. <gasps> it's a 
Anything wrong, Mr. Warren? Where did you say you found this bone and this necklace? Well, Jerry and me is making a trench for a water pipe, and we're digging where the old riverbank used to be. Right near the river edge. I leave the necklace with me. <laughs> if I need any more help, I'll get in touch with you. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Forty years. Forty years. Emily. Emily Bristol. <laughs> What do you want with me after 40 years, Andrew? Look, Emily. Well, these are old woman's eyes. Look closer. <gasps> Take that away. Take it away. The bark oak necklace, Emily. Do you remember? Presented to Miss Emily Bristow on her 24th birthday by... by Andrew Warren. Where did you get it, Andrew? was found at the river edge on the property you've just sold. Daisy. Daisy. It's come back to us, Emily. After all these years, it's come back to us. The bark oak necklace. The necklace that meant the death of your sister, Daisy. Oh, Andrew... Oh, Andrew, darling. Daisy, there aren't two people anywhere as happy as we are. Oh, of course not. Um, may I tell Emily? Why, yes. Yes, I suppose so. Oh, After oh. all, she's your sister. She should know. Good night, darling. Look at that moon. Smiling at you. Oh. I'm going to close my eyes, and I won't open them until you're down the road out of sight. Good night, sweetheart. Oh. Good night. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, moon. Good... Oh, my... young ladies shouldn't stand staring at the moon that way. Oh, Emily. You frightened me so. I... Did I? Mm. You had a nice drive with Andrew in the moonlight, I hope. Mm hmm. Emily. Andrew, uh... Andrew. Yes. Andrew and I. We're. Oh, darling. How will I ever stop my heart from beating so? I can't let me say it for you. You're engaged. And there you are. It was easy, wasn't it? For you? You've no idea how easy it was for me. Emily. Right here. Emily. I wanted to see you so badly. She's already told me, Andrew. Emily, I want you to understand about this. I know how this must hurt you. You've got to break it off. You've got to. You can't marry her. Andrew, listen to me. Please. Please marry me. I beg you. Emily, we must be sensible. I beg you. If you love me, Emily, you must let me do what I feel is right. I can't let you marry Daisy. You're mine. I must have you. If not me, Andrew, no one. No one else at all. It's too late now. Forgive me. I'll never forgive you. And I'll never let you go. Emily. Never. Never, never. Emily. Emily, are you asleep? Go to bed, Daisy. Oh, Emily, don't be cross. I can't sleep. I... You can't sleep? Huh? No, I'm so excited. Why, Emily, you're still dressed, too. Oh, so I am. What's the matter, dear? Don't you feel well? Well, I feel very well. Thank you, Daisy. Emily, what's the matter? Why do you use that tone with me? Oh, darling, you're not feeling well, are you? I can tell by the look on your face. Oh, come on. Come on out into the night. The moon is full, and, and, and let's walk up to the apple orchard. After all, Emily, even though we're going to be separated, it won't be forever. Oh, 
Aren't you afraid to be out here at night? Afraid? Afraid of what? We are at the end of the apple orchard. There's the little patch that goes down the river. I think you'd better go back now. I go back? Well, what'll you do? I'm going to stay here. I wouldn't dream of going back to the house alone. I thought you weren't afraid. All alone? Of course I'd be afraid all alone. Daisy, I don't want you to marry Andrew. Emily? You know what you've just said? Certainly. Why, I... Oh, Emily, I'm surprised at you. Well, you're jealous. Mm, That's right. I want you to write to Andrew and tell him that you've thought it over and that you've decided you don't love him and you're not going to marry him. How dare you speak to me that way? Now, get out of my way. I'll never talk to you again as long as I live. Have you thought that you mayn't have very long to live? Emily! Emily, I'll scream. No, you won't scream. You won't scream at all. And do you know why? Down in that little pigeon heart of yours, you're frightened. Frightened? Let go of my arms. You're hurting me. You're out of your mind, Emily. I'll let you go when you promise to write that letter. I promise. I I promise, Emily. Now let go of me. As soon as we get back. Yes, yes, yes. And don't you dare breathe a word of this to anyone ever as long as you live. I promise. I promise. Now, I think we understand who loves and who. Yes. I'll let you go. You don't know how close you came... Come back here, Daisy. You'd run away, would you? Uh, Emily! Emily, I wasn't running away. Please let me go. Oh. What are you doing with that necklace? Emily, no! No! I Please. knew I couldn't trust you. Uh, I knew uh, I never should have told help. you. Help! Stop, no, Emily! You're joking me. I, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Oh, Emily. Oh. 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> well, girls, we'll be girls, I suppose. That's kind of pity about a little Emily, though. Just think what a wonderful hangman she'd have made if she'd been born a girl. Kind of cute, huh? Being taken for a little swing by a girl. <laughs> what a terrible woman she is, Mr. Raymond. Oh, now, listen, I like Emily. She's so inventive. Most women will do anything for a necklace, but only Emily knows what to do with a necklace. <laughs> now, please. You know very well that the only thing you can do with a necklace is wear it. Oh, yeah. Well, the only thing you can do with Lipton tea is drink it. Well, what's wrong with that? And, Mr. Raymond, maybe you don't realize how often folks do drink Lipton tea. Why, it's the perfect beverage for so many occasions. And that's why it makes sense to have a good supply on hand to buy the larger, more economical size packages. And it is more economical that way, too. Oh, yes. It's wise to have a large size package of Lipton tea on your shelf because that well-known brisk flavor, that bracing, full-bodied taste, Makes Lipton's always welcome. Hmm, that uh, gives me an idea. Maybe we should have had Emily and little Daisy talk out their quarrel over a cup of Lipton tea. (laughs) Oh, man, that'd be chummy. But it's too late now. Daisy is stretched out on the ground with a bog oak necklace twisted tight around her neck. She's not sleeping now. She's just dead to the world. (laughs) So... Let's get back to our star, Miss Miriam Hopkins, who plays the role of Emily. Daisy, get up. Get up this minute and stop teasing me. You're not hurt that bad, and you know you're not. Please get up, Daisy. You're frightening me. Daisy. Daisy, you're... You're acting... Just as though you were, you were dead. I am dead, Emily. You murdered me. You strangled me with a bog oak necklace. You see, you see, you wouldn't be talking to me if you were dead. You've killed your own sister, Emily. Because you were jealous. That voice, that David's voice. But your lips are not moving. How can you be speaking to me, Daisy, when your lips are not moving? They'll find me here in the orchard with 
your necklace around my neck. And they'll know you did it. And they'll punish you. You'll never be allowed to marry Andrew. I will marry him. I will. Oh, what am I saying? Who am I talking to? Somebody's speaking to me with Daisy's voice. And all your life I'll be speaking to you. Just like this. Because you murdered me with the Bob Oak necklace. I must do something. I must get some help. I'm somewhere I must get some help. She can't be dead. I, I just pulled the necklace a little bit, not tightly at all. You pulled it very <laughs> tightly, Emily. Look at my neck and you'll see. You'll see how tightly you twisted the necklace. Stop it. Stop talking to me. I'll never leave you, Emily. Never as long as you live. You are dead, aren't you? I murdered you. Something dreadful will happen to me. I've got to do something. What, what can I do? The river. I'm near the river. Stone, yes. With twine... Strong twine wound around the stones and I tied the stones to her, and I could throw her into the water from the crag on the hill, and the stones would make her sink to the bottom, and then she'd never come back. Never. And who would know? You know, Emily. Maybe. Maybe when I get back to her, she'll be moving and I'll talk to her. No, she is dead. She is... Oh, I... I'm running in the wrong direction. It was over there that I... I killed her. It couldn't have been because... Because she's not there. She... It was right here. And Daisy's gone. She got up and walked away somewhere. She's alive. Emily. Oh. I found her, Emily. Strangle her death. I know nothing about it. What are you doing then with that twine in your hand? You wanted to tie stones to her, didn't you? Throw her in the river. I... I killed her because I was jealous. You're as guilty as I am. Because you should have married me. Yes, I am as guilty as you are. What will become of me now? All my hopes, my ambitions. If we can get rid of the body, then we can get married after all. It'll only take a little while for people to forget, and then we can go away somewhere. But do you know I never want to look at you again as long as I live. Andrew. I hate you. I came back oh, here to speak to you again. I wanted to tell you I'd done a wrong thing. That I ought to marry you. I wanted to arrange with you about Daisy. How we could tell her without hurting her too much. I was heading toward your window when I saw her. Strangled with a bog oak necklace. What have you done with it? Exactly what you plan to do. Because no woman would have the strength to do it. I had rope in my rowboat. I tied stones to the body. Rode a bit into the river with it. Dropped it overboard. The plan works, you're safe. If it doesn't, he'll die. And I'll go to prison. I'm going now. The moon is down already. Soon it will be dawn. The necklace. What did you do with the necklace? I left it where it was. Around her neck. Sound, the sound the necklace makes. I have heard it every night for 40 years. 40 years. Now she's come back to us. To me. Tell me, Andrew, 
Where was it found? It's been there, at the bottom of the river all this time. Oh. During the flood last year, the skeleton must have been swept into that old sewer. The twine probably rotted away a long time ago. That's the only explanation I can give. Watching! Down there at the bottom of the river, watching! I'm going now, Emily. It's probably the last time we'll ever see each other. I'll leave the necklace with you. It was to you I gave it 40 years ago. Emily! What's that? What? The, the voice. The, the voice. I'm going. Don't leave me, Andrew. Don't leave me. He'll leave us, Emily. He'll leave the two sisters alone. Together. Andrew! We're alone now, Emily. Just as we used to be. You and I and the necklace. No. Come, Emily. Let's take a walk as we used to in the old apple orchard. No. No. Come, come. It's getting dark. Dark. No, I, I've not been near that orchard in 40 years. Come, Emily. With me. But I'm old. No, you're young. As young as I am. Come with me. We'll tell each other little secrets, won't we, Emily? Just as we used to. Uh, yes. The yes. crickets will be chirping and the moon coming up. All as it used to be. Yes. And you'll be wearing your necklace. The bark oak necklace that Andrew gave you when he thought he loved you instead of me. You'll wear it the way you used to when you'd steal up there to the orchard to meet him. Remember? When he used to roll to the bottom of the hill and wait for you. And you could stand in the orchard until you heard him whistle. Yes. Yes. Emily. Yes. You've forgotten something. Forgotten. The necklace. The bog oak necklace. Oh. Wear it, Emily. Dear Emily. Wear it. Run as fast as I... Come, Ebony, come. He's waiting. Yes. Listen. Oh. Andrew's whistling for you. Answer it, dear. Go on. I, I can't whistle. That's strange. You must run faster, Emily, faster. Oh, you must run so oh. much faster. Through the apple trees, oh. bending beneath the branches. Oh. He may not wait. <laughs> Oh, a lot of breath. These apple trees, the branches, they're in my way. I, I can't bend them over. Faster, no. faster. He may run off with Daisy. No. no. I'm coming, Andrew. I'm coming. Wait for me, Andrew. Wait for me. Oh. Oh. oh, that necklace. Emily, uh. you caught it in a branch. Turn around, Emily. Turn around. Turn around. And loosen it. Turn quickly, Emily. That's the way my voice sounded one night long ago. When I wore the bark oak necklace. When I, too, was strangled by the bark oak necklace. Come, come. It's so cool here in the river.
Daisy, Daisy, tell me your answer true. Who gets choked first, me a lovely you? If you'll be the first to strangle, I'd appreciate your angle. And when I learn that it's now my turn, I'll gargle as nice as you. <laughs> what awful words to sing to such a nice song. Oh, but listen, I sing so well, and I can recite, too. Shall I recite you something suitable? Say a uh, mother goose rhyme, huh? Mr. Raymond, you don't know any mother goose. Is that so? Well, I know one that you love. Listen. Polly, put the kettle on. Polly, put the kettle on. Polly, put the kettle on and we'll all have tea. Well, that's fine. Only I hope Polly makes sure that it's Lipton tea. Naturally. But I suppose there's little doubt that she'll use Lipton. Because after all, more people drink Lipton tea than any other brand. The reason for that is Lipton's famous brisk flavor. Yes, Lipton tea is never flat or insipid. It always tastes full-bodied and, and vigorous and... Well, I guess it's all summed up by that word brisk. Yes, folks, brisk is the word that the tea experts use when they talk about Lipton tea. So try it real soon, won't you? They say... Of course, I'd just tell you what the gossip is in the morgues I visit. They say... That Daisy and Emily can be seen almost any moonlit night. Skull, gently touching skull, floating through the old apple orchard as of yore. If you'd like them in your home, you could use their ration coupon. Outside of rattling a bit when the wind blows, they're very nice and companionable. Especially on dark nights. And in the summer... You can always use them for scarecrows in your victory garden. <laughs> by the way, this month's inner sanctum mystery novel is The Outsider by A.E. Martin. For now, it's really time to close that there squeaking door until next week at the same time when Lipton tea and Lipton soup will once again bring you another inner sanctum mystery produced under the direction of Hyman Brown. So until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, I wonder what our grandmothers would have said if they had heard about Lipton's noodle soup. I'll bet they wouldn't have believed it possible that a delicious chicken noodle soup could come ready to make in an envelope. But if they'd tasted Lipton, they would have agreed that it has an old-fashioned, homemade flavor, that it tastes just like the kind of chicken soup they used to make themselves. And Lipton is economical, too. It costs less and makes more than canned soups. So, folks, be sure to try Lipton's noodle soup. And be sure to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the sounds in the universe... Perhaps nothing stirs the imagination more deeply than the sounds of the sea. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the sounds in the universe, perhaps nothing stirs the imagination more deeply than the sounds of the sea. People who have never crossed an ocean can still be transported in a walk along the beach, skirting the lapping tides, or standing high on the rocks with the waves crashing below. There's an eerie quality about the sea, and it conjures strange visions in any mind that is ready to receive them. Our story concerns the spell cast by the sea. 
Our mystery drama, What Happened to Mrs. Forbush, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Patricia Wheel and Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Excuse me, madam. Oh, I'm in an awful hurry. I, I just wonder if you could answer a simple question so for me. So do I. The question is this. What? what happens this time of year? Oh, that's easy. The kids get home from camp. Goodbye. Nope. What do you mean, nope? Nope. I mean, I should know when my kids get home from camp. Well, the answer I had in mind was a tad more general in scope. Well, see. I gave my answer. Let's hear yours. You know, I'm glad you asked. Are you? You see, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving particularly great deals on all their 74 Buicks. For a family woman such as yourself, I think a neat little Apollo would be just the ticket. It's small, economical, but surprisingly roomy. And it's a Buick, so it's really quite elegant. You don't say. Uh -huh. Now, isn't that good news? Yes. I mean, that you can get such a nifty deal on such a nifty small car. To be car. sure it is, yes. To be sure. By the way, uh, where do your kids go to camp? Guam. It's a G small island in the South Pacific. Guam. Guam. <laughs> Suburban Savings in northern New Jersey would like to set you straight on savings. Straight off, Suburban offers you the highest interest allowed by law. A big 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban 7.50% savings certificates. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum $2,500. Federal regulations allow premature withdrawals on savings certificates, provided prescribed federal penalties are adhered to. Of course, Suburban also has a whole selection of other savings plans that keep your savings savings headed in the right direction, straight up. Why not head straight over to your nearest suburban savings office, conveniently located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne, and let them set you straight on savings. The story takes place at Captain's Cove on the shores of New England. Bert and Marjorie Desmond are inspecting a picturesque old house on a bluff overlooking the sea. They're city people, and in the past they have spent their vacations at mountain resorts or in dry desert places considered beneficial for the health of their son. But this year it's different, and they're getting more intrigued by the minute as Mr. Smith, the rental agent, shows them around. Bert, the view and the window seat. I haven't seen one like this since my grandmother's house when I was a child. <laughs> I'm more interested in all these carved pieces over here. What do you call this stuff? Uh, scrimshaw. Oh, yes. The thing sailors made when they had time on their hands. Mm, old Captain had quite a collection. Most of it's over to the museum. What can you tell me about this ship model? A schooner, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that'd be Captain Forbush's ship. There's the Mona. Sank. With all hands aboard. Oh, uh, Mr. Smith, is that an island I see way out there? Nope. That's Dead Man's Rock. Oh, what a gruesome name. Was it the scene of a shipwreck? Well, I understand some fella got murdered on that rock. I don't rightly know the circumstances. Uh, but there is an island further on out, known as Hiram's Hideaway. It's said to be the place old Captain Forbush took himself off to when he wanted to get away from his wife. Good fishing. I'll have to look into that. Oh, Bert, are you sure we really want to take this house? Let's see the rest of it. There's a fine old staircase. <laughs> Beautiful railing. I don't think it's been dusted in years. This house has been closed up most of the time. That's why it's such a bargain. Is there anything wrong with it? Nope. Tight as a drum. And a real historic monument. Now, you take this roof. Oh, it's wonderful. I've never slept in a four-poster bed. Oh, boy. It's a big one, too. And uh, this door leads to a veranda. Oh, my. This porch goes all the way around the house. It always does in a captain's place of residence. A trademark, you might say. Why, well, sure. This is what you call a widow's walk. Yeah. Uh, no doubt Miss Forbush did her share of pacing when the captain was away. Well, no pacing for me, thank you. My husband has a desk job. What do you think, Bert? About the house? Y yes. In a strange way, I've fallen in love with it. But I'm wondering... Wonder no more. 
We're going right into that room I already call my study and sign a lease for the summer. Bert. Glad you've come to life. You haven't said a word since we left the cove. I thought you were asleep. No. I've been thinking. And worrying. Worrying? About Robbie. Robbie? I can hardly wait to get his reaction when he sees where he's going to spend the summer. Bert, maybe we've made a mistake. Oh, you're kidding. No. That long, deserted beach and those rocks, it's a dangerous place for a boy. You'll have a ball. But it's not like any place we've ever stayed before. Have you forgotten how much of Robbie's life he's had to spend in bed? I haven't forgotten. But that's all over. The doctor said so. He said it was time Robbie started doing the things boys his age like to do. Not dangerous things. Bert, we're going to spend three months by the ocean. You bet we are. And the sea air will be good for all of us. Only, Bert, Robbie's never learned to swim. Well, Robbie, what do you think of it? Oh, man, this house is twice as good as you thought it was. I didn't remember it was so musty. The place needs airing. I'm going to open some windows. Dad, who's the old guy in the picture? Why, uh, that must be Hiram Forbush, the sea captain who built this house. He sure has a lot of red whiskers. (laughs) He sure does. (laughs) You know, they knew how to paint pictures back in those days. Watch this, Rob. Walk over here and see how his eyes follow you. Sort of as though he was looking at everything you did. It's spooky. You think he's a ghost? Oh, come on, son. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? No. Well, I'll I'll let you in on a secret. I think your mother does. Mom believes in ghosts. Sometimes. (laughs) Oh, Pop. (laughs) What's all this about ghosts? I'm teaching Rob to be the man of the house so he can look after you when I'm gone. Hey, I want to go to the beach. Well, you can if your father goes with you. Not right now. I have some things to do. I'd go, only it's time to think about getting dinner ready. I can go alone. Sure you can. Oh, no, Bert, not the first time. First time for everything. Oh. And speaking of first times, how about that? It's so strange to hear a telephone in a house like this. Glad there have been some improvements since the captain's day. Guess I better find out who it is. Pop said I could go to the beach. Now, Robbie, I want you to be very, very careful. Follow that little path and watch your step climbing down the bluff. Mom, I'm not a baby. And don't stay away too long. Do you have your jacket? Oh, Mom. I'll be watching you from this window. Damn, damn, damn. Why, what's the matter? That phone call from the office. Wouldn't you know they're having a crisis and they want me back? Oh, no, Bert. We just got here. You're on your vacation. Won't be gone long. Just for the day to help get things straightened out. Oh, but it's a four-hour trip. I know. I'll have to start very early tomorrow morning. And I guess I better spend tomorrow night in the city. But you promised that first thing tomorrow you'd see about swimming lessons for Robbie. It was a part of our bargain. I know, honey, but it's just a matter of putting it off for a day. Oh, you said I thought I'd asked you not to climb on those rocks unless someone... Each club and make arrangements for swimming lessons. And we'll meet some people so that you'll know the neighbors and Robbie will have someone to play with. Robbie, dear, what were you doing on those big rocks today? Just throwing stones in the water. Mom, I can make them skip real good. I thought I'd asked you not to climb on those rocks unless someone was with you. I only climbed a little way. Well, no more climbing, young man, until your father gets back. But he's been gone for three whole days. Well, he's coming tomorrow. And we're going to let him know how well we've been getting along. Go to sleep now. I'm going out on the porch to watch the moon come up. Mommy, you promised to open the window very wide so I can hear the sound of the water? Yes, dear. (sighs) The weather's changing. I can scarcely see the beam of the lighthouse. It's getting all misty. And don't be frightened if you hear the foghorn. Uh, I like that sound. Night. Good night, dear. Good evening. Oh. Is someone there? I always stroll the veranda on a foggy evening. Oh, there is someone. Who are you? I am Lavinia Fourbush, and I presume you are the lady who is staying in my house? Why, I guess it was your house. Only I'm staying here now. My name is Marjorie Desmond. Didn't they tell you, Mrs. Desmond, that I never left this house? 
It belongs to me. Belongs to you, Mrs. Forbush. Now it belongs to a man who lives in Boston. Ah, he thinks he owns it. No one will ever take my place in this house. Come, let's walk this way. Ah, the fog is creeping over Dead Man's Rock. Just the way it was that night. Uh, No, I'm getting rather cold. I think I'll go inside. Poor soul, you need a fine shawl like mine to keep you warm. (laughs) It looks like a lovely old paisley. Won't you come inside where it's warm? We we could have a cup of tea. No, indeed, Mrs. Desmond. I only set foot in my house when it becomes necessary to get something I want. I'll stay right here where I always stay, keeping my vigil. But the fog is closing in. Really, Mrs. Forbush, I must go in. Oh, how thoughtless of me. The damp night air must have chilled you to the bone. Here, let me put my shawl around your shoulders. Uh, What about you? Oh, I no longer feel the cold as I once did. My, it is grand to have a woman to talk to once more. Mrs. Desmond, my captain was a bold and adventurous man. He brought me precious gems from India, from Persia, and from China. Oh, dear Mrs. Desmond, you must not make my mistake. You must take your most cherished possessions and leave my house. Oh, but I have no jewels, Mrs. Forbush. Oh, dear lady, you have the greatest jewel of all, a son. How old is your boy, Mrs. Desmond? (laughs) Robbie's nine and a half. Just the age of my Jason. A most dangerous age. I I know. I I worry about him. And well, you might. What happened to me is history. And history has a way of repeating. Really, I I I don't think I want to... You will listen to me. Please. My Jason... Oh, he was a strapping lad who helped me with the chores around the house. And when Hiram's ship was in, the boy spent hours talking to the sailors, learning how to tie knots and carve those intricate things from bone and bits of wood. (laughs) My Robbie would like that. And then one day, when Jason was nine years old, his father came to me and said... I'm taking the boy on a journey. It is time he began to learn the ways of men. Why, Bert said something like... Too soon, I said, too soon. But my Hiram was a very determined man. And when he made up his mind, there was no stopping him. It's only a short journey, he told me. We are taking the Desdemona to the Caribbees. And Jason will go with me. I watched through the spyglass until the ship was far enough at sea to hoist the big sail which caught the wind. You do know what happened, don't you, Mrs. Desmond? Don't tell me anymore. I must, if you would save your boy. Late that evening, the fog closed in the way it has now. And then... Then began the long days and the lonely nights. Where is your son, Mrs. Desmond? Why, he's in bed. And I hope fast asleep. You hear that? Yes. Foghorn is a lonely sound. It's a lonely sound for women like you and me when we've lost... Stop trying to fight this There's still plenty of time. For what? To take your son away from here. Take him away and guard him with your life. A foghorn is a lonely sound. And a ghost-ridden house by the sea is an unsettling place for a woman who is worried about her son. Perhaps in the light of day, when her husband returns, Marjorie will be able to shake her fears. On the other hand, suppose Mrs. Forbush is really trying to tell her something. We'll find out more shortly when I return with Act Two. There's nothing wrong with drinking Budweiser sip by sip, is there? Well, the brewers of Budweiser think there's a better way. Sipping's fine if you're drinking wine. But Bud is the king of beers. A hearty drink. 
Look, rinse a 10 or 12 ounce glass with cold water. Then open a can or bottle of Bud and pour it right down the middle so it kicks up a good head of foam. Now take a big drink and then swallow big. No sips. That's how it should be done. More taste, more beer drinking enjoyment. Thanks to exclusive Beechwood aging, Budweiser has a smoothness that lets it go down especially easy. Sure, it's an expensive way to brew beer, but brewing beer right does make a difference. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? What's for dinner? Your ShopRite supermarket suggests choice beef first cut chuck steaks just 59 cents a pound this week. Save two on smoked ham, shank portion 69 cents a pound, but portion 79 a pound. For a quick meal, try Swanson's Frozen Hungry Man dinners just 99 cents each. For dessert, ShopRite's produce department is featuring fresh honeydew melons 79 cents each. They're great topped with ice cream. There's a lot more for a little less at ShopRite, so stop in soon. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. If you're afraid of what the future has in store, perhaps you look to the past for guidance. But Marjorie Desmond has had a strange encounter with the past, which only bolsters the fears she already has for her son. Is it possible that a ghostly presence from a former time can prevent or promote an impending disaster? Marjorie's husband has returned from his business trip, and we'll soon find out how he feels about what's going on. Bert, it's so good to have you back. Way longer than I expected. But I've only been gone a few days. Same old thing. You should be used to it by now. Mm, but this time it was different. I mean, this place... Well, now, tell me what you and Robbie have been up to. Bert, I want to show you something. Hey, where did you get that paisley shawl? I like it. So do I. It has such nice, mellow colors. Where did you find it? In the old captain's sea chest? No. It was given to me. Well, that's a nice gift. Who's been around while I was gone? You're not going to believe this. Well, let me guess. It was given to you, only it wasn't really a present. You had to pay some enormous sum for it, and now you're afraid to tell me how much it cost. No, Bert. And I know you won't believe me. I won't believe you if you say Captain Forbush came to the door and said, My dear Mrs. Desmond, please let me in. I've returned from a long and tiresome journey. And it would please me very much if you would cook up some bacon and eggs. Uh, no, Bert. It wasn't Captain Forbush. Well, I'm happy to hear that. It was Mrs. Forbush. What? You're going to laugh. I know you won't understand, and I didn't either. Only, only it happened. For heaven's sake, Marge, What happened? It was a foggy night. You sure? Spooks always come out on foggy nights. Now tell me, where did you really get that shawl? I got it from Mrs. Forbush. Let's not play games. I'm tired. She was there. She Bert. was where? On the widow's Oh, floor. cut it out. I talked to her, and she told me what happened to her husband. Sure, sure. Mr. Smith told us that. The captain was lost at sea. But Jason... Oh, who in heck is Jason? Their son. Oh, Marge, would you please talk sense... Now, where did you get that saw? I told you from Mrs. Forbush last night when we had a long talk. Now, I've heard everything. Okay, it's a joke. And I do think it's pretty funny. We're living in a haunted house, so let's enjoy it. If you don't want to tell me where you found that thing, okay. I'll play your game. At least until tomorrow. Don't you want to hear what she had to say? I don't want to hear any more of this crazy story. Come to bed. And tomorrow we'll have a great big laugh over this whole thing. And maybe you remember where you really found that shawl. That was the best picnic we ever had. Can we do it again tomorrow? Well, not every day, Rob. Maybe tomorrow we'll go to the beach club. I thought I might do some fishing. Oh, Dad, can I go fishing with you? Maybe we'll all go. How about it, Marge? Uh-uh, count me out. You know how I feel. I know. You like to eat the poor little critters. 
But it's cruel to catch them on those nasty hooks. Well, it is. Ralphie and I may just go off and forget to come Take home. Take your son away from here. Take him away and guard him with your life. Well, honey, what's the matter? You look as if you'd seen a... It's nothing, Bert, nothing. I, I just have to be alone for a minute. Hey, Dad, where are all these things over here on the shelf? That's called scrimshaw, Rob. Scrim? Mm, these are things that were made by sailors a long time ago. When they were on those sailing ships and the sea was calm, they didn't have much to do. So they carved pieces of bone or wood and painted shells. I bet I could do that. You'd have to learn how to use a knife. Would you teach me, Dad? It's a uh, bedtime, young man, up the stairs. Mm, if I was on a boat, I wouldn't be going up any old stairs. I suppose you'd be climbing the ropes. Or oh, walking in the gang. No, I asked that fisherman today where he slept, and he said down below. <laughs> Unless you want to sleep in the cellar, the direction is up. Get going. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> nice day today, Marge. And I don't know when I've seen Robbie so happy. Oh, he's certainly having a good time. And tomorrow when we go to the beach club, we can make arrangements to have him start taking swimming lessons. I'm not sure they have regular classes. Then we'll get him a private instructor. Marjorie, I am perfectly capable of teaching him myself. I won a medal in college, remember? Well, of course you're a good swimmer, Bert. And I thought... Oh, I suppose if Robbie had been well, you would have taught him long ago. But don't you think he'd learn more quickly now if an outside... Hey, there's nothing wrong with his old man, is there, Marge? <sighs> I have to finish up the dishes. Let's talk about it when I'm through. Robbie? Hmm? Don't be frightened. I want to talk to you. Such a No, I'm the lady who lives here. My name is Mrs. Forbush. Red Whiskers? He is my husband. Maybe you could tell me about that boat on the shelf downstairs and all those other things. That ship was one of the proudest vessels to sail the seven seas. And Captain Forbush himself made that model. You think it would sink if I tried to sail it? Oh, you must never, never try. Oh, my dad won't let me even touch that boat with the sails. But I can play with the other things. You know, the bones and the shelves. I know. And I brought you one that was a favorite of my son. He was just about your age. Now, do you have a candle I can light? There is one over there in the bureau, but I could just turn on this light. No need to waste electricity. I never had it in this house. That doesn't look like a match to me. A tinderbox. Best thing in the world for striking a light. There. Now, Robbie, what do you think of this? Wow. What a big shell. This is for you, Robbie. To keep for Jason while he is away. Where's he gone? I'm hoping you will help me find him. Oh, I'll be glad to help you. Because if he was here, we could climb the rocks together and, and explore that pirate's cave. We'll look for him, Robbie. We'll look for him together. So now, if you will come with me... Oh, oh I, I couldn't go anywhere without asking permission. But this is my house, and I am giving you permission. But I still couldn't go without asking. Quickly, boy. Come on. Put on your clothes. Uh, Mom! Mom! Dad! What is it, Rob? Why, Robbie, what are you doing with a candle burning? You know how dangerous. I didn't light it, Mom. You tell them, Mrs. Fo... Where is she? Where's who? The, that lady, Mrs. Forbush. She was standing right there. Oh, good Lord, not in here. Rob, there's no one else in this room. You've been having a dream. No, Dad. Honest, she was here. Look what she gave me. Not you, too. Say, that's a very interesting shell. So where did you find it? Dad, I didn't find it. Mrs. Forbush said it belonged to her son, and I could borrow it until he comes back. That's a likely story. You can make up a better one than that. But that's exactly what she said. I'm going to help her find him. And when he's here, we can play together down on the beach. No, Robbie, dear, that's not possible. You're both being impossible. But the trouble is, we have to find Jason. Oh, stop right? it, Robbie. I won't hear any more about this, Jason. Rob, 
You've had a dream. It seems very real. But now it's over. And tomorrow you'll have forgotten all about it. But, Bert, what about the candle and the shell? Well, there must be some reasonable explanation. But let's not think about it now. I'm blowing the candle out. And Robbie's going to sleep. Good night, son. You've been playing a joke on me, and I'll admit it's been a good one. You were very clever to get Robbie to go along with you. And I must say, he played his part well. But I can think of better games for a boy his age. This was no game, Bert. You didn't coach him to put on that act? Of course I didn't. Well, if it was a nightmare and he dreamed all those things about Mrs. Forbush and her mythical son, it was only because you filled his imagination full of stories. I have never mentioned either Mrs. Forbush or Jason to Robbie. Then there's a book about them somewhere around the house. Well, if there is, I haven't seen it. You must have had one of those imaginary conversations out loud, the way you do sometimes. And Robbie overheard you when you thought he was asleep. Oh, Bert, I don't do that anymore. And I don't say how he could possibly have been listening the night I talked to Mrs. Forbush. Marge, there is no Mrs. Forbush. How would you know? You weren't here. <sighs> Honey, we're taking this whole thing too seriously. Mrs. Forbush lived nearly 200 years ago. So she can't be hanging around here now. I suppose you're right. That's my girl. Give us a smile. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying. Now repeat after me. No more conversations with Mrs. Forbush. No more conversations with Lavinia Forbush. Le <laughs> Where'd you get that kooky first name? Well, she told yeah, me. Okay, okay. No more conversations with Lavinia Forbush. And what will we tell Robbie? Hey, Ma, look what Dad bought me. He's teaching me how to catch fish. Oh, well, it looks as though you bought out the store. But did you get my groceries? Yep, groceries are all right here. But hold off on the steak. We just may come back with something very special for the frying pan. Look, Mom, my very own rod. <laughs> Did you ever see one of these? This is a reel. Yes, dear, it looks like a very nice reel. Where will you use it, down at the wharf? Nope. We're going to get Rob off to a really good start. I've rented a boat. What kind of boat? Oh, just a putt-putt. You know, one of those flat bottom jobs with an outboard motor. But you, you aren't going out to sea. Sure. Well, look at it, Marge. Smooth as glass. But only, what do you know about the, well, the tides and the currents? Marge. We aren't planning a trip to China. Where are you going? To that island. It's so clear today, you can see it from here. Don't you worry about a thing. See? I bought him a life jacket. And he's going to wear it every minute of the time. We promise, don't we, Rob? Sure, Pop. Promise me you won't go far? I told you, we're only going out to that island. When Mr. Smith said the fishing is good. What did he say the island's called? Hiram's Hideaway. Oh, yeah. Sorry I asked. Have a good time. If you stand on the porch with the binoculars, you can watch us most of the way. Well, Mrs. Desmond, I'm sorry you did not hear my warning. Oh, no, please, please don't come back. Well, I've not been away. But I don't want to talk to you. It was bad enough that you upset me, but you had no right to bother my son. It was you who interfered, Mrs. Desmond. You and your husband... You spoiled it all. I was trying to save your son before this happened. Nothing has happened, Mrs. Forbush, and I won't let you alarm me anymore. But you are alarmed, Mrs. Desmond, and well, you might be. Why did you let him go? See, they are already out of sight. And if you don't act quickly, you'll never see either your husband or your son again. This time it seems more likely that the predictions of the ghostly Mrs. Forbush may come true. Marjorie is a worrier, but after all, Bert is not a seasoned sailor, and Robbie can't swim. No, they're not setting off for China, but they are tempting fate. And it's too late to turn back now. It's a calm and beautiful day at Captain's Cove, and it looks as though the fears of Marjorie Desmond were totally unfounded. 
father and son have explored the island. A whole new world has opened up for a boy who has been housebound much of his life. And Bert is savoring the joys of feeling a new closeness to his son. It is late afternoon, and they are heading back reluctantly to the mainland. Hey, Dad. Can we do this every day? I'm going to catch a bigger one next time. For a first try, you did very well. Maybe we can go deep sea fishing someday. Maybe tomorrow. Could we? Hey, we're doing all right with these smaller fellows. Round is good eating. You'll see. I bet Mom will be surprised. We caught one, two, three, four. Hey, Dad. Remember what you promised about that rock? Oh, it's late, Rob. I think we better not. But you promised, Dad. Honest, it'll only take a minute. Well, I'm not sure I can get right up to the rock. The water's starting to get a bit choppy. Where was it you saw that piece of driftwood you wanted? Uh, up there. See? Looks just like a couple of deer's horns. Otherwise known as antlers. Only I'm going to turn it into whatever whatever that other word is. Scrim, you know. Hey, stop the boat, Dad. It's right up there. I can't just stop the boat, Rob. There's no place to anchor. I could almost reach it if I stood on the sea. Get down, young man. Stop. Oh. Now, what did I tell you? There's a tricky tide around here. He'll come back some other time. Oh, but, Dad, that piece of wood will be gone. Sometimes the waves go all over those rocks. We'll never find a piece like that one. Oh, I'll, I'll try again. It's calmer over on this side. Slow down some more, Dad. But there's no way to come in. By that flat place on the rock. You slow way down it, and then I'll jump off and get it. Is your life jacket on tight? Uh, sure, Dad. Okay, then. Be very, very careful. I'll idle the motor while you jump off. Grab your piece of driftwood and jump right back. Here I go. Uh-oh. The motor's died. And the boat's drifting. You stay right there, Rob, while I get it started. Yes. Yes. I want to speak to someone at the boathouse down by the pier. Uh, The place where you rent boats to go fishing? Hello? Hello, this is Mrs. Desmond. My husband and son, are they there? Uh, no. No, they rented a boat from you this morning to go to the island. Well, I expected them back long before this, and I was afraid something might have happened. Well, I, I know it isn't late, but it is beginning to look stormy, and I can't see the island anymore. Uh, could you send someone out to look for them? The Coast Guard patrol? How do I reach them? Uh, no, 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 thank you. I'll go to their station down on the beach. No use going to the Coast Guard station, Mrs. Desmond. They've taken the cutter and gone in the other direction. But, but Bert and Rob, I'm afraid they're in trouble. They are in trouble, Mrs. Desmond. Out by Dead Man's Rock. Then we must send someone after them. No one to send, unless we do it ourselves. Uh, how can we? I've done it before. And if the two of us pull together... What are you talking about? Oh, boat over there. Can you handle an oar? Well, once I knew how to row, I'm not sure oh, that I... Hurry, Mrs. Desmond. Before the storm sets in, I'm aboard. Oh. oh. Well, an old, old boat why it's half full of water. No time to be choosy. You fit this oar in the lock while I shove off with the other one. There's a hole in the bottom of this boat, Mrs. Corbush. This is madness. We'll never make it. Pull, Mrs. Desmond. Pull. See, it's getting rough. Aye. A storm is brewing. We, we, we must turn back. Too late, Mrs. Desmond. Too late. We must fulfill our mission. That rock seems... Further and further away. Oh, Mrs. Desmond. Oh, oh, oh. It's no use, Mrs. Forbes. We, we're going to sing. Stay away from that warning bell. The boat is sinking, Mrs. Forbes. It's going straight to the bottom. We'll have to swim for it. Swim for the boy. Save yourself, Mrs. Desmond. Until I can get closer. 
I can't seem to get this darn motor started. Hello! Who, who are you? Hiram Forbush, at your service. Ca- Captain Forbush? Uh, yeah. I am difficulty. You can't seem to get this stupid motor started. Give me wind and sails any time. But they're not going to help me now. My son and I... Is your boy over yonder? Yes. I should never have let him off on the rock. Dead man's rock's a dangerous place to be. But one of my men will get him. I'll be very grateful for anything you can do. We have to get home. Couldn't you put us ashore in a, a, a rowboat? Can't spare the men to take down a longboat. And my only rowboat was most rotted away. So I left it back on the beach. Oh, there must be some way. I'll pay you very well. All the money I want is out where we're going. And we can't stay around here any longer. So climb aboard and... No, no. I'll take my boy back in this boat and someone else will come along. Or they'll send the Coast Guard to look for us. You won't last long in that thing. There's a storm coming up. Uh, then, then please, send up some kind of a signal, a, a flare, a, a rocket. Turn or... off a cannon and rouse the whole town. No need for that. We're not in any trouble. But we are. My son and I. You know how it is. I believe you have a son. I always wanted a son. Fine boy, this one. Just the right age for a first trip before the mast. Well, I'm giving you your last chance. Captain Forbush, let's be sensible. I have obligations to meet. Sounds to me as though you have a guilty conscience. Lively with the sheets, man. She's coming about. Up with the sails and dead ahead. Side, Rob, and and jump! Daddy, I'm scared. Jump, Rob! Jump! That's it, Rob. Hey, dog paddle. The jacket will hold you up. Here, here, here son. Grab my fishing pole. I, I, I got it. Good boy. Hang on. That's it. Now get hold of the side of the boat. Yeah. Ah, uh, Dad, I lost my stick. Oh, forget it. Easy now. I've got you. Are you all right? I'm okay, Dad. Boy, boy. Can you see what I was doing? I was swimming. Well, not quite. Here, Rob. Use some of these rags to dry off. I'm going to try this, this motor one more time. Be all right. Hey, Dad. Think sometime we could get a sailboat? <laughs> I'd rather not think about this just now, Robbie. We've had a close call. Then yeah, maybe we could sail. Robbie, no more. Well, I. Dad. Dad, I hear someone calling. Well, that's not better. Our imagination. Hello. Hello. Over there, Dad. By that thing standing up in the water. Hello. Good Lord. There's someone clinging to the buoy. Marge, are you warm enough? Mm. Never felt better. And now, Marge, if you feel up to it, will you please tell us what in the name of heaven you were trying to do? Uh, we... That is, I started out in a rowboat. That rickety old rowboat that was down on the beach? Oh, yes. Yes. Did you know it was there? I hadn't seen it before. That boat must have been 100 years old. Why did you... I can't explain what was going on in my mind. Or at least you wouldn't understand. You see, I had this awful premonition that something terrible was going to happen to both of you and that I must row out as far as that rock to save you. Well, the boat sank and mercifully there was that buoy and then you came along. Please don't ask me any more questions because now that you're both safe, all those crazy notions I had are gone forever. But something did happen, didn't it, Bert? Something happened all right. We were starting back when the motor conked out. And uh, you, you won't believe this, Marge, but suddenly everything was deathly still. And out of nowhere came this big old ship, like the one in the model over there. That's right, isn't it, Rob? Oh, Dad. And over the rail, 
leaned that face with the cold blue eyes and the bristling red beard. None other than Captain Hiram Forbush. Oh, you're being mean, Bert, but I guess I deserve this. Go on. You don't believe me, do you, Marge? <laughs> but I tell you, there he was, big as life. I begged him to take us back to shore, but he said he was heading for the Caribbees. He had Robbie up on the deck while I was trying to start the motor. And then... And then that sailing ship started to take off. And I looked up, and that's when I yelled to Bobby to jump. Hey, Dad, that's the best story I ever heard. Now can I tell Mom what really happened? What really happened? You see, Mom, it was like this. I saw this piece of wood like, like antlers on that big rock. And I wanted to make something out of it. You know, some of that scrim stuff. And I begged Dad to let me get it. So he slowed down the boat and I jumped off. Oh, that was dangerous, Rob. Well, it would have been all right, except the motor conked out and the boat was drifting away. So I had to jump in the water or I'd still be on that rock. And, oh, Mom, I was scared. But, but I almost swam. <laughs> A swimming lesson for you tomorrow, Robbie. I promise. Mom, hmm? you tell me something, please? Yes, dear. What happened to Mrs. Fourbush? Robbie, why do you ask a question like that? I've been worried about her. She... She drowned, didn't she? Yes, Robbie. She drowned. But that was a long, long time ago. What happened to Mrs. Forbush was not as important as what happened to the Desmonds. A possessive mother learned she must loosen the bonds with which she held her only child or live in an ever-present nightmare of fear. And a self-centered father discovered that if he neglected his wife and son, he ran the risk of losing them. Such lessons are learned and sometimes forgotten in strange and frightening ways. The ghost of Mrs. Forbush has been laid to rest. But the captain, since no trace of his ship was ever found, you may see the Desdemona sometime off in the mists on a foggy day. The sights and sounds of the restless ocean stir something deep within the soul. There are countless tales to be told of the sea. We'll look for some to bring them along with other probings into those things which touch the dark and mysterious recesses of the human mind. Our cast included Patricia Wheel, Gordon Gould, Billy Lou Watt, Mary Jane Higby, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Powder presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host, Raymond, inviting you in through the squeaking door. Well, it's so nice if you've come here tonight and uh, help me sit up with a corpse. Hey, such dull company, so cold and stiff, bored with being dead. All the uh, life seems to have gone out of him. What? You say you've seen him before. Oh, no, he's not that horror man who plays in pictures. But he does look like him. So much so, in fact, you might even call him a dead ringer. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Voice on the Wire, is an original radio drama by Robert Sloan and stars Miss Leslie Woods in the role of Geraldine Reeves. 
It's produced under the direction of Hyman Brown. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. Keep smiling just right. Use it each morning and use it at night. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. Romance. What is romance? Romance is the light on the path of love, but a light so delicate that even a breath may put it out. Even a breath. You'd hate that to happen to you, wouldn't you? Well, don't let a breath of trouble ruin your romance. Don't let unpleasing breath offend the one you love. I tell you what, brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate tooth powder. Because scientific tests have definitely proved that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate tooth powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. And let me add, Colgate tooth powder is the only tooth powder that offers proof of this fact. And then, too, Colgate tooth powder cleans your teeth beautifully. No amount of money can buy you a dentifrice that will clean your teeth more quickly and thoroughly. Remember the name, Colgate tooth powder, with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate tooth powder. No doubt the telephone is an ingenious invention, but um, as far as I know, no one as yet has been able to commit murder over it, although many people have wanted to. <laughs> Still, there are worse things you can get on the phone than the wrong number, especially if you happen to call the voice on the wire. On a long, narrow island just off the shore of one of our larger lakes, Mrs. Geraldine Reeves, widow of the late composer David Reeves, lives alone in a gaunt, gray, shingled house. Only a few hundred yards away are the charred remains of her former home where David was burned to death in a fire just two years ago. It's after dinner now, and as the clock in the hall strikes eight... You've got to get hold of yourself, Geraldine. I can't help it, Doctor. You see, it starts every night about this time. What starts? The music. David's last composition. I hear it being played on a piano. And the notes seem to come from the old house, the house where David died in the fire. Well, perhaps someone is playing that piece on the piano. Someone on the island. No. No, there's only one other house out here, and those people are away. And the dog. The dog keeps howling all night long. What dog? I don't know. There's no dog on the island, but... David and I did have a dog. You remember? He stayed with David the night of the fire. He died with him because David was too ill to get out of bed. There! There it is again! That's amazing. That's a real dog. Somewhere on this island. Oh! Do, do you think so? I... Why, of course. Probably some stray got across the bridge or swam over from the shore. Well, you see, I... Oh, excuse me, Doctor. Certainly. Hello? Hello. Mrs. Geraldine Reeves. Yes, speaking. Who is this? Listen. Good heavens! You have four hours to live, Mrs. Reeves. Four hours to live. What? What did you say? Hello? Hello? Oh, what's the matter, Geraldine? The music. The same music. I heard it again. What? Over the phone. Someone's playing it on the piano. It must be some sort of a prank. No, no, no. A man spoke to me. He said I have four hours to live. Four hours to... Here. Let me have that phone. No, no. It's, it's no use. He, he's rung off. Well, I... we might be able to trace the call. Hello, operator. Operator. Somebody's trying to kill me. Hello, operator. What? Operator. What's wrong, doctor? I, I'm afraid the wires have been cut. We'd better get into my car and drive into town right away. Yes, yes, it isn't safe for me to stay here another minute. Understand it. 
The motor won't turn over. Somebody must have meddled with this car while we were in the house. Well, try my car, Doctor. I think perhaps I'd better. Is it in the garage? Yes, yes, I'll... Great heavens, it's gone. The garage is empty. The car's been stolen. Now, let's not lose our heads, Geraldine. But... We're not completely cut off yet. We can't use a car. We can still walk. But it's almost a mile to the bridge, and the road is so dark down along the water. It won't be too dark with a flashlight. We can go down through the woods to the edge of the water and walk along the shore. Oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? I just remembered. David's brother's driving out here tonight. Harvey? Yes, and his wife, Laura. They said they'd be here by 8.30, and if we wait for them, they can take us back in their car. What do you think, Doctor? That's safer than trying to make it alone. If we wait right here, perhaps we can watch the bridge and see them coming. For heaven's sake, Geraldine. What are you staring at? The bridge, Doctor. The bridge, look. This end of it's been washed out. Oh, Doctor, this is crazy, searching for a telephone wire in back of the house. If we're seen out here, there's no telling what might happen. Please, please, Geraldine. We've got to find out where that wire was cut and splice it together again. It's our only chance of reaching the police. But it's almost nine o'clock. We've wasted an hour already. If I'm not out of here by 12... Stop it, Geraldine. We... Stop it. Oh. I'm sorry. I, 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 I didn't mean to. I... What's that? It's the dog again. That confounded dog is tied up around here somewhere. No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant the light on the road. There's a strange light on the road. The headlight of a car. Coming this way. A car? Yes. Quick. Behind the house and stay out of sight. It's turning into the driveway. How could a car have come out onto the island with that bridge on? Shh. They're getting out. Oh! Why, it's Harvey and, and Laura. Good heavens. Oh! Harvey! Hello! Harvey! Oh, Harvey. For Pete's sake. Oh. Jerry, what are you doing? Playing hide and seek with us back there? Oh, Harvey, I'm so glad you've come. Jerry, what's I, the I, matter? I, I... Oh, everything, everything. But. But first, you've got to tell us how you got here. Why? Well, I... We just drove over the bridge and on up the road the way we always do. But how could you drive over the bridge? It's been washed out. What? Well, I saw it with my own eyes, and Dr. Pricing saw it too, didn't you, Doctor? I certainly did. Oh, you must be mistaken. We drove over the bridge not more than two minutes ago. Are you sure you haven't been on the island longer than that? Well, I'm positive. Why? Well, some very strange things have been happening here tonight. Geraldine's life was threatened. Her car stolen... And mine tampered with. What? What are you talking about? Look, I'll show you. The starter in my car won't even turn the motor over. Here. Why, George. It's working now. Say, what is this, Jerry? You and the doctor have been taking a few pills? Or did you drink too much wine at dinner? Oh, no, no. Everything he said is true. Even the telephone wires have been... I, I, I must be going out of my mind. That is my telephone ringing, isn't it? Yes, of course. Well, aren't you going to answer it? Well, I, I'm almost afraid to. Come with me, Harvey, will you, while I do? Sure. Hello? Hello. Mrs. Reeves? Yes? Listen. Mrs. Reeves, you have three hours to live. I can't stand this waiting, this endless waiting. Why don't the police come? Easy now, Jerry. They'll be here. You only phoned them a few minutes ago. But something can happen before they get here. I have a gun ready, just in case anything should happen. And I won't hesitate to use it. You have a gun, Doctor? Why, uh, yes. Uh, Geraldine gave it to me before you arrived. Oh. What's the matter? You trust me with a gun, don't you? Why, why of course. I... <gasps> Laura, what is it? A face at the window. I just saw a face at the window. Laura, please, you're letting your imagination run away with you. No, I saw it right there. It was the face of a, a dead man. Quick, Harvey, out the back way. Right. No, no, please don't leave us. We'll be right outside the window. Jerry, I'm afraid. Well, there's, there's nothing we can do, Laura. They, they won't be far away. But I... I don't trust Dr. Prizing. 
You never should have given him that gun. Why not? Because... Because I think he's a murderer. Oh! Huh? Yes. Don't you remember how he acted at the trial? When you were accused of starting the fire that killed David? He testified against you time and again. Subtly. To make them think you did it. Because he started that fire himself. What on earth are you saying? I'm telling you the truth. During the trial, he swore that he wasn't on the island the night of the fire. But he was. And I can prove it. How? By this cigarette case of his. Here, look at it. You see how it's charred and melted on the side where his initials were? He must have left it in the fire that night, by mistake. But he couldn't have. The police searched everything the next morning. They would have found it in the ashes. Not if it wasn't there. He came back for it that same night, as soon as he missed it, and dragged it out of the fire. He knew it would incriminate him if it were found in his possession, so he threw it into the lake as he drove home over the bridge. And that's where we found it, in the water. The last time we were out here. Oh, Laura, I hope you're wrong. I... So do I. But if I'm right, we're all in for... Laura! The lights! Somebody's cut off the lights! <laughs> Laura! Laura, where are you? Carrying the door! Carrying through the door, it's the face I saw! Uh, uh, Laura! Laura! <laughs> to be me, Harvey. Whoever came through that door intended to kill me. Jerry, please. How is Laura, Doctor? I'm afraid I can't do anything for her, Harvey. She's passed down. Oh! Laura. Laura, darling. You'd better not touch the body, Harvey. Oh, leave me alone. You've done enough already, Dr. Prising. I beg your pardon? You'll have a lot of explaining to do when the police arrive, Doctor. Well, tell them how you ran away from me out there before the lights went out. Now you were here in this room when they went on again. Harvey, don't say things you'll regret later on. Just a moment. Where is the cigarette case Laura had in her hand when the lights went out? What cigarette case? You know the one I mean, Dr. Prising. The gold one that was charred in the fire. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. I have. And if you're as innocent as you claim to be, you won't mind being searched. Not at all. Go right ahead. I will. Whom are you calling, Geraldine? The police. I can't understand why they haven't arrived yet. It's almost 10 o'clock. Maybe something's happened to them on the way. Maybe their car broke down. Their car, too? Huh? Nothing. Only it seems as if your car is the only one that works when you want it to. Headquarters. Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant, I can't understand why you men aren't here yet. A murder's been committed. Do you think you've been calling the police department all this time, Mrs. Reeves? <laughs> It's music. It's ten o'clock, Mrs. Reeves. You have two more hours. Jerry, are you in your room? Yes, Harvey. What is it? This is our chance, Jerry. We've got to run away from Dr. Prising now, while we're alone. Yes, of course, Harvey, but how will we go? In my car, it's just... Uh... Wait a minute. Listen. What is it? It sounds like footsteps in the living room. Prising must be in there. No, I saw him go outside. He said he wanted to see if he could find the dog. Oh, well, there's someone in there. I'm going to find out who it is. Be careful, Harvey. He may be standing just outside the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You stay behind me. anybody there? Is anybody in the living room? No. There doesn't seem to Don't be... Don't talk about me, Harvey. Oh. Well, Dr. Pricey, you've been standing at this door with your ear to the keyhole? No, not exactly. I thought you were supposed to be outside, looking for that dog. I was outside for a while. But I saw someone moving around in here, so I came back. And I got here. Your wife's body was gone. What? what? Gone? Your... Laura's body is gone? I assume that it's gone. It's not where it was on the floor. But, uh, but how could it... Look here, Pricey. You were alone in this room. And so were what? you. After I left. Wasn't it, Geraldine? Well, 
Yes, now that I think back, he was. Certainly. What's more, Geraldine saw me leave the house. And when I left, the body was still here. After that, I don't know what happened. What are you driving at? Draw your own conclusions. I've drawn mine. Why, you... Harvey, stop it! Stop it! I... I'm sorry, Jerry. I just... The dog again. Yeah. I can't understand why you didn't find that dog, Dr. Prising. He must be right out there where the old house used to be. Well, if you think you can find him, why don't you go... Good heavens, man. What? Look. There's a fire burning out there. On the grounds of the old house. Pricing, you started that fire yourself and you're burning Laura's body in it to cover up your crime. Harvey, where are you going? I'm going to the fire, Jerry. I've got to stop it. I've got to put it off. I'm going to lose my mind if someone doesn't stop these awful things from happening. Won't anybody help us? Easy, I... Geraldine. I'm... The man who hopes to kill you was trying to break you down first. It's well, part of his plan. Here. Take a sip of this brandy. It'll help you. All right, thank you, Doctor. I... What's the matter? Oh, nothing, really. I just don't care for any brandy just now. What's wrong with it? Well, I, I, I didn't say anything was wrong with it. I, I just don't... You fool. Do you think I'm trying to poison you? I don't know what to think. Here. Give me that brandy. I'll drink it myself. <coughs> there. Believe me now? I don't believe anyone. Listen to me, Geraldine. I'm the best friend you have in the world right now. You've got to understand that. Because there isn't much more time. We've got to get away from Harvey while he's still out there. What do you mean? Can't you see? He's trying to kill you. That's a lie. It isn't, Geraldine. Harvey's the one that's lied to us. He and Laura both. They intended to kill you when the lights went out. But in the darkness, Harvey made a fatal mistake. He thought it was you he was strangling, not Laura. I won't believe it's that. It's the truth. They never drove across that bridge at 9 o'clock tonight. They've been here on the island all evening. How do you know? Because we saw that bridge with our own eyes. And I saw it again just five minutes ago. It's still down. You're lying. Come out and see it for yourself. You're just trying to get me out of this house. Stop being such a fool. Here. Take this gun. If it'll give you any security, take it. And hold it in my back while we're out there. But for heaven's sakes, let's get away from Harvey while there's still a chance. All right. Give me the gun. Here. Now, you keep in front of me all the time. And I'm warning you. If you make one false move, I'll kill you in cold blood. You see, Harvey and Laura were lying to us. The bridge is still down. You're right. They couldn't have come across that bridge. Of course not. The only trouble is, we can't get back over it now either. We've got to get away, Doctor. Now, before we're seen... What about that house at the other end of the, the island? People are away. But they might have a boat. Yes, of course they do have a boat. We can row to the mainland. Come on, quick. All right. I have a feeling we're being followed. It's your imagination. Hurry, Geraldine. Hurry. We are being followed, Doctor. But behind us, there's a man with a dog. Good heavens. It's just like the dog you owned. The one that died in the fire. Yes. And the man... It's Dave. <laughs> We've lost them. Lost them in the woods. They can't be far behind. It doesn't matter now. The house is just ahead. But the boat, Doctor. The boat's not at the landing. It must be. Well, it isn't. Can't you see it isn't? Perhaps it's around and back. No, that side of the house faces the road. Then we'll have to break in and hide here until morning. Our best chance is to be inside where we can protect ourselves. After all, you still have a gun. But I hardly know how to use it. Then give it to me. No. You still don't trust me, do you? I don't know, Doctor. But I'm the one who's been threatened, so I really should have the gun. Very well. Wait here. I'll break through the window and come around on the inside. Oh. Did you hurt yourself? No. I'm all right. Uh, just wait there for me and I'll unlock the door. Oh, hurry, doctor. Please, hurry. They're on our trail again. Come inside, Geraldine. Quickly. And lock the door behind you. What's wrong, doctor? Nothing's wrong. We're in luck. There's a phone here. If it hasn't been disconnected. 
Hello. Hello, operator. This isn't the operator. Tell Mrs. Reeves it's 11 o'clock. She has one more hour to live. Half past 11. I won't leave this house. I'm not going to run away any longer. If they're going to kill me, let them come here and do it. Only for heaven's sakes, why don't they do it right away? Why don't they come here and get it over with instead of waiting until 12 o'clock? Geraldine. Please. Well, I can't stand it any longer. I'd rather die than go through any more of this torture. Uh, I just... Uh, sit down for a moment. Relax. And try to ease your mind. Oh, for... Dr. Prizing, what are you doing? Playing the piano. I thought it might relax you. But that melody... You! You're the one I hear at night playing David's music. Playing it right here in this house. Yes, Geraldine. I've rented this house to protect you from David and the dog. Well, stop it. Stop playing that piece. Stop it. Now stay where you are. Stay. Don't, don't be afraid. I won't harm you as long as you have that gun. But the gun won't stop David. David's dead. Is he? Listen. He's right outside the door. And in a moment, he'll be here to take you with him. No! Everything you've done. Stop! You killed me, didn't you, darling? You started that fire because you knew I was too much of an invalid to get out of bed. Stay where you are! You hated me, Geraldine. Stop! No. Your bullets can't harm me now. Nothing you can do can harm me. Because I'm dead and you're still alive. Oh, David. David, forgive me. I, I didn't know what I was doing that night. Please, please believe me. I was sorry as soon as I started that fire, but it was too late then. I couldn't put it out. I, I couldn't. How dare you? How dare you ask my forgiveness when you're still lying? But I'm not lying. I'm not. I, I told you everything. Why didn't you tell the police? Because I wanted to live. You'll confess everything now? Yes, David, yes. Yes, I will. If you'll only leave me alone, please. Please. It was my cigarette case Laura found in the water. I'd thrown it over the bridge that same night after I took it out of the fire. Well, I, I guess that's all we need, Harvey. Full confession with two witnesses. Harvey! Yes, Geraldine. I do look like my brother in this dim light. And the dog Laura's holding outside is the same breed as the one you own. Laura! Laura! Did you say Laura was alive? Very much so, Geraldine. It wasn't hard for me to pretend being dead. With the doctor keeping you away from my body. Then you were all in this together. You forced this confession out of me. Yes, Geraldine. The blank cartridges Dr. Pricing slipped into that gun of yours really turned the trick. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, hello, Inspector. Yes, it's all right now. You can hook the wires up again. She's told us the truth. And you'd better get to work on that bridge right away. It's uh, still down. What an outrage. All those opportunities for murder and not a drop of blood spilled all night long. Oh, well, some days you can't lay away a corpuscle. And now... Uh, a moment while our Colgate voices bring you a message. Use Colgate tooth powder. Keep smiling just right. Use it each morning and use it at night to help you rate with every date. Use Colgate tooth powder. Tell me, do you really mean it when you say, I want to be alone? Or are you just pretending that you don't care about dates? 
Could it be that a little breath of trouble has cooled your romance? A little breath? What a pity to let unpleasing breath ruin your romance. Why not brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate Tooth Powder? Scientific tests prove that Colgate Tooth Powder, in seven cases out of ten, instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. So use Colgate Tooth Powder for all it's worth. Enjoy its exciting cleansing results, too. No amount of money can buy you a dentifrice that will clean your teeth more quickly or effectively than Colgate Tooth Powder. Remember the name, Colgate Tooth Powder, with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. Well, it's time for me to join the moonbeams now. But before I leave under a cloud, before I'm missed, I thought I might pass on the moral of tonight's story. If you must light a fire under your husband's bed, be careful where you drop the ashes. By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is Puzzle for Puppets by Patrick Quentin. Well, now it's really time to close that there squeaking door until next week when Colgate Tooth Powder brings you another Inner Sanctum Mystery. So until then... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Huh? <laughs> Latest reports from doctors on the 14-day palm olive plan. Kansas City reports better complexions for 93%. New Orleans reports better complexions for 97%. In city after city, doctors tested the 14-day palm olive plan on all types of skin. And two out of three of all women tested got better complexions in 14 days. What is this 14-day palm olive plan? Wash your face three times a day with palm olive soap. Then each time take 60 seconds more to massage palm olive's lovely soft lather onto your skin as you would a cream. Then rinse. This cleansing massage with palm olive's lather brings your skin its full beautifying effect. See what palm olive can do for your skin in 14 days. Remember, doctors prove palm olive's beauty results. Remember another Inner Sanctum Mystery next Wednesday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Marshall. You've come to the right place. Here we present a unique kind of drama. Drama that uses your ears to stimulate your fears. The story you are about to hear concerns another part of the human anatomy. It's a tale about a very frightening pair of hands. Not because they're ugly or mutilated or because they do evil things. On the contrary, the hands of our heroine do nothing at all. And therein lies her terror. But there's one other subject our story deals with. And it's the most mysterious of all. The human mind. Our mystery drama, The Hands of Mrs. Mallory, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Celeste Holm. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time Beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way because they still care about quality.
Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say, well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? What's for dinner? ShopRite suggests lean, savory smoked ham. Shank portion, just 69 cents a pound, but portion 79 a pound. Choice grade first cut chuck steak, 69 cents a pound. Penn Dutch noodles pound package, 49 cents. Crown top white bread, just 39 cents for a 22 ounce loaf. For a quick meal, serve banquet frozen 10 ounce dinners. All varieties except beef or ham are just 39 cents. Check the store wide values at ShopRite. You'll find a lot more for a little less. She loves a family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. Think of the most beautiful day you can imagine. A day so perfect that the birds are singing its praises. And even the people who line the park benches, those roosting creatures who seem to exist in a vacuum without emotion, seem happy and contented today. But there's one exception. A lady of middle years who sits alone on a bench. Is it her glum expression that has driven away other people? Or perhaps it's the obvious elegance of her mink stole and the glistening perfection of the diamond on her finger. Hey, lady, is this seat taken? No. It's okay if I sit here and wait for my brother. He's playing in the ball game. How nice. He plays first base. Hey, you want to see my baseball? Uh, not especially. It's got Reggie Jackson's autograph on it. Here, look at it. No, please, I, I, I really don't know. What? Uh, what's the matter with your hands? Nothing. It's... They're just a little stiff, that's all. Now, why don't you go watch your brother play? Well, he says I jinx them. Gee, your hands look funny. I mean, can't you move them at all? No. As a matter of fact, I can't. Gee, that's funny. I never saw anything like that. How come you can't move your hands? It's a kind of a sickness. You wouldn't understand. But maybe if you explained it to me, I would. Yes. If I could explain it to you, son, I would be very happy to do so. You don't know how happy. Come in, Ida. Have a seat. I always feel so guilty when I take your time. Each examination seems to produce exactly the same result. Well, that's no reason not to keep examining you. Then there isn't any change. No, Ida... No change. Now, what have you been doing lately? Well, I've been sitting in the park a lot. <laughs> I see. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? I have this glamorous terrace. I could sit there like a queen and view the whole park and all the people in it. But I prefer to sit on a bench and watch the squirrels and listen to the children. Oh, I think that's a good thing, frankly, to be on the ground... In touch with things. Herbert never believed in that. Herbert liked to get away from the smell of the crowd. Yes, that was the phrase he always used. The smell of the crowd. My husband knew a great number of unkind phrases. Well, I never knew him, of course. No. Oh. Neither did I, I suppose. Even when he was lying in his coffin, I felt as though I were saying goodbye to a stranger. And after Mr. Mallory died... How soon after that did the paralysis set in? Oh, it was about a month. Yes, a month after, I suppose. That soon? Yes. And now it's been... How long since you haven't been able to move your hands? Five years. Can you believe it, Doctor? Mm -hmm. I can't. After the first six months of this terrible paralysis, I thought I... Well, I couldn't go on living with these stone fingers of mine... I thought it would be preferable to be dead. But you never lost hope of a cure. No. I mean, that's what's kept me going. The hope of a cure. 
Oh, and something else. I suppose one must say a kind word for money. If there was one thing Herbert did in his life, he managed to leave a very rich widow behind him. Ida, I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to say. Doctor, you don't have to say it. I know what comes next. You're going to advise me to get out of myself, to stop thinking about my poor hands and think about other people. Charity work. Well, Ida, that's one suggestion. But... Oh, if you knew how many charity committees use my name, or how many thousands of dollars I give to every foundation with an impressive name. Ida, I was going to talk about going back to that psychiatrist. Oh, that. I honestly think you gave up too soon. If you'd given the man a chance... Dr. Merritt, my hands are paralyzed. I'm not imagining it. They're paralyzed, frozen, insensitive. You've made all the tests yourself. Do you think I've been faking? No, 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 of course not. The illness is genuine, but... But sometimes the origin of an illness of this nature can... It's all in the mind, yes, of course. All in the mind. So easy to say that, isn't it? So many doctors have told me the same thing. It's so much easier to blame my mind than their own failure. Ida, please. Doctor, excuse me. It's time for me to go. You've got lots of patients waiting for you. Some of them you might even help. Hey, hi. Oh, it's you again. Waiting for your brother? Nah, he's not playing today. Oh, that's too bad. It's a lovely day. He broke his leg. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, is that what happened to your hands? I mean, did they get broken? Mm, was something like that. Well, do you feel anything at all? I mean, like your fingers? You're a very curious boy. Did anyone ever tell you that? Can I just catch him, lady? Please? No, please don't. Hey, hey, you kid, now cut that uh -huh. out. Well, Stop I... bothering this lady, you hear me? I wasn't bothering her. All right, was... now go on, get out of here, leave her alone. Okay, okay. I just wanted to catch her hand. I'm sorry, ma'am. I just couldn't help overhearing. Uh, thank you. He was getting a little too bothersome, although I'm sure he didn't mean any harm. Well, I could see that you were getting annoyed. Ted? Ted? Yo, oh, yes, I'm over here, Melinda. Plenty of hands, huh? I can't manage two hot dogs and a bag of peanuts and two crutches at the same time. Oh, sure, honey. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, this one's yours, with the mustard. Thanks. Do you think I could sit down? Of course. Ted, would you grab that crutch? Yeah, I got it. Listen, I told you that I'd get the hot dogs. I mean, you didn't have to be quite so independent. <laughs> That's funny. You're always complaining that I'm not independent enough. Oh, am I crowding you, ma'am? Oh, no, no. Plenty of room. Ted, who, who was that boy I saw running off? Oh, I drove him off. He was uh, bothering this woman. Oh, dear. Oh, are you all right? Oh, yes, I'm fine. As a matter of fact, he was telling me about his brother's accident. He hurt his foot. I guess this must be the season for accident. You mean these crutches? I'm afraid that was another season. Hey, you know, gee, it's warm, isn't it? Huh? For this time of year? <laughs> of course, you're warm. Saving fair damsels and all that stuff. I didn't know you were a regular St. George, Ted. Yeah, sure I am, with kid dragons. <laughs> uh, would you like some peanuts, ma'am? We've been trying to give them away to the squirrels all day, but we haven't seen any. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I don't like peanuts very much. I can't imagine what squirrels see in them. <laughs> don't worry. My brother will happily eat them all by himself. Your brother? Uh, oh, I'm Melinda West. This is my brother, Ted. And my name is Mrs. Mallory. How do you do? Uh, haven't I seen you two here before? Oh, you probably have. We live close to the park. Are you from around here, Mrs. Mallory? Oh, yes. I live in that building right there. Oh. What a view you must have. Uh, can you see the park from your window? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, if I had a window like that, I'd never come down to the park. Well, of course, these crutches sort of discourage you walking around very much. Do you both live in the city? No, no, we're from Ohio. We've only been here about two months, but uh, I guess we'll be going back soon. Don't say that. Don't even think that, Ted, please. I'm sorry, Melinda. I, I didn't I mean to... I gather that uh, you don't want to leave. Well, not if it means that... Well, the truth is we came here to see a doctor, a, a surgeon who specializes in cases like mine. You... See, I was in an automobile accident two years ago. I haven't walked since. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know exactly how you must feel. You know, people always think they do, but they really can't. Ah, uh, Melinda. What? I think your brother is trying to signal you, Melinda, about me. What do you mean? He means... 
please. I have. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't even realize. No, some people don't realize that I can't move them. See, as long as I sit here very quietly, my whole body is as immobilized as my hands. Yes. Now I know what you mean. I know how tempting it is to just want to sit, be a statue, so that for a little while you can forget that part of you is dead. Oh, come on, Melinda, please. Let's cut this out, huh? Please. Tell me more about this surgeon. I can tell you what he said in one word. One two-letter word. Oh, dear. He won't operate, then? He said it wouldn't do any good. Now, he turned us down flat. That's why I want Melinda to let me take her back home. Oh, well, do you have parents there? No. No, no, we have no one. Uh, but I don't want to go back. I, I don't. I want to see... What were you going to say? Never mind, Mrs. Mallory. Now, come on, Melinda. You finished your hot dog. Let's, let's go home. Ted, let me tell her. Let me ask oh, for her. For Pete's sake, what kind of nonsense is this? What do you want to bother the woman for? Because there's no one else I can talk to about Dr. Griff. I, I can't talk to you about him. You just get red in the face and stomp away from well, me. There's nothing to talk about, and I'm sure Mrs. Mallory isn't interested in fairy stories. I really don't know what either one of you is talking about. Who is Dr. Griff? Oh, he's a quack, a phony. Ted. Well, that's all he is. A two-bit faith healer who robs every cripple he can get his hands on. You don't know anything about him. You only met him once. Yeah, well, that was enough. I could tell in one second that the man is a fake. He can't cure a broken spine. But why not let him try? Somebody has to try. I don't want to be the way I am. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, I don't want to be this way. Help me. Help me, please. <laughs> Mrs. Mallory's physician would be very pleased right now. At last, his patient seems to be taking his advice to interest herself in the outside world, in problems other than her own. But how involved will those problems become? We'll wait to find out until I return shortly with Act Two. Excuse me, madam. Oh, I'm in an awful hurry. I, I just wonder if you could answer a simple question so for do me. I. The question is this. What? what happens this time of year? Oh, that's huh? easy. The kids get home from camp. Goodbye. Nope. What do you mean, nope? Nope. I mean, I should know when my kids get home from camp. Well, the answer I had in mind was a tad more general in scope. Well, see. I gave my answer. Let's hear yours. You know, I'm glad you asked. Are you? You see, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving particularly great deals on all their 74 Buicks. For a family woman such as yourself... I think a neat little Apollo would be just the ticket. It's small, economical, but surprisingly roomy. And it's a Buick, so it's really quite elegant. You don't say. Uh -huh. Now, isn't that good news? Yes. I mean, that you can get such a nifty deal on such a nifty small car. To be car. sure it is, yes. To be sure. By the way, uh, where do your kids go to camp? Guam. It's a G small island in the South Pacific. Guam. <laughs> There's a very special deal going on at all offices of Suburban Savings throughout North Jersey. It's called Suburban Special Interest Deal. And you'll be especially interested in the savings you get. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum deposit $2,500. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Suburban compounds interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. So you not only get interest on your savings, you get interest on the interest. And Suburban offers you the highest interest rate allowed by law. Here's your chance to get a great savings deal. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Why not deal yourself into Suburban Savings special interest deal at any Suburban Savings office in northern New Jersey? Located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne. The good weather is holding in the city, and Mrs. Ida Mallory has returned day after day to her bench in the park. A bench which seems to have become her property by right of eminent domain. But even Mrs. Mallory would have to admit that her interest in these daily visits is no longer restricted to sunshine and green grass. 
Each day, she hopes for another glimpse of the young couple, the scowling brother and his pretty, pathetic sister. And then, on the fourth day, there they were. Excuse me. I don't know if you'll remember me. Why, of course. You're Mrs. Mallory. The lady with the view. <laughs> yes, that's right. How are you both? Oh, we're okay. Well, I really didn't mean to interrupt your conversation. Oh, don't be concerned about the way Ted looks. His face always is like a thundercloud. Especially when we discuss the forbidden topic. I suppose you mean that doctor. Yeah, she talked me into seeing him again. You know something? Every feeling I had about him the first time was confirmed. That's really impossible, Mrs. Mallory. Tell me something. Is he a real doctor? Well, I'm not sure he's a medical doctor, Mrs. Mallory, but I'm sure he's entitled to the degree. Maybe a, a doctor of psychology or something like that. I'll tell you what he's entitled to. A good swift kick but in I'll the... I'll tell you one thing about Dr. Griff. He's the only one, the only one who said he could help me. He didn't promise. He just said he was hopeful. Well, that's something anyway. Yeah, I'll tell you what he's hopeful about, getting your 500 bucks. He says he's very hopeful I can be cured. And that's worth a great deal more than $500. All right, go on. Tell her the rest. Tell her the real clincher. Are you afraid to? What do you mean? Mrs. Mallory, you're an intelligent woman. So listen to how Dr. Griff plans to cure my sister. I know it sounds sort of melodramatic. Oh, it's idiotic. That's what it is. Please. Please, I'd still like to know. Well, he says he uses something called the water of faith. See what I mean? The water of faith? Yeah. Sounds sort of, um, hmm, religious. Like, um, the holy water at Lourdes. It's, it's related to that, yes. Oh, now do you see why I say the guy is an out-and-out -out fraud? The water of faith? Where are we? Back in the Middle Ages? Well, I must admit it does sound sort of odd. Just the same. He said that it works. That it's worked for dozens of people. He wants $500 for the treatment. With no guarantees, you understand. Hmm. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, would you help me, please? Will you talk some sense to this woman? Oh, my dear. I mean, I have to admit, it really doesn't sound reasonable. You mean the $500? Oh, but it's a very special treatment, Dr. Griff said. Well, I meant it's not reasonable to assume that such things can do any good. I see. So I'll never know. Is that it? I'll just turn around and take a plane back to Ohio and live out the rest of my life as a cripple. When for $500, at least I might have had a chance to yes. live. Yes, I see what you mean. Ted. Oh, I hope you don't mind my calling you Ted. Oh, no, no, of course not. Your sister, well, she may have a point there. I mean, even if it is a waste of money, perhaps she'll never be happy unless you let this man try. If not, she'll always wonder about it. Always. Yes. Yes, I know that. That's what his whole bag is, making you wonder if it just might work. And, well, about the money, I don't know how to say this, but you see, $500 may seem like a lot to you, but it isn't to me. So if I can help you... Oh, no, no. Oh, no, please. Absolutely not. It's not really a problem, Mrs. Mallory. We've got the money. Besides, it's not the money so much as, well... Seeing Melinda disappointed again. I've had so many disappointments, you see. Yes. Yes, I know all about such things. Oh, dear. Yes, of, of course you do. Oh, you see what a selfish person I've become. I keep forgetting that you have your own affliction. I'm not sure that it isn't even worse than mine. To lose the use of your hands. Well, never mind about me. What, what are you two going to do? Oh, I did. It looks like I'm outnumbered on this thing. Dad, does that mean you... You'll let me do it? You'll let me? Well, if you go back without trying this dumb water of faith, you'll always regret it. So, okay, let's get it over with. Oh, Mrs. Mallory. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're the one who did it. Oh, my dear. I just hope your miracle happened. All my life, I wanted to believe that miracles happen. Melinda? Melinda? Wait a minute. Oh, oh Mrs. Mallory. Well, you move faster on those crutches than I do on my two feet. 
You're, you're not here alone, are you? No. Ted's with me. I just wanted to take a little stroll by myself. No, that isn't true. We just had another fight, and I had to get away from him. Oh, dear. Now, that doesn't sound too good. Well, you know how Ted is. Well, see, I haven't seen you for two days. How are you? The truth is, I don't really know. But I've I started treatments, Mrs. Mallory. With Dr. Griff? Yes. I started about five days ago. And it's... It's nothing at all like what I expected. Well, tell me about it. Well, do you remember how silly it all sounded, this water of faith business? Well, it sounded a little theatrical. But it isn't. It's scientific, Mrs. Mallory. That's the most wonderful part of it. Dr. Griff only used that phrase as a, as a convenient description of, of the, the drug. What drug is that? Well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I I have the feeling that, that there might be something slightly illegal about it, the, the drug oh. he uses. A psychedelic suggestion. Psychedelic suggestion? Now, what on earth is that? Uh, it's the technique Dr. Griff uses. He, he uses it to, to liberate the mind from its control over the body... Whenever that control is negative. I'm sorry. You know, I really don't understand that kind of talk. Well, I'm not saying I understand it myself. Completely. But it does sound to me as if he believes that your illness is psychosomatic. I don't know, Mrs. Mallory. All I know is that I have to go through with it. Kill or cure. It isn't a dangerous treatment, is it? No, no, I, I'm sure it isn't. It, it's, well, it's more like a sort of... A hypnosis. I go to his office, he administers the drug, and then he talks to me. And that's all there is to it. And? Has it helped? I I think I'd better go back to Teddy. He, he's probably getting worried about me. Melinda, please tell me if... Melinda, look out! Uh, that bicycle! Oh! Oh! Melinda. I'm sorry, Miss. I'm sorry. Melinda, are you all right? Oh, you let, let me help you up, Miss. Oh, you idiot. I mean, can't you see that that girl is crippled? Quick, give me that crutch. Oh, yes, sure. Wait, wait, wait. I I, I think I, I can manage to pick myself up this way. Now, just, just take it easy. Mrs. Mallory. What is it? Are you hurt? No, no. No, it, it's my leg. D did you see that? My leg bent slightly at the knee. No, no, I didn't see Look, it. Miss, if you're sure you're okay. Oh, get out of here. Go away and be more careful next yes, time. Miss. Oh, Miss Ma Mrs. Mallory, I'm sure it happened. I, I saw it happen. My leg moved. For the first time in two years, it moved. <laughs> No, Ida, I'm sorry. I can't find any reference to this Dr. Griff in any medical directory. But that doesn't prove he's a fraud, though, does it? Oh, no, no, of course not. And as you say, the man may not be a medical doctor. I certainly hope he isn't. Well, why do you say that? Pride of profession, my dear. We don't like to have faith healers bearing the same credentials. And that's what you think he is, a faith healer? Well, of course. Oh, I'm not knocking the power of faith far from it. Very often, it's simply another way of getting at psychosomatic difficulties. Oh, I hate that word. I know you do. Oh, I've been through all that psychosomatic nonsense. All those doctors who tried to tell me that my paralyzed hands weren't... Well, what they are. That there's something in me, some emotional problem. You didn't give them much chance to prove or disprove it, either. I did. I submitted to their therapy, even if I didn't believe in it, and it didn't do the slightest bit of good. Well, maybe if you had believed them, it would have. Flesh is flesh, Doctor. Bone is bone. That kind of therapy can't make my hands move any more than it can make that poor girl walk. And I have a good mind to tell him so. Please come in, Mrs. Mallory. Thank you. Won't you have a chair? 
All right. Well, do you mind if I ask who referred you to me? Well, actually, it was one of your patients, Melinda West. Yes, yes, of course, a very charming young woman. Have you known her long? Just a few weeks. See, I haven't seen her for the last ten days or so. How is she coming along? Well, actually, you'll get a chance to see her soon. She has a three o'clock appointment with me, which is only a few minutes from now. So, if you wouldn't mind telling me what's on your mind, Mrs. Mallory. Well, I just thought it would be um, worthwhile talking to you, Doctor. About yourself? Well, as you can see, I am afflicted. Uh, do you mind if I look at your hands? Yes, frankly, I'd rather you wouldn't. Not just now. I'd, I'd rather hear something about yourself. About this... Uh, treatment of yours. Melinda said something about a technique you used called uh, psychedelic suggestion. Now, just what is that? It's a medical principle. As old as mesmerism, as new as chemotherapy. The power of mind over body. Uh, psychosomatic. Well, who knows what afflictions is psychosomatic. Some illnesses start with the emotions, some with the body. And more often, it's a combination of both. Really? Germs aren't imaginary. Viruses are very real little creatures. Yet the mind has strange powers over them to make them hurt us or to render them harmless. All right, then. What about a broken leg? Can the mind cause that? Of course. If you use your head, you wouldn't break your leg in the first place. Oh. <laughs> You're thinking of Miss West, of the fact that she suffered a spine injury. That's right. I hardly see how you can correct something like that. You've seen her x-rays then? Mm, no. You believe the damage is neurological? Well, I know nothing about it. That's strange, Mrs. Mallory. You certainly seem to have an opinion. <laughs> Be careful, though. You don't have a medical degree. Someone might call you a quack. Listen, doctor. I came here... Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Mallory. Ah, Melinda... I'll be with you in just a minute. No. No, come to think of it. Why don't you come in now? There's a friend of yours here. A friend? Oh, it's I, Melinda, Mrs. Mallory. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, how nice to see you. Come in, Melinda, please. Melinda? Your crutches. Where are your crutches? Look at me, Mrs. Mallory. I can walk without crutches now. I'm not very steady, but I can walk. <laughs> Well, there goes at least one of Mrs. Ida Mallory's cherished notions that the mind can't cure the body. But she sees the evidence of her own eyes. And something tells me that this is one prejudice she's willing to give up. After all, she wants to believe in miracles. And don't we all? Mrs. Ida Mallory has spent a sleepless night dreaming of things she never thought possible. But when the sun streamed in her windows, her first thought was to get out into the park and with only one hope of seeing Melinda West again and seeing her miracle confirmed. It's true. It's really true, Mrs. Mallory. Even Ted has to admit it. Well, I guess there's something to it, all right. I haven't seen my sister off those crutches in two years. But how did it all happen? I don't really know. As I told you, he, he used this drug. He made me go to sleep. And then he simply talked to me. At first, there was nothing. And then I started feeling life in my legs again. Well, you saw me that day in the park when I fell down. Oh, Melinda, Melinda. I, well, I just can't tell you how happy I am for you. Well, and what are your plans now? Oh, go home, I guess. I've got to get back to my job if it's still there. The treatment costs much more than we thought it would. Yes, the oh. 500 went in no time at all. Then he asked for another 1,000. He said it couldn't be helped. The drug he uses is so horribly expensive. Now, listen. I told you once that if there were any way I could help you out financially... Uh-uh. No, no. No, that's out, Mrs. Mallory. We'll we'll manage okay. Of course we will. Well. <laughs> and I can go back to work now. I can do anything I want now. Oh, yes. Yes, that must be a wonderful feeling. To be able to do anything you want. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ah, Mrs. Mallory. Please come in. Thank you, Doctor. You know, it was really very good of you to see me on such short notice. That's quite all right. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I don't quite know where to begin. Well, suppose I begin for you. You've been thinking about Melinda West. Yes, I saw her only this morning. She really is cured, isn't she? Yes, Mrs. Mallory. In my opinion, the young woman was cured. But you realize that all I really cured by psychedelic suggestion was the illness that existed in her mind, not her body. But I still don't fully comprehend it. I'm sure there was no real neurological damage to the girl. Oh. I think her bones and muscles and nerves were all in the proper place and functioning normally. Only her mind wasn't. But she seemed so sensible. Mrs. Mallory, do you know the story of that accident? I beg your pardon? Did Melinda ever tell you exactly what occurred that caused her injuries? No. No, as a matter of fact, she didn't. She simply said it was an automobile accident. That's correct. And she was the driver. Oh. There were two other passengers, her mother and her father. Both of them were killed. Oh, dear Lord. She did sustain some injuries in the crash. But it was apparent to me that they were not sufficiently grave to cause her the total paralysis she suffered. Ah, uh, you mean she felt that guilty about what had happened? Mm. Guilty enough to seek punishment for herself. And she did. She punished herself by losing the use of her legs. And... And so, your treatment was able to cure her. Yes, I'm happy to say. But, of course, it couldn't cure... someone like me. What was that? I said, it couldn't cure me. See, I didn't lose that use of my hands for any kind of reason like that. I mean, it's just some sort of nerve damage. Doctors could never explain it. Well, if that's the diagnosis of your physician, that it's purely physical and incurable... Oh, but I didn't say that. See, I mean, my doctor has never used the word incurable. I have been hoping for years that it would just heal itself. I can't go on living like this. So helpless and so useless. Uh, Mrs. Mallory... Have you come here to talk about Melinda West or yourself? Myself. Hmm. I want my hands back. Oh, dear God, I want my hands. Yes, I was afraid that's what you had in mind. Afraid? Why? Because if you had any idea of becoming my patient, I... I regret to say that it's not possible. But why not? I mean, you accepted her as a patient... And, and you cured her. I mean, you really did. Unfortunately, Miss West is the last patient I can accept. At least in this part of the world. Doctor, I, I don't understand. Are you... Do you have to go somewhere? That's correct. But where are you going? Abroad. And my plans will keep me abroad for at least a year. Oh, no. I mean, listen, if you're going to Europe, I, I mean, I was thinking of taking a trip no, there myself. No, no, Mrs. Mallory, my destination isn't Europe. I'm going to North Africa, a case of some importance. Well, since when is one patient more important than another? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean it that way. Oh. It's simply that this is a prior commitment. But maybe then, maybe I could go with you. I mean, I could take up residence there. I'm afraid that's impossible, too. Why? Well, the country I'm going to is a Muslim country. My patient is the son of, well, a, uh, a notable Arab leader. Well, why would that make any difference? What does it matter? I'll be living within the bachelor section of the official residence. It's an area restricted by Muslim law. You wouldn't be allowed near the place, my dear lady, even if I were free to treat you. And I'm not. But I have money. I'll pay you. I'll pay you anything you want to stay and treat me. I mean, I'll, I'll meet this Arab leader's offer. Mrs. Mallory, the fee I'm about to receive, I wouldn't ask of any individual... I've been asked to remain with him for a period not to exceed one year. A year? For that year, in a Swiss bank, there will be deposited for me $150,000 in Swiss francs. 
fifty thousand. I'm very sorry that you made me reveal that confidence. No, I I trust that it goes no farther. I'll pay you the same. What? You heard me. I'll pay you the same. I mean, not in a year's time, but as soon as you've cured me. I'm sorry. Your offer is very generous, but it's also conditional. What do you mean, conditional? You will pay only for a cure. That's something I'd never guaranteed a patient. Not Miss West, not my Arab friend, no one at all. All right, then. Suppose it isn't conditional. Suppose I agree to pay you in advance. Well, that, of course, would be something worth consideration. Well, hello, Dr. Merritt. This is certainly a surprise. I think it must be the first time that a doctor ever made a voluntary house call. Well, I, I didn't come here to see you as a patient, Ida. Only as a friend. Well, that's very kind of you. Ever since I saw you last, I've been thinking over what you told me about this Dr. Griff. Oh, yes. Well, what about him? I thought it would be worthwhile just to ask around about the gentleman. And last week I was attending a joint conference of my medical association and psychological group. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I did learn something that I thought you might be interested in. There is no Dr. Griff. Well, what was that? Oh, maybe he has a Ph.D. and tack that in front of his name, but I'm quite sure that the man is not a medical doctor. All right. Be that as it may, he's still not necessarily a fraud. Well, I, I didn't say he was anything. But I suspect that your original judgment was correct. But... That he's not someone to be trusted. But you don't know the whole story. Well, what I do know is you're more impressed with a man than you were willing to admit. Isn't that right? Dr. Merritt, he cured that girl. What? You know that girl I told you about, the crippled girl? She's walking again. I saw her walk. Well, I suppose that could be true. Faith healing does have its successes. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor, but I'd rather not discuss this any further. Oh, wait a minute. I don't like the way you sound. Ida, have you made any sort of arrangement with this charlatan? Dr. Merritt, I appreciate your interest, but I refuse to say another word about this matter. I mean, do you understand? Not another word. Just relax. Close your eyes. And let the water of faith flow through your bloodstream. You can feel it tingling through your body. Bringing you peace. And tranquility. Total peace. And happiness. Do you feel it? Yes. Yes, I feel it. And now, I'm reaching out for your hand. Do you see me reaching out for you? Yes. Yes, I see you. And now... Oh, of all times. Who's that now? Yes, what do you want? Are you Dr. Helmut Griff? Yes, who are you? The name's Barry, Doctor. Lieutenant Barry, Racket and Bunko Squad, Police Department. May I come in? No, you can't. I happen to have a patient with me right now. Would her name be Ida Mallory? And who are you? I'm her physician. You might say her accredited physician. I demand to know what this intrusion is all it's about. It's not an intrusion, Dr. Griff. It's an arrest. What? Doctor? Well, Dr. Griff? So, uh, may we come in now? Ida. Ida, are you all right? Yes. Oh, what's, what is it? It's I mean, what's happening? It's all right, happening? Ida. Everything's going to be fine. They've got them all now. All of them. Well, what are you talking about? Uh, is this a lady, Doc? Yes, this is Mrs. Mallory. 
I don't think she's in any condition to talk. He's obviously given her some kind of drug. It's a, a legitimate drug, a, a perfectly legitimate setting. Yes, yes, of course. Doctor, I'm sure it's nothing very unusual, second all or something of that nature. No mysterious water of faith. Please, please, won't someone tell me what's going on? No, I'll tell you, Ida. But it may hurt just a little. You see, I told the police your story and... They investigated. He is a fraud, Ida. How dare you say that? Be quiet, mister. You're no more a doctor than I'm police commissioner. His real name is Michael Lanning. Alias Dr. George Watkins, alias Dr. John Wilson, and that's his modus operandi, Mrs. Mallory, posing as a fake doctor, offering miracle cures, usually for sick widows with lots of money. Oh, but he cured her. I mean, he cured Melinda. This is the part that may hurt most, Ida. He did not cure Melinda West. Because Melinda West was never crippled to begin with. I know. It was just psychosomatic. Oh, no, She's... no, 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 Ida. Just crooked. What? She I... was in on the racket with him, Mrs. Mallory. Her real name is Anna Fraser. Oh. Her so-called brother is Tony Fraser. And I'm sorry, they're not brother and sister at all. They're man and wife. No. And I believed them. I believed them. Well, we haven't caught up with those two yet, Mrs. Mallory, but we will. Oh, I uh, brought some pictures for you to identify. No, no. I don't want to look at them. I can't bear to look at them. Please, Ida, you must. But I don't want to prosecute them. I don't. Why really. not? They're crooks, plain and simple crooks, all three of them. I don't care. You have to help us now, Ida. You have to identify these parasites. Now, please, look at the photographs. You know something, Doctor? Sometimes people set out to do good and end up doing harm. And sometimes it works the other way around. What do you mean? Hey, now. Hey, now, stop that. Now, don't rip up those photos. Ida, 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 what are you... What? For the love of heaven, you're tearing up the pictures. You're tearing them up. With my hands, Doctor. With my own hands. Well, they say that it's an ill wind that doesn't blow someone some good. And in this case, it looks like three evil people have managed to be very good to Mrs. Ida Mallory in spite of themselves. If there's a moral to this tale, I'd frankly hate to be the one to say it. No, we're not recommending that the best way to cure your ills is to fall into the hands of confidence men. Myth included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Bud. It's suspicious, okay? Our cast included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends.
friend. This is your host of the Inner Sanctum inviting you in through the squeaking door. Come on in. Have your picture taken with the uh, corpse. You look good next to him. Poor fellow was a photographer. Passed on last winter while taking a picture. Yes, died of overexposure. <laughs> Awful, isn't it? Enough to make your camera shutter. <laughs> Well, let's gather around the coffin now for a nice, happy picture. Watch the body. Watch the body. Oh, dear. We'll have to take that again. Someone moves. And I think it was the corpse. Why, that's downright silly. Oh, hello, Mary. You're just in time. Come on, get in the picture. What? Do you think I'd stand next to a corpse? Oh, please, Mary. You can wear your Lipton Sterling Silver Medallion. Then I'll send the picture to my friends in the graveyard. Why, Mary, with your figure, your symmetry, they'll probably elect you Miss Cemetery of 1945. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, but I can do without that honor. And as far as the sterling silver medallion is concerned, it's mighty popular right now. I've been getting hundreds of letters from ladies all over the country telling me how much they appreciate it. You see, the medallion is made of real sterling silver. It's about an inch in diameter, and it's decorated with the Chinese symbol for good luck. You can wear the medallion as a necklace or a choker. You see, it's hung on a narrow black rayon satin ribbon. Or you can simply add it to your charm bracelet if you wish. It's just the thing to brighten up your simple silk dresses and your dressy suits. And ladies, here's how you get this handsome medallion. Just send 25 cents and the box top from a package of Lipton's, the tea with the brisk flavor, to Lipton Tea, Box 92. That's Box 92, New York City. You paint a pretty picture, Mary. Now let me paint one for you. Mine is called Portrait of Death. It's an original radio play by that ghastly ghostwriter, Robert Sloan. And our star tonight is Miss Leslie Woods, who plays the role of Miss Snyder. And listen, if you've never sat for a portrait, you'd better not sit alone for Portrait of Death. In the dim light of a misty old art dealer's gallery, a somber portrait has just been sold at auction to a man by the name of Mason. Magnificent painting, isn't it? There's never been anything like it, Mr. Mason. But if you don't mind my saying so, I think you've paid a stiff price for it. I couldn't let that woman in the black dress outbid me. Look at those colors. Expression on the girl's face. Yes. The detail in the background. Hmm. Really is a work of art. And technically speaking, yes. But the portrait has a strange history, Mr. Mason. Strange and sinister. What do you mean? Well, people say it's brought bad luck to every one of its owners. Oh, come now, Fleur. Well, it may be just a story, but at least this much of it is true. The day this portrait was finished, the artist died by his own hand. And the model who posed for him died, too, by her own hand. So that's why I painted her in black. Yes. He knew she was going to die. He even painted two graves into the background of the picture, you see? One grave's for him, one for her. Remarkable. Now you know why the painting is called Portrait of Death, Mr. Mason. It meant death for the artist, the model, and, oddly enough, for many of its owners. <laughs> I I'm sorry you bought it, Mr. Mason. I'm sorry um, you bought it, too, Mr. Mason. You shouldn't have taken it away from me. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Don't you remember me? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. You're the woman I was bidding against. I still want the painting, Mr. Mason. And I beg you to sell it to me at a price I can afford. I warn you, it can only bring you harm. I'm sorry, Miss Snyder. The painting is not for sale. Really, Mr. Flournoy, you didn't have to drive me all the way home with this painting. I could have managed it alone. Oh, no trouble at all, Mr. Mason. Here, let me help you carry it into the house. Oh, no, I'll get one of the servants. Oh, what you like? Oh, Parker. Uh, Parker. 
I'm afraid I'll have to go in. Uh, will you wait for me? Oh, certainly. Oh, Parker. Mr. Mason? Uh, yes, Parker. Uh, tell Mrs. Mason to come down, will you? I've got a surprise for her. Oh, Mr. Mason, I, I think you'd better come in. Why, what's the matter? I have some very bad news for you, sir. Terrible news. Mrs. Mason is dead. What? It was her heart, sir. She died this afternoon while you were at the art gallery. Oh. I can't believe it. I tried to reach you, but you'd already left, sir. Dr. Simpson said... Excuse me, sir. Hello? Mr. Mason's residence? Is Mr. Mason there, please? This is Miss Snyder calling. Just a moment, please. It's for you, sir. Oh. Thank you. Hello? Mr. Mason, I still want that painting. What? Don't you think you'd better sell it to me? It can only bring you harm. I... I'll think it over. Don't wait too long, Mr. Mason. I warn you, don't wait too long. You ought to go to bed, sir. You haven't had any sleep for days. I'm all right, Parker. But it can't do any good to sit in this room and stare at that painting. Parker, doesn't the portrait look a little different today? than it did when I brought it into the house? I don't think so, sir. The expression on the girl's face is a little deeper. A little more understanding. The background... It... Good heavens, Parker. What is it, sir? Look. The graves in the background. Weren't they there, sir? When I bought it, Parker, there were two. Now there are three. <laughs> I'm so glad you could come out here, Mr. Flano. I, I had to speak to you. I came as soon as I could. Did you bring the catalog? Oh, yes, I did, Mr. Mason. What is it? What's wrong? Uh, let me see a picture of that portrait, please. Yes, of course. Portrait. Uh, portrait. Uh, here it is. A portrait of death. There. I was right. There were only two graves in the original painting. Well, of course, Mr. Mason. I told you there were two the day you bought it. But now there are three, Flano. Three graves? So what? Come I'll show you. Oh, Mr. Mason, please. Uh, three, I tell you. The third one's been there ever since my wife oh, died. But, but that's impossible. You must be imagining... Give it yourself, Lana. Here. One, two, three. Mr. Mason. Why are you looking at me like that? You need a rest. A rest? What are you talking about? Don't you understand? There are only two graves in that portrait. The third one is in your mind. You mean... There isn't a third grave on this painting? Oh, no. You've been under such a strain these past few days. I must be losing my mind. Oh, oh no, I, I'm sure it isn't as serious as all that. It's only natural for you to be upset about your wife. I want to get rid of the portrait. I want to sell it right away. Well, I, I don't know how soon I can dispose of it for you, Mr. Mason. Under the circumstances, it might be hard to arrange that a That woman sale. will buy it, won't she? Who? That woman who's been pestering me for it. Why don't you get in touch with her? I will, first thing in the morning. No, no, I won't wait until morning. I want that portrait out of this house tonight. Parker. Where are you going with that painting? Why, I... I was taking it to the garage, sir. What for? You said you didn't want it in the house tonight. I thought I might return it to the dealer. Mr. Florida hasn't called back yet? No, sir. Well... I'll take it to him myself. Is the car ready? Yes, sir, but I hardly think you ought to go alone, Mr. Mason. You're in no condition. I to... brought that portrait into this house, and I'll take it back alone. Come on, come on. What the devil is the matter with this car? I should have had a car to take it out of the garage for me. Confounded. I'll get that painting out of here if I have to carry it out with my hands. Portrait of death. You are a portrait of death. You, with those searing eyes, that faint half smile. 
I'll never see your face again. Not as long as... No. 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 No, 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 no. This is a strange time of night to go calling for a painting, Mr. Flournoy. Mr. Mason told me to get in touch with you right away, Miss Snyder. He was determined to have you pick up the portrait tonight. Well, I hope he isn't asleep. Yes. Nobody seems to be answering the door. Oh, wait a moment. There's a light in the garage. Oh, good heavens, what was that? It sounded like a scream from the back of the house. Come on, we better hurry. Come on, Miss Snyder. There's somebody in the garage. Wait. Hey, Parker. Uh, yes, What's sir. What's the matter, Parker? Why'd you scream? It, it's Mr. Mason, sir. He's dead. What? I just found him, sir, slumped over on the floor of the car. Oh, awful. Maybe he was asphyxiated. No, the motor wasn't running, sir. It's the portrait. The portrait killed him. Just as it did the others. It does seem strange. He came to the garage about an hour ago, carrying the painting in his arms. Well, didn't you help him? He wouldn't let me, sir. He insisted on being alone. Well, that... That's strange. Look at these marks on his neck. As if he'd been strangled with a fine chain. Or a woman's necklace. What do you mean by that? Nothing. Did you think I was accusing you, Miss Snyder? I don't know. Good heavens, Mr. Flournoy. Look at the portrait. Oh, what's wrong? The necklace, sir. The necklace that was painted on the girl's throat. It's gone. <laughs> You can breathe a little easier now. Unless you happen to be wearing that girl's necklace. If you are, just write a note to the artist that painted the portrait and he'll answer you from the grave. Honest. He wrote to me from the grave the other day. You know what he said? Having a wonderful time. Wish you were here. <laughs> hmm. I suppose you think that's funny. Why, Mary, it must be funny. The dead artist was smiling when he wrote it. Oh, but then he's always smiling. You see, he's a grinning skull. <laughs> it's quite a story how he got that way. Let me tell you. Now, stop. I don't want to hear any of your morbid stories. But that's the only kind I know. Well, then you listen to me, because I know a story with a happy ending. And it's true, too. It's the story behind that sterling silver medallion that the Lipton people want to send the ladies. It seems that the original of this handsome medallion was given to an American flyer who was rescued by Chinese guerrillas after he'd bailed out over enemy territory. The flyer was told that the Chinese letters on the medallion would identify him and bring him safely through the lines. Well, he did get through. And only then did he learn that the inscription said, Good luck, in Chinese. Now, there's a story to tell your friends when they're admiring your medallion on its smart black rayon satin ribbon. And to get this Chinese good luck medallion, all you have to do is send 25 cents and the box top from a package of Lipton's, the tea with the brisk flavor, to Lipton Tea, Box 92. That's Box 92 in New York City. Well, let's get back to that there cover girl on the portrait of death. It's six months now since she strangled old man Mason with that necklace of hers and put the Indian sign on his late wife. Parker's still around, though. And so is that character, Flannoy, who at the moment is disposing of the ill-fated portrait for Mr. Mason's estate. Mr. Davis, I believe you're the only man in the world who wants this painting. And I really can't see why you want it, knowing its history. Mr. Flannoy, that kind of history doesn't mean a thing to me. Oh. Uh, may I take it with me now? Oh, certainly. Uh, Parker. Uh, yes, sir? Would you be good enough to help Mr. Davis with the painting? Uh, if you don't mind, sir, I'd rather not touch it. I haven't seen it since Mr. Mason died, and I don't care to see it now, sir. All right, Parker. I'll help you, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much. It's a very heavy frame, you know. It's really too heavy. For... Wait. That's incredible. What is it, Mr. Flannel? What's wrong? Parker... You say you haven't touched this painting since Mr. Mason died? No, sir. Well, look at it. The girl is wearing her necklace again. Mm. 
Miss Snyder, how do you do? We haven't seen you here at the gallery for some time. What's the meaning of this, Mr. Flournoy? Uh, beg your pardon? Why did you let that painting go without telling me it was for sale? Well, oh, I, I tried to tell you, Miss Snyder. I called you home several times to let you know about the auction. I was never able to reach you. Didn't you know I was away on a trip? Uh, no, no, I then didn't. Then why didn't you find out, you stupid fool? What? How many times have I told you I must have that painting? Well, I'm sorry, Miss Snyder. Never mind, never mind. Who is this Mr. Davis? Where does he live and where can I find him? Why, well, I imagine you'll find him at his home. Here's his car. Give it to me. I don't think you'll gain anything by going up there, Miss You Snyder. keep out of this, Flournoy. I want that painting. And this time I'm going to get it. I'm very sorry, Miss Snyder, but nothing you can say will persuade me to part with the painting. Mr. Davis, your stubbornness may cost you your life, you know. I'm afraid I'll have to risk it. I'm very anxious to find out exactly how he died. And if he was murdered, I'm going to see that the killer is brought to justice. The killer is the painting, Mr. Davis. And you will find that out very soon, just as the others did. Are you uh, threatening me? I am giving you one more chance to live. One more chance to sell me the portrait at the price you paid for it. Hmm. If I refuse... If you don't sell it to me now, Mr. Davis, I will buy it after your death. Forgive me for not showing it to the door, Miss Snyder, but I hardly think... Never mind, I'll go myself. No, I don't have to. Parker. Yes, sir? Parker, what are you doing here? Oh, uh, didn't you know, Miss Snyder? I'm Mr. Davis's new butler. Hayden Art Company, Mr. Flournoy speaking. Mr. Flournoy? Yes, this is Mr. Flournoy. You had better come over to Mr. Davis's house right away. And don't tell anyone you're coming. What? Who's this? It's important, Mr. Flournoy. Don't ask a lot of questions. Just come over. But who is this? Don't you know? It's the girl in the portrait. What? You... Hello? 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 Come in, Mr. Flournoy. Hmm. I thought it was you on the phone. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to mention any names. Come in, will you? All right, all right. What's the hurry? What's this all about? I'll tell you in a minute. Does anyone know you came here? No, I don't think so. Good. What are you doing here? And where's Parker and Mr. Davis? Parker's left. He's gone away. I found a note from him on the foyer table there. Well, what about Mr. Davis? He's in the library. Well, Wait a moment. Don't go in there yet. He's dead. Mr. Davis? Yes, Mr. Davis. Horrible, Flournoy. His head has been cut off. What do you mean? What happened? I don't know. I found him lying there on the library floor when I got here. He must have been killed with the axe from that suit of armor, you see. The armor's toppled over, and the falling axe must have landed on his neck. You would have to fall from a good height to sever his head, Miss Snyder. Well, the armor was mounted on a pedestal. And you can see for yourself how heavy that axe is. Yes, I see. You don't think I killed him, do you? I don't know. What are you doing here? I received a strange phone call telling me to meet Mr. Davis. When I got here, the door was open and everything was just as you see it. Have you called the police? No, not yet. Why not? I wanted to speak to you first. You wanted to speak to me with a murdered man lying there on the floor? He wasn't murdered. It was an accident. The portrait killed him. I'll let the police decide that. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Flournoy. You are not going to phone the police until you've heard what I have to say. Go on, say it. I called you because I wanted you to help me. I want that portrait before it's passed on to Mr. Davis's heirs. What do you mean? I may never be able to buy it if it becomes part of his estate. But if you tear up his check and take mine, it doesn't have to become part of his estate. It will be mine. Once and for all. Mr. Flournoy? What? Mr. Flournoy? Why, Parker. What are you doing outside Miss Snyder's house? I've been waiting for her, sir. Have you any idea where she is? 
Why do you want to know? She left a photograph at Mr. Davis's house last night, and I've come to return it. Oh, I- I'll take it to her, Parker. If you don't mind, sir, I'll uh, return it myself. Is it that important? The photograph is a picture of the woman and the portrait. And if Miss Snyder can explain why she's been carrying it around, we might have an answer to this mystery. You suspect her, don't you, Parker? Not any more than I suspect you. What's that? You've got the portrait in your car, Mr. Flannery. Yes. Don't try to conceal it. I recognize that oh, frame anywhere. I'm not trying to conceal it. I'm trying to find out what your game is. I have no game. Then why did you leave that note saying you were going away? What note? Oh, don't lie to me, Parker. I saw it myself on the foyer table. You must be mistaken, sir. Today is my day off. I left the house early this morning, and I didn't write a note. Oh. If you're telling the truth, then I know who did write that note. And I've got to prove it before I can take your word. Oh, wait a moment, Mr. Flanner. Where are you going? I'm going into the house with this painting. I'm going to set a trap for Miss Snyder. I'll go with you. What for? To help you carry the painting, oh, of I... course. But you, you'll spoil everything if you're seen, Parker. Then I won't be seen. I'll hide. I... What's the matter, Mr. Flanner? You are not afraid of me, are you? I don't know. Every time this painting has brought misfortune to anyone, you've been alone in the house with the victim. Is that you, Miss Snyder? Yes, where are you, Mr. Flournoy? I'm in your living room, hanging up the painting. I didn't ask you to do that. Take what? it down. Why? Take it down, I say. I don't want it in my living room. I don't want it in this house. But I don't understand. Then why did you buy it? Mr. Flournoy, I have been after that portrait for years. And now that I've got it, I'm going to destroy it. You're going to do what? There is a curse on that painting. There really is. You see, I know. Because I'm related to the girl who posed for it. You never told me that. I never saw any reason to. That girl was a sister of my grandmother. And ever since her death, my family has been haunted by that portrait. But now we'll be haunted no longer. But, but you can't destroy a work of art like this. It isn't fair to people who admire it. It isn't Nobody fair. Nobody wants it, Mr. Flournoy. Nobody but me. Oh, but you're mistaken. There is somebody who wants it. Wants it very much. Parker? Oh, no. No, oh, Parker's dead. Dead? How do you know? Oh, I know because I killed him. Right here in the living room. I'm, oh, I'm awfully sorry I didn't have time to dispose of the body, but I'll take care of him before I go. Oh, no, no, Mr. Flerno. You, you didn't kill him. You, you couldn't. Well, I had to. You see, he discovered the painting in the car as I drove up. He would have ruined all our plans. Plans? Yes. Plans? Gee, do you think I'd go through with any plans, knowing what I know now? Well, I'm going through with mine, Miss Snyder. I dare say I won't be suspected. What are you talking about? Nobody knows you stole this painting from Mr. Davis. Nobody knows but you and Parker. And I can trust Parker to keep the secret. You stay where you are. Don't be afraid. I've become an expert at the art of murder. It is an art, you know. Just as delicate as retouching old portraits, which... Happens to be a specialty of mine. You. You killed Davis and Mason and Mrs. Mason. Oh, no, 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 not Mrs. Mason, no. Her death was only a coincidence. But it did give me the idea for the others. You see, I needed a series of deaths to completely destroy the value of that portrait. The legend was already there. All I had to do was help it along. Why? I wanted the painting, Miss Snyder. I wondered it more than anything else in the world. An art dealer's clerk could hardly afford to pay for it. You're insane. You're... <laughs> well, we're all a little bit insane, aren't we? Don't you come near me. Don't. Shut up, you... Don't. Shut up. Yeah, the knife is... Sure. But if you say... Don't go, don't go. You make me miss my mark. You're not so good. You're not so good. I can You crazy devil. Be still. <laughs> Portrait. Fell on the wall. 
Crazy? Crew. Knife. In Now, we'll be haunted no longer. Poor old Flournoy. Framed by a portrait. Still, it's better than being boiled in oils. But Davis is the guy who really had an interesting death. Yes, that armored axe did a smooth job. And the police might have thought it was purely accidental. That <laughs> terrible picture. It was always changing around. I guess it wasn't what they call a still life. <laughs> in fact, I'm surprised there's still life left in any of the people in the story. Well, well, drown me in a cup of Lipton tea if Mary didn't make a joke. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> But now, I want to talk about something serious. Because this is a real occasion. A mighty important one, if you ask me. You know, folks, I heard just the other day that this coming Saturday, June 16th, is an anniversary for some people in the United States Army that deserve all the credit we can give them. They're the Quartermaster Corps. They make delivery under fire on all fronts. And they're 170 years old. Yes, think of it. The Quartermaster Corps was created in 1775 by the Continental Congress. You know, I'm a woman, not a businessman or a soldier. But I know what it is to keep every single little thing on hand that's going to be used by a whole army. It's hard enough to get food and matches and things for a family. But when you have to take care of a shopping list that has things on it like 11 million field jackets... And 10 million blankets, 100 million pairs of shoes, trucks, and all of the good wholesome foods that keep our men in fighting trim. Well, that's a real job. And the men of the Quartermaster Corps not only do all that work, but they do fighting, too. That's why these men are called the Fighting Quartermaster Corps. That certainly is a name to be proud of. Well, it's time to go back to my slab now and swap a few stories in the smoker of the crematorium. Oh, before I leave, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Lay That Pistol Down by Richard Powell. Yes, and next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is just your meat. That is... If you like human meat. <laughs> it's about a man who's been dead for six years. So, of course, his wife doesn't recognize him when he comes home. In fact, nobody recognizes him. So he goes around killing people to refresh their memory. I guess he figures that if they can't remember him, they might just as well remember nothing. <laughs> now it's really time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, it's wonderful how simple cooking is these days. When I was a girl, my mother used to spend a good many hours making a pot of noodle soup. But now, we have Lipton's noodle soup mix. When you use Lipton's, you just empty the contents of the package into boiling water, and in no time at all, soup's on. And what delicious chickeny tasting soup it is. Yes, Lipton's has an old-fashioned homemade flavor, and it's brim full of tender golden egg noodles. Of course, sometimes it's hard to get in some stores these days, but there's lots of good things scarce in wartime. So, folks, don't forget to ask for Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. 
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying... Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle... Because this story was brought directly to me. Ever since I've been your host on this series, I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said, Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you. Your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Where, Where is that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it judgment day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box, although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... <clears throat> I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed by Edward Rogers, the undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife, paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, uh, come on now, Dick. You've kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's, it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits, Mr. Rogers says, that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, what's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. Come in, sir. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very or... particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No I... need. You won't have it in stock. We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For, for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Well, Mr. Rogers, the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. Here's $50. Will that cover it? But I... Uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Is the $50 enough? It's not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... Here's a pencil. I have my own. 
Now, the shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's it's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my needs. Never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? Hinges. You see them here on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... The inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... But why? I mean, the drawing is... It's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, now leave enough room for your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been married before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. Bill! Bill! Are you in there? Just a minute. I'm opening the door. Lucy! What are you doing here? Are you all right? Is he still here? What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm just so frightened. All the way over here, I was just worried about you and and scared, but, but I came anyway, and now... Oh, Bill... I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I... don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but... I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. What will we live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand... I don't want hands touching me that have been touching death all day. All right, Lucy. uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. I don't know whether it came from Dick or not. But I heard it from the barber. Some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. Looks something like a carrying case for a the, the bass fiddle. Yes, sir. It looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? Yes, sir. Something to do with this special order? I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh. I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, More than upset. She's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. You're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. What did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. 
you just said that... You can't. But Mrs. Rogers can. Now, ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and... And then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven. Almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people. And I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I've thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had I've in his I've seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. <laughs> that coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. Uh, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. No, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay $50? 50, dollars, 50 whole dollars besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here. I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. When the reading stopped... I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room. And I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindle's. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful, but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Matt, we'll give him another half hour and then we'll lock up. Uh, that won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? Someone tampered with the coffin, and we don't know who... We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. But he's our best workman. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those wraps didn't come from the door? Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir, there, there's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. I'll close it myself. Good evening, uh, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Well, good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a greatcoat and a muffler in this bitter weather. You'll catch cold. Where's my coffin? Ah, 
That's it, in the corner. Mm-hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. Well, the make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir, it's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. Perhaps you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it on. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers, if there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and... Be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... Thanks to you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go. For the love of heaven, let him go, Mr. Rogers. He... He lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, all right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that that spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry! How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes, around the corner, down Green Tree Lane. Oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. Locks never bothered spirits. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is, where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes. Heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. What's happened to the moon? Uh, A cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. Uh, Here comes the moonlight, and here's the gate. Where did he go? Uh, He must have gone in. Uh, Gate's locked. Uh, Well, I have my key. You, You don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. Come on, come on. Uh, No, sir. There. There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul, as you call him, is a person I I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who can lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man ordering his own coffin. Very well. Very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg of you. Close the gate. I beg you, Mr. Rogers, leave this be and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. At this point, Bill Spindles stopped reading and put down the letter. My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now was his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward, but I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb... 
I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far on a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried, and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. (laughs) Don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here. I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Dick, wake up. Wake uh, up, man. Well, I, well, Bill, Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. Oh, my head. It hurts. Where... Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh, It's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, I don't know who you are or where you're from, but I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. I wish with all my heart that you were right. What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music, and I thought I saw a light. I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside, the lid slammed shut and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. I heard the key turn in the lock and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. 
please open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. We can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, do we really have to go on? It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I hear you, but I'm still shivering. Yeah, it's the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. Oh, I shouldn't have left him. If any harm has befallen him, I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. There's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? We'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right. All right. I'll come with you. Good Lord. There he is, lying across that coffin, and, and so still. Is he... is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation, but I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard. I'll be back in a moment with the strange end to this strange tale. Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather, but he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account Not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers. My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass. A talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music and my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young, Addison. I am. And I am not. Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. Either I go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. 
I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the Prince of Darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you so insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering, you'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time. When suddenly, I thought I'd lost my mind because not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined. Joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan? And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again. And I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me. The prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? Your soul? Nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again, nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? (laughs) There's one thing I know, darling. I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were... I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestors, girl. Lucy. Emphatically. Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. Why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindle's family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business, and he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, I'm stumped. (laughs) (laughs) It's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, The date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. Right? I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if he'd forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy, I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. 
You see? A really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely. Why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Here. I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Aha. Uh-huh. Then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in $10, $20, and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place. Remember, our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but... That would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery... And it was open, and and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. Uh, I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workman believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. Oh. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one... How in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. (laughs) You mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's leave that. Uh, Anything else? Well, lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music, the open coffin... What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jay. You're not going to try and tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head. Well, it's it's possible. Maybe, I don't but... believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me. Let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah, it all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. Right. Ah, dear. (laughs) It's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom where it's widest? Okay. There. (gasps) Right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, Let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to... Let us do that, Cora. That's got it now. (sighs) Now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay, let's open it. All right, now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I I can't. (gasps) You Ah. got it! You got it! Ah, Jerry was right. It's just a compartment. Well, is there anything in there? This. Money? A $20 bill? Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. <gasps> well, what does it say? Wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found this secret hiding place should know by now that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family. Signed, Edward Rogers. (laughs) 
What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well, if you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. For what it is worth, I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs, and he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Pullen. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. WCCO Radio, Las Vegas for three days and three nights. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Well, here it is, Tombs Day again, and this is your ghost host at the squeaking door. <laughs> Tonight's story is called The Last Story. It's an original radio play by Christopher Mayo, and our star is Richard Widmark, who plays the role of Tony Muse. We're going to a small Maine Coast fishing village. Flounder Cove, where fishing folks go to bed early, to the lullaby of the surf and the buoys offshore. But this night, there is a new note added to the lullaby, a discordant note, which for all its strangeness serves only to keep awake the man responsible for it. Anthony Muse, a young newspaper man from the city, is typing furiously while his bride sleeps in the other room of their fisherman's cottage. Dead fingers cannot type. A dead heart cannot ache. But that's the end of the story that began when my paper sent me here to Flounder Cove to do a story on fishermen. I spent my first morning sizing up the town. And about noon, I found myself walking along a rocky bluff away from the village. I was approaching a little gray church and a little gray cemetery. And the grass was lush by the large tombstone. Mother, give me some sign. Tell me. Show me that I'm not a murderer. I don't really want to kill anyone. But I feel it. I feel I must. Huh? Sorry, miss. I, uh, I was passing by and, uh... Well, I couldn't help hearing you. You... You heard me? Hey, wait a minute. Don't go. I, I'll leave you alone if you like. Who are you? Tony Muse. I didn't mean to eavesdrop. All right. What you heard me say, you would have heard from the others. If you stayed here a while. This grave here. Mary Shermit. You were, uh... Talking to someone, I, I mean... I'm I Rita Sherman. She was my mother. She died when I was born. 
You heard me talking to her. Well, I heard some nonsense about, uh, oh, about you not wanting to murder someone. You're not a murderess, are you? I've been a murderer since the day I was born. Murder is in my heart, as it was in my mother's, as it was in her mother's. Why do you keep your head turned away, Rita? Look at me for a moment. Oh, I can't. Yes. I'll let you see. Look. Look at my eyes. Look in the sunlight. What? What a... They're yellow. Yes. Yes, yellow eyes. Murderer's eyes. Her eyes were yellow. The most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. I saw sunlight and gold and buttercups dancing through tears. But I saw no murder there. Only a horrible hurt, a tortured soul. And I felt pity. And the desire to know more about Rita Sherman. Yep. Killer runs in the blood. Got yellow eyes, just like a mouse was. They're pretty eyes, though. Yep, right pretty to look at. Mother's was, too. She got a killing fit and drive the knife through a man's heart. Why? No reason. She come near hanging for it. Well, didn't she? No. Governor changed it to life. She was going to have a baby. Who, Rita? Yeah, Rita. Mary Sherman died, born in Rita, prison hospital. Uncle Zeb's good Christian. He took baby and raised her. Well, why does she stay here? Uh, she can't bring herself to break away from a ma's grave on a bluff. Talks to a ghost. Everyone I spoke to agreed that Rita Shermit would kill someone someday. I should have taken the afternoon train. My story was finished. But I didn't. I should have forgotten Rita Shermit and her unhappiness. But I couldn't. When I saw her standing on a high point above the hungry rocks on the bluff that afternoon, when I watched her step to the very brink of that bluff, I should have turned my head away, but I couldn't. Rita, you little... Don't Rita! Don't Stop struggling, Rita. You... You come back. You come back or you take me with you. Why don't you let me? I can't go on this way. I can't. Why did you do that? You had no right to slap. I do have the right. I... I love you. Oh, dear heaven. No. Is that so horrible, Rita? Didn't you... Didn't you see in my eyes? I saw superstitious nonsense, Rita. You've been told that you're a born murderer since you were a child. You're being driven toward it. I can help you, Rita. Please let me. You can help me least of all. Why do you say that? Because of what Uncle Zeb told me last night. What did he say? That you are probably the man I was meant to kill. I kissed her. And I found on her lips such a hunger for love and for understanding that I was blinded to the violent forces of nature I was dealing with. Had I known, I might not have called on Uncle Zeb that evening or heard what I did as I froze to the porch of Rita's waterfront shack. The front door was a Put that down, you see, devil. The money's gone and... No! No, don't! I pushed the door open and I faced Uncle Zeb. Not a very pretty sight. Pinned to the wall by a long whaler's harpoon through his stomach. He wasn't dead yet. His red rimmed drunkard's eyes pleaded for relief. But you can't pull a barbed harpoon back through a man. Even I knew that. Who did this, Seb? Tell me who, quick. Was it Rita, Seb? It wasn't Rita, was it? Tell me. Tell me. Look. Rita. Not Rita, he said. Not Rita. But who had done it? And who would believe that Rita, with her yellow eyes, hadn't done it? 
Who would believe it now that Uncle Zeb lay in a darkening pool with a stained harpoon coming through his back? Who? Well, here comes the sheriff now. Hey, hey, come here. Did you see sheriff? Let me throw it here. Come on, folks. Let me throw it. Yeah, did you catch your sheriff? Sure. Sure, I did. Well, I know that Sherman Gallo killed somebody someday. Yes, sir, I know it. Listen to me, sheriff. Read a Sherman Gallo. What? You got it all wrong. And my hat the way done it. What? Go on, Rita Sherman. Say that again. Rita Sherman didn't kill Uncle Zeb. Then they had to wait kill him. Sherman Gallant couldn't have done it. She took the five o'clock express. Bought a ticket for New York. I wasted no time leaving Flounder Cove. They promised to flag a through train for me that night. The sheriff came to the station with me, and he filled me in on a story. Who would have guessed Mimi Hathaway and Zeb was buying all those stories about Rita? But why, Sheriff? Were they trying to drive the crew crazy? And or worse, they could murder somebody. Then they'd have the money all clear. What money? Zeb got $20,000 in cash from Rita's mall while she was in prison to raise a cat on. Zeb thought nobody knew that. So he was going to use the money himself. But Mamie Hathaway knew, huh? Yep. Rita's mall told Mamie just before she died. Mamie told Zeb she knew. So he had to cut her in on the deal. Lovely people. What happened last night? You come into the picture and Mamie sees the gals falling for you. She goes to Zeb and wants a share. And they each made a mistake. How, oh, Sheriff? Zeb told Mamie he'd spent all the money. Mamie killed Zeb, thinking sure Reed would be blamed for it. You see, son, nobody except Cal at the station here. No reader had left around the pool. Do you know why she left the uh... I reckon I do, son. And I hope you find her. I have to find her, Sheriff. I couldn't very well tell the Sheriff why I had to find Rita Sherman. Better than anyone, I knew a girl was just then arriving in New York. A girl who was unstable enough to become a homicidal fiend. Standing on the subway platform at 14 when I spotted Rita. She was standing at the front end of the platform with a small group. Things happened fast then, but I remember just as I started toward her, I noticed the man who wavered close to her at the edge of the platform. I saw her hands raised slowly toward the man's back, and then I heard the train come. I saw her go to pull him back, officer. She wasn't quick enough. Rita. Yes? You... You don't think you pushed the man, do you? I'm not sure. I just saw him leaning. I raised my hand. I just don't know, Tony. Well, you didn't. I saw you. You were going to pull him back. Now let's talk about it. Darling, you don't know how I've looked for you, but now, now, baby, I'll never let you go. Oh, Tony. I can't. I, I can't. Can't what, darling? I can't see you again. It's not that I don't want to, Tony. But Dr. White won't let me. Who's Dr. White? He's a wonderful man. He's curing me, Tony. He's a psychiatrist. He says it would be dangerous for me to see you for a long time. Dr. White. He became a high, polished wall I couldn't climb between me and the woman I loved. I forced a couple of dates with Rita, but it was always the same story. 
Dr. White says you were part of my past that must be forgotten. Dr. White says I'll have to forget you if he's the cure. Dr. White says, Dr. White says, White, 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 White. Dr. White will see you now, Mr. Muse. Thanks. Mr. Muse, what can I do for you? Who's paying you for your services, Dr. White? Why, no one. If you came to me for help, I became interested in the case. Oh? The case or the subject, White? Frankly, both. I see. Well, that puts the cards on the table. She comes to you as a patient wanting to be cured for my sake. You fall in love with her and influence her to stay away from me. Yeah. Only part of that is true. She shouldn't see you yet. A very neat way to eliminate competition, Doctor. Very neat. But I'm moving in. I suffered the tearing pangs of jealous hate in the days that followed. Rita refused to see me until White had released her as cured. But there was one way to beat White. And I planned accordingly. I parked my car across from his house on Long Island. It was a deserted section along the shore. Shortly after midnight, a cab came along, and I ducked. I followed White up the driveway until he heard me. Who is it? Tony Muse, Doc. Muse? What are you doing here? Let's go inside where it's comfortable. Oh, no. We'll talk right here. Don't let's mess up your driveway, White. This is a gun. All right, Muse. What is it? You've persisted in keeping Rita under your influence, Doctor. Now you're going to let her go. <laughs> Not a chance, Muse. And how can you make me do it? By killing me? No, not by killing you. But a letter from you will do. Rubbish. You'll either write what I tell you to write, or you'll never psych again. All right. All right. Dear Rita, I've been called to the coast for some important and confidential work. Before going, I've reviewed several of my cases. I feel that you have sufficiently advanced to be considered quite normal. I will check into your progress on my return. Sincerely yours, then sign it. Frankly, Muse, this is childish. What's to prevent me from showing Rita this letter as a forgery? I've thought of that too, Doctor. No, oh, Muse. Why be rash? Listen to me. The trouble with you as a psychiatrist, White, is that you never met anyone who wanted something as much as I want Rita Sherman. Oh. Oh. And I mean to have her, Doc. He was light and easy to carry. I crammed the trunk compartment of the car shut on him and I locked it. In town, I mailed a letter to Rita... And I waited centuries for the night to pass. And then more centuries for my phone to ring the next day. Tony Muse. Tony. Tony. Oh, whoa, Tony. whoa, 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 darling. Is there anything wrong? You're crying, Rita. I know I can't help it, dear. I'm just so happy. I just received a letter from Dr. Wayne. He says... Rita, you don't mean he's released you. Baby, pack your toothbrush. I'll pick you up in the car in one hour. We're heading for Lake Arrowhead, darling. This is your wedding. Lake Arrowhead was a beautiful lake. And a deep one. It hadn't been easy to act normally on a trip up with White's day-old corpse in the car with me. But now I could rid myself of it. Only one ugly task left. Then time, time.
time and Rita's love would dull these memories. I opened the car trunk and I found his eyes staring at me. I pulled him out of the car. Now, the rope, the toppling bag I bought, the knife, and the saw. The doctor's saw. I was ready. It took me a half hour in all. No one would have guessed then who was packed in the weight and topple and package I dropped into the lake. It was finished. I was free. And I went back to Rita. Tonight we reached Flounder Cove. We're spending our honeymoon here. No man ever had more than I did to be happy about with Rita. Rita, my wife. It was an expensive moment. I only realized a short two hours ago that the happiness I'd bought was impossible to hold. Rita dozed off peacefully. I'd gone for a smoke and a walk on the walls. When I returned, I paused at our cottage door. There was someone moving about inside. I waited. Then I opened the door softly. Rita was easy to see in her white nightgown. She was walking softly toward the bedroom. She was walking in her sleep. I followed softly, my heart beating wildly. She paused for a moment by the bed, looking down at my empty place. And then she spoke in a voice that couldn't have been hers. Yes, Mother. I know I must. Yes, Mother. My world was still, hushed, balanced, ready to fall on me. Rita's arm raised slowly, and there was a single glint of mental as she brought her arm down, and she leaped on the bed like a wild animal. Her arm flailed up and down and up and down again. I saw her get up. I saw the knife buried into the slit mattress. Watched my wife return to her bed. Then came here to write this story. The strange forces of the mind are not to be tampered with unless it be to resolve their cure for all time. Well, that's the story. All but the ending. And the end of the story must be acted out. <laughs> Ironic twist, too. The same gun I used on White. Rita will never wait to find that she is a murderess. It's far better this way. Happiness was not for either of us. To whom it may concern, I, Anthony Muse, do confess to the murder of Dr. Donald White of New York City. I further confess to the murder of my wife, Rita Sherman Muse, this night. This, my last story, I bequeath to all editors whose past patience has been tried by my artificial, unconvincing, and contrived efforts in fiction writing. I'm going for a walk on the bluff above the sea. didn't you know whom the gods would destroy they first make men
Cats Mystery Theater. Every week, we'll reach into the dusty file, brush it off, and present a still up-to-date replica of a whodunit of yesterday. This is the American Forces Radio and the Television Service.